Hey, what's up everyone? It's your friendly neighborhood Birdman here. I thought you'd all like a compilation of every video I did this past year, so here it is, all. Insert generic amount of hours here because the amount is as of yet unknown. Hours of it. So if you like to binge these videos or just listen to them while on a road trip and don't want to have to fumble with clicking the next video, here is everything wrong with CinemaSins 2023. Enjoy. You know what these sins are for. 31 flavors of Gozy Agbos. <sighs> another day, another X seconds of logo sin. What makes it worse is that it isn't even the seconds as the production company credits were done in 21 seconds, so you're just counting the number of different fonts for Gozy Agbo, which is a clever nod to the premise of the film. Again, this is yet another instance of you not removing sins for short logos. This is just another admittance that you have absolutely no idea how to open a video, which is strange because you've literally skipped the opening sequence of plenty of movies before. Literally no one thinks 30 seconds of production company credits are a problem, so it's annoying that you keep pointing them out. You are actually wasting our time trying to say they're wasting our time. I mean, for f**k's sake, this video is already 42 f**king minutes. Also, I don't care how sentimental the music here is. Stop putting your filthy hands on other people's mouth holes. This is never okay. Not even if she's Black Bolt? Anthropomorphizing a laundry bag by putting googly eyes on it. All I can think about now is that this bag's life is people cramming their filthy unmentionables down its throat, and it's either in a constant state of torture or bliss, and either way, that creeps me out, and I blame you, movie. As always, when a movie is really good, CinemaSins pads the sin count with frivolous nonsense that has nothing to do with everything wrong with... I mean, everything everywhere wrong with everything everywhere all at once, all at once. Trying to eat someone's face in a public laundromat. See? Did, did the Daniel directors put their own name on a can of Campbell's soup? I'm sorry, but why did they put their names on the soup? I'm gonna be thinking about this for the rest of this very easy to follow movie. See? What, you didn't think I'd noticed this completely hacky hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy reference, guys? It didn't take a lot of deep thought to throw that into the improbability drive and Zafa Beeblebrox that sh did it. So it's sinful for people to put references to other unrelated properties in another property? Where have I heard this before? Ah, oh well. Why does this specific camera have to glitch and say establishing connection before we see Wayman get universe possessed? We know people can jump into bodies that aren't on camera, so what's the point here other than drawing the audience's attention to what might be happening? Jeremy answers himself cliche. Also, the entire screen glitches and says calculating route. So does this mean the technology used this entire television to do some sort of advanced routing first and then jumped over to an individual camera feed to finalize the jump? That's a very strange, specific way to jack in and at best is extremely narratively convenient. Okay, let's say it is convenient. Now what? Why is this a problem? The entirety of human existence has been attempting to make things more convenient, which would suggest that things being convenient is a good thing. Now that the context of convenience is in play, explain why something being convenient narratively is a bad thing for an audience. I would suggest making things overly complicated and difficult for most people to understand would be a bad thing, especially for a product meant to be sold, such as a film. What's your explanation? Holy sh**, you see how many signs are in this laundromat? The five-man electrical band and Tesla need to team up and do a charity concert for the anxiety this place triggers. There are so many signs here, Walking Phoenix has an open invite to come here and swing away. Jeremy has been a rich YouTuber for so long, he doesn't realize this is what a real laundromat actually looks like. So the sin here is being a stereotypical member of the bourgeoisie. Need a feiji, how uh, because I use closed caption subtitles, I know that some of the confusion here is that Evelyn and Gong Gong are speaking Cantonese while Wayman and Joey speak in Mandarin. But if you're just watching the English subs that the movie provides for this conversation, you would have no idea of that nuance. The movie doesn't think the audience can handle that there are different kinds of not English. And the sin is that the movie might be right. There is a ton wrong with that. First of all, you're sending English speakers, but still gave the sin to the movie. You know, it's possible to make a point without running up the send count where it isn't warranted, right? You can still use the ding and everything. But more than that, there isn't any real narrative reason to distinguish the different varieties of Chinese in this movie. For those that know the difference, it's an extra layer of characterization that Wayman comes from an area where they speak Mandarin and Evelyn hails from a place where they speak Cantonese. This film isn't about that concept, so it's weird to send the movie for it, especially when you think they're right for not making said distinction. The subtitles are there to make sure you understand what is being said, not how it's being said. Please come and this enjoy the good food okay. and nice music, okay? All right. Absolutely nothing about Debbie says she's going to attend this party, and yet later, she does. This is an example of CinemaSins pulling shit out of thin air and counting that as a sin. These are especially annoying because then I have people come to my comment section to defend this insanity simply because CinemaSins said it. This is no more a sin of this film than saying, nothing about this chick suggests she'd wear clothes, and yet she does. 
Who cares that she shows up? It's not a plot point. It's not relevant to the synopsis of the film. If it were gone, nothing changes. So why the f is it important enough to be a sin? It's a piece of background dressing used to flesh out the world. That's all. Money laundering. Pay attention. Always do. That's how I got to thinking about where these special Bluetooth headsets came from that will now operate as universe transporters. Even if the Alphaverse can just jack into any random headset, are we suggesting that Wayman just happens to carry around two of these in the fanny pack at all times? This is exactly what I'm talking about. It completely baffles me how you can seriously state that you pay attention and then ask where the headsets came from when we were clearly shown Wayman putting these in his fanny pack. What's worse, it's in the scene you were calling the security footage convenient. I'm at a loss as to how it was convenient for you when you didn't even understand why it was being shown to you. Oh, and this brain scanning app would also have had to have been pre-installed on our phone for this moment. The movie is not only yada yada the tech, but also why Wayman would be carrying these things in the first place. As explained already, the movie isn't yada yada anything. You're simply failing to pay attention. Go back to that security footage scene. They show you then that the Alphaverse can influence the technology of this universe to some degree. This is bolstered by the fact that they can use those headsets. Do you need me to continue holding your hand here, or are you getting the point yet? I don't care how important the information here is. Stop putting your filthy hands on other people's mouth holes. This is never okay. Even if they're Dragon Ball characters? Oh, sh Circles are going to be super important in this movie, aren't they? Like when Joy was watching the laundry earlier, or this pot of noodles, or the umbrella full of donuts, or this giant circle in the background just to the right of Evelyn's head that probably doesn't mean sh except now I'm looking at every circle like I'm watching the Hudsucker Proxy all over again. Jeremy points out things on the screen cliche. Evelyn slides the instructions just far enough to see that the next step is to close her eyes, and closes her eyes before she sees what she's supposed to do after that. This is an audience manipulation, which is doubly sad for me because it means CinemaSense assumes their audience hasn't seen this movie, and if they're right, that's a bad thing. This movie was infinitely better than Marvel's multiverse movie, and everyone should watch the year's best film, but I digress. Evelyn already read the list before this scene. They disingenuously cut out that part of the movie. This is way. Mrs. Wang, are you with us? Yes. Very busy today. Uh, no time to help you. But she's the one that came here. She literally put her shoes on the wrong feet and broke through the multiverse to be like, nah, I just came here to tell you to f*** off. You say this as if she had any idea of the wacko shit Wayman would drop on her in this closet. Her response is a reaction to what he said and not her being sucked into the closet. My wife confuses her hobbies for businesses. Yeah, yeah, have to be careful with that. You might get stuck in a universe where you end up turning your hobby of nitpicking movies into an actual job. I almost removed a sin for CinemaSins themselves pointing out that YouTube is a job, but then they reminded me that there are people that think YouTube isn't a job. For the record, a job is anything you do that regularly pays you for it. As I'm an entertainer, this is like saying what Jim Carrey does isn't a job, but that would be stupid, right? Oh, now you can communicate through mirrors. I get the sense that the rules of universe navigation in this movie come down to how cool it looks for the audience and not some idea of consistent guidelines. Come on, guys. Are you worried more about scientific consistency or making a good movie? Priorities, people. The first of two problems with this is that you are under the assumption that you have learned everything the movie wanted you to know in the first 20 minutes of the film. It literally has only begun, and you after this scene, learn more about the multiverse concept. So what's actually occurring here is you jumping the gun, thinking you know all there is to know about the guidelines of this film. The second problem is that this is simply a quick visual gag for the audience, which quickly ends in less than a second, and then she is whisked away into another universe. They do basically the same thing when she's in the closet and Deirdre pops out of nowhere there. Again, you are inventing shit to be mad about. What is gross necklaces? One time, my college girlfriend found my roommate- Skip. I mean, splitting the subtitles looks cool and all, but why would the universes be impacting them at all? This is a type of fourth wall break disguised as cleverness, and we don't go for cleverness around these parts. I guess it's time I address the style in which this video was made. CinemaSins is trying to mix up their formula by incorporating the premise of this film in their video. That is to say, amongst other things, their subtitles have purposely become a little jank, and they're using their old ding sound in certain instances. Get it? Multiverse. I would applaud them for shaking things up finally, but this has resulted in an insane 42 minute length for this video. If this becomes a trend, I might become future Birdman for real. So you know about this? Hilarious misunderstanding about to happen here, but in what universe do you show somebody something by holding up the back of it to their face? When he showed her the document, Wayman was actually looking down, likely in shame. He didn't realize he was holding it backwards until he looked up and she admitted she knew what the document was. By that time, considering the gravity of a divorce document, it didn't even matter to him that he was holding it backwards because from his perspective, she'd already seen it. 
I know we're supposed to think Deirdre is a super awful person, but does she seem like the kind of person that puts on a rage face when she makes a walk across a lobby? Almost anyone would be prepared to throw hands if they saw someone walking towards them with this kind of anger. Jesus, this sin. Are you seriously asking if a person who has won three straight butt plug awards walks around with resting bitch face? Then you add on the fact that Evelyn believes this woman is a racist that targets the Chinese community and the multiverse shenanigans. You know what? Never mind. And this time I'm holding up the front of the page just to really pound home how stupid it was that I showed you the back of it a few seconds ago. Another manipulated scene. Jeremy cut out the part of the movie that shows Wayman looking at the message on the other side of the document, realizing that Evelyn was confused. I told her to stay low and out of sight. Oh, you did not. Of course, Evelyn may just not have heard it when the movie was going back and forth between universes, but stay low and out of sight doesn't even sound like a plausible instruction you'd give her anyway. Before Wayman was killed, he told her to trust no one. Trust no one. I'm pretty sure that's what he was referring to. You're being too literal. Also, if you're keeping tabs on her in this universe, then why are you just waiting until now to connect? Wouldn't it have been better to jump once you realized she had confused which Wayman she was talking to? You have already seen this movie. That means you know they cannot just jump into another universe's body all willy-nilly and have to establish a solid connection. Wayman goes to another universe to jump inside another Wayman, who knows how to fight and download it from him. But considering that he's been to so many universes before, why doesn't he already know how to fight? And why is he dragging this out like he's performing a magic show for a group of third graders instead of getting the skills as quickly as possible. Again, you have seen this movie. They specifically show you that you eventually lose the abilities of your multiversal self and have to perform an improbable, unpleasant action in order to solidify the jump in the first place. You continuously ask for rules in these movies and disregard them when you get them. It's the funniest thing. Why is Deirdre dragging this pipe from off screen when she just used it to brain the 4,655th Thetaverse's version of Evelyn? Did she drag it over there and then back? You mean in the scene where it's clearly implied Deirdre has rounded up everyone in this universe to be killed? Meaning she's coming from whack a mole someone else? If Jobu's goal is to find an Evelyn who can tolerate her bullshit, why are all these other f***ers sitting around as hostages? All she needs is Evelyn, who at the beginning of this scene was passed out on the floor. All these other assholes can just leave, right? Except the film explains that Jobu is attempting to destroy all of the universe and kill everyone! Here on Stimulation Simulation, we discuss simulated sex scenes in movies. We skip. Whoa, that felt different. Are there different versions of CinemaSins in different movie universes? Maybe if I just stay on task, everything will remain normal. Okay, well, I'm pretty sure this is still the same burner universe as before, but now Evelyn is in a baby costume and Jobu is dressed like every middle-aged person I've ever seen playing slots in Vegas. This will never be explained. And I get cranky when movies don't explain every single thing. No nuance ever! Damn it! I'm going to keep pointing this out, but this is the basis for all these film channels that can't understand simple concepts in film. Besides the fact that the film goes out of its way to tell you Jobu is all-powerful, meaning she finds everything boring and meaningless, this is visual storytelling. You might not understand it at first, but once the scene with the cops happens, you realize Jobu is altering reality because she's trying to amuse herself through her infinite boredom. She exists everywhere all at once, meaning she's bringing parts of the other universes she exists in to the other universes. This is what the title of the movie means. Everything, everywhere, all at once. Do you get it? You underestimate how the smallest decisions can compound to significant differences over a lifetime. But not so significant that we don't follow the same core group of people following the same general plot together. There's a balance. Theoretical physicists call it scripting. Well, yeah. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a multiverse movie. No, seriously, think about what you're saying for a second. If the movie just randomly follows different people, what about that would say multiverse? The entire concept of the multiverse is you, but different. Has this man never seen an episode of Rick and Morty? You can call me Alpha Wayman. Or you can call me the expositional narrator. I'm basically here to be the audience's, I mean, your tour guide. I really can't think of anything more annoying about CinemaSins than their insistence that a movie has to provide information and then ultimately complaining when it does. You can't even say they want show don't tell because they literally complained about Jobu changing everyone's clothing earlier. Also, this is an IRS building. Do we really think there's someone who's been chewing multicolored gums and sticking this many wads under the desk like they're in fourth grade? I guarantee there's a f***ing wastebasket not two feet from this desk. <laughs> see? No, we didn't see anything. You really think this multiversal warrior on a mission to save existence cares about putting used gum he just found under a desk in the wastebasket? Here, Jeremy, laugh at yourself. <laughs> Why 
don't you quit you Evelyn to do this my Evelyn is dead sure but just as there are universes with slight variations of choices made there should also be universes with variations of time there must be a universe that is the same as yours where your Evelyn hasn't died yet what I'm saying is her question remains valid and Evelyn would be excellent at universe since that doesn't make any fucking sense even if the ridiculous shit you just said were true, by definition that wouldn't be his Evelyn, genius. It would be the other universe with slower times Evelyn, meaning it's functionally the same as using this Evelyn. Where the f*** did Deirdre jump to? A universe where she's the Hulk, duh. She jumps somewhere, brute force. The sumo wrestler? Or maybe an immortal serial killer with a penchant for babysitters and wearing rundown Shatner masks? Chris makes a Halloween pop culture reference that isn't a cinema. We've got a breakdancer, mime, a gymnast. Jimmy Jonas, go! My roommate's college dating process somehow makes it into the script. I see there was a reason Jeremy has been the primary narrator of these videos. Concentrate on a universe in which you study martial arts. Those Bluetooth headphones make actual calls as well as verse jump? Well, the tech veniences never cease. When did they stop being Bluetooth headsets, though? It's here I'd like to point out that of all the improbable things Evelyn could do to verse jump, the computer thinks that licking your elbows, which is nearly impossible to do, has less chance of working than stuff that is way easier to do. Well, Chris, it's not about the ability to to do something, it's about how improbable it is to do that thing. I would surmise that if one could lick their elbow, like this person here, then it's not improbable. The only reason it's listed here is because Evelyn would almost certainly have to hurt her shoulder doing it, which is something she probably wouldn't do. The next best pass, I'll break your own arm or take a nap. Well, actually, breaking her arm only has a 0.0054% chance of succeeding, and taking a nap has only 0.0028% chance. Poking her eye out, ripping out all her hair, writing a novel, and sneezing 200 times beat both of those things, while removing her toe beats taking a nap. So you're alive, Wayman? Or you don't understand what that chart is actually showing. The percentage is not showing you which of these things have the best chance of succeeding, it's showing you their probability, genius. All of these things will succeed. It's telling you the probability of Evelyn performing these actions randomly. Remember, this movie is about the multiverse and how minute changes in actions will cause the differences in these universes. You're so smart, you're dumb. <laughs> Look, I'll buy that jumping into a different universe where you have skilled knowledge can be brought back to your universe's brain. But how do you bring back the strength to throw someone across a room? That's more than a skill. That would require a change in body composition, which makes all of the nonsense. I'm curious how that's more ridiculous than being able to tap into skills and abilities from another you in a parallel universe. Besides, that's precisely what the film shows when Deirdre Verse jumps. <gasps> what is she doing? Sorry, Evelyn. Looks like while I wasn't paying attention, Evelyn and Alpha Wayman just wandered into that Tim the Toolman Taylor's neighbor universe where we only see the tops of people's faces. Everything everywhere wrong with everything everywhere all at once, all at once, ladies and gentlemen. Asians are too short. What? That's what he's saying, because that's what they're showing. <laughs> It sure is nice that every universe comes with its own included expositional backstory. Hi, I'm Chad Severinsen. Hi, I'm Skip. Oh, so Evelyn just learns Kung Fu by entering another version of her in some other universe who's mastered it? I'm shocked she didn't turn to Morpheus and say, I know Kung Fu. Okay. Now, where's the sin? You just explained the film's premise, told us what happened on the screen, and made a joke. Are you going to explain everything everywhere wrong with this or nah? Your mind is like a clay pot holding water. Every jump opens another crack, causing things to leak through. Oh. See, this bullshit is frustrating. One consistent tenet of these videos is you asking for things to be explained. This movie goes out of its way to make an incredibly simple metaphor, and you pretend that wasn't clear enough for the audience. A clay pot holding water that gets a crack every time you first jump. How is this in any way confusing? I mean, I get why it's confusing for you, you're a little special, but does this not explain the limitations on the science fiction succinctly? Those overloaded mind usually dies. Instead, her mind was fractured. This is the exact video representation of what happened when I watched this movie and Tenet back to back and I tried to explain this movie using Tenet rules. You tried to explain the rules of a film with another entirely unrelated film's rules? Well, that explains why Chris isn't featured in these videos more. Even Jeremy thinks that's stupid. <laughs> There is nowhere in our universe to see this universe's complete version of this movie. So lazy. Not as lazy as this criticism, though. 
just like the movie got lucky that you two happen to be in the same place in this universe so it could continue exploring its themes of change, destiny, and relationship. Now that's a shortcut. Ah, you slipped up, Ched. That's a CinemaSins convenience criticism. The joke in this video is that you are all supposed to be alternate universe versions of CinemaSins, but that's just something CinemaSins would say in the Prime universe. So I appreciate the attempt, but you failed to be consistent with the writing here, so shortcut D's nuts. I feel yourself, it's always a good job back. Clearly not or you would have told her to do that before trying to profess her love to Deirdre. Also, it would have shown up as better than 0.0002% on that list earlier. Again, you are looking at a list that quite literally says improbable actions directly above the action you're pointing out, yet still think the percentage represents whether or not it would succeed. See, I can physically be here, but what you meant to say is you're not allowing me to be here. Being the asshole who uses semantic pedantry to pretend like someone made a mistake when you know damn well what they meant. CinemaSins clowns CinemaSins. Which is my job. Literal c blocking. But it's literally not? That's a dildo. No, not that dildo. Why do the handcuffs fall off just because her hands are now limp? Because it's not just that her hands are limp, it's that her hands now don't have bones in them. Everything about this is dumb. Big water bottle, dumb. Who didn't have a cat, dumb. Ding. Body plants on clothes machines, choking hazard. Dumb. Ding. Too much mage is dumb. Ding. Single movies are dumb. Ding. 10 million BCs is too many BCs. Dumb. Ding. Doing from 2001. It's Planet of the Apes to look smart. Dumb. Ding. Also, Kubrick is a dumb. Ding. Stop sucking them. Dumb. Dang. Dang. Stop using condom mints. Double dumb. All this bullshit. Dang. Open up. Take a peek. I'm not shitting you. Horn dog teens in the 80s were so hard up for sexual imagery that making vulva fingers was a real thing they did to imagine what it might look like. Today, they innocently Google bird repopulation by typing the phrase, how do we spread eagles, and then have enough high resolution material to last them through the entirety of adolescence. Progress. Fantastic. What the fuck does that have to do with everything everywhere wrong with this movie? Okay, pause it. Why does this bagel not look very appetizing? You'd think a bagel with everything on it would be heaven, but it only appears to be located in heaven. Yes, yes, JCD, heaven is an illusion, sure. Oh, yeah, that is 417 coming in with a sub, thank you. All right, this bagel needs a little more care before it can go out to customers. Comment below with how you would change this everything bagel to make it more appetizing and something that someone might want to buy. Now, back to the movie. All right, let's drop the Birdman persona for just a second and just be the Birdman. This entire video is extremely clever, and I can't go any further without admitting how brilliant of an idea it was to make alternate versions of themselves to send this particular movie. This is my favorite gag of the video, where Jeremy appears on screen as Twitch CinemaSins. You guys ask me all the time why I still like CinemaSins? It's because they're actually funny, and Jeremy is kind of a cool dude that does shit like this. All right, back to being Birdman. <coughs> What the f was this? What the hell does this have to do with this film, and why did you think it was funny enough to include it in this video? Who the hell laughed at this? Okay, fine, but where did the souped-up wheelchair come from? While well, he was supposedly eating pudding, did Alpha Gong Gong pop in and decide to build future technology from items that just happened to be available in the IRS kitchen? Yes. Next question. I'll be back, I promise. No, 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 wait. I just... Huh? And that huh is all we're ever going to get from someone who just lost the last 30 minutes of his life and suddenly came to in a completely different room. Someone knocks at the door and he's all like, oh, no one's knocking. Guess that takes care of any and all existential crises I might be currently dealing with. You also cut out the next piece of dialogue in the film where Wayman's confusion is immediately interrupted by the appearance of his daughter, which took precedence over that confusion. Tipping your daughter. Even if she's Jobu Tupaki? Quickly. Wow, she is distracted. <laughs> a box cutter? You're about to show up with a gun here in a minute. You think Evelyn killing her daughter with a box cutter is going to be easier? Put them up now. Bit of advice, try using knives next time. Works better for close encounters. Switch it! Oh! Oh! Papa, I know you don't agree with me, but this is something I have to do. Wait, did she go to a world where she became the greatest impressionist of all time? Then <laughs> why? After my Doctor Strange 2 video, it's clear to me that Jeremy doesn't understand what infinite parallel universes means. 
Anyway, Evelyn is randomly jumping to other universes in an attempt at splintering her mind so that she can potentially become like Jobu Tupaki. The scene literally says she's doing that. What the fuck are you doing? Papa, I know you don't agree with me, but this is something I have to do. That sounds weird. Uh, wait, wait, you don't know where you're jumping. <laughs> so my question is, is 3657 the year? Is it April 15th, 3657? Or is that the universe? If it's the universe, why would you put it with the day and date? If it's the year, why does everything look so 2020? It's obviously the year. And why does everything look so 2020? It's clear to me that Jeremy doesn't understand what infinite parallel universes means. If you go to a universe to learn shit, are you required to use it when you come back? Just because you learn how to talk like a bird doesn't mean you actually have to do that, right? Like, I learned how to play piano in third grade, but you don't see me doing that shit. No, after verse jumping, she becomes that thing only with her mind. It's similar to the question of why did Doctor Strange become paint in the paint universe if he's only jumping to that universe? The answer is you take on the properties of that universe if your natural form cannot exist there. Also, the translation from chirp to English here says strong enough to save my joy, but it doesn't take into account the nuance of the chirp word for save. The direct translation is fine, but technically this sentence in chirp more accurately translates to maybe I'll be strong enough to cover my joy, a word for the chirp population that indicates not only safety, but active sacrificial protection, something the movie's chirp advisors should have taken into consideration and would have brought an extra layer to the themes of the film. All right, you got me. I was totally taking this shit serious for a second. Disgraceful. Is that a matrix? And is that a sex dungeon? Don't the people who made this know that this is an abomination? It is a sin against God. I give this scene three pedals. Three pedals with holes in them. I'm wondering why Chris thinks he doesn't already sound like that. Find your jumping pads. With all the different random sh people do to jump in this movie, we haven't seen one crazy thing not work. And we saw the list. Hardly anything should work, given the percentages. Why does anyone agonize over which random thing they should do when everything works? It's like he has all the parameters of the rules and is intentionally ignoring them. This is the part where the morons that think CinemaSins isn't being serious about the things they say chime in. <laughs> you ring? Hey Stan, haven't seen you around lately. What up, dog? I'm not a Canis familiaris. Don't speak Ebonics to me, please. Anyway, considering the tongue and cheek nature of this video, it's entirely possible Jeremy gets the rules and is being intentionally vapid. I will admit, it is possible. But I ask you, what are the actual odds he does understand and is playing a character considering we have him admitting to actually making mistakes in these videos? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. I've been calculating the- Evelyn accesses a version of her that was blinded as a child, so she became a superstar singer, as one does, so that she would have greater spatial awareness and increased lung capacity. Cool, got it. But she then takes a giant breath in the room with the gas to take with her into the room that mostly has fresh oxygen. What the hell kind of plan is this? Dude, she takes the big breath so that she can escape the room, and she takes that big breath when the room was still mostly air. As she exits the room, you can see why she took that breath. The room ends up completely filled with gas. Sending your verse agents one at a time. Did no one jump to a universe that understands the power of numbers in combat? Jeremy is a blood. Sorry, baby. What the f***? Oh, and for clarity, that one is not the good kind of what the f*** that this movie does so well. It's the, is it supposed to be funny that she just punted and is now swinging a small dog around in the air in a way that would almost surely severely injure it kind? Sending this scene. And that's not the normal, this is one of the best scenes in this movie kind. It's the, you are supposed to laugh at this, and if you aren't, you're probably a vegan, in which case... <laughs> kind. If you don't step up, I'm giving some of your shifts a chat. One thing that always impresses me about the Daniels is their attention to detail. Mm, are you talking about them using the name Chad here as a stand-in for a young, upper-class urban male? Urban male, exactly. It tells you something about the moment without having to be explicit about it. No one wants to be replaced by a Chad. No one. No one. Not even if they're just hanging around. Like a hanging Chad. I knew you'd pick up on that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you. I think the 
the worst part about that cringe fest is the fact they label Jeremy's laugh as pretentious. That means every time Jeremy has done that fake laugh, they thought they were coming across as pretentious instead of like dudes jackrabbiting in a JAV. This guy has amazing butt aim. Sending this scene. This probably got the biggest laugh in both theaters I saw this in, so you're saying we're all dumb for laughing at something comedic. You absolute monster. Leaving a plug in while you fight. Not kink shaming here, just talking about the practical aspects of kinetic freedom, y'all. Well, there was this one time I met this chick off Tinder and she had the stop. No, no, this isn't the time, bro. All right, moving on. Mostly everything makes sense in this Kung Fu universe, except when we see Kung Fu Evelyn watching the movie that we're watching. Because in this world, she and Wayman haven't seen each other in years. And Wayman's in this movie. So she made the movie with Wayman, right? Or is this the main universe Evelyn transmitting her thoughts into Kung Fu Evelyn and it's being projected onto the movie screen? I love this movie. Chad shortcuts something he likes cliche. Pretending to end your movie with the third act Christ is cliche. Again, you're betraying the premise shortcut sins. This is a cinema sins line. You're supposed to be telling us how this is a shortcut. The premise is absurd. The raccoon is using the chef's hair to control the cooking, but we asked 17 experts what they thought of this scene, and they said a resounding skip. Dude. Waiting an hour and 16 minutes between chapter breaks. I mean, if you're going to do them, at least keep them evenly spaced. Or movies are art, and they can be done in any manner the artist wants them done. I know that rustles the jimmies of film YouTube, but but what? Nothing. I'm just glad it rustles their jimmies. They awarded themselves an Oscar. In their guys. own movie. In their own movie. Now, you all laughed when I said that when Wayne's World 2 put in that Oscar clip, they set a dangerous precedent for movies patting themselves on the back. I was so wrong, Tom. I was so wrong. Even if it's a joke. Even if it's a joke, Bob. Who the f is Bob? Maybe our prisons aren't crowded enough if filmmakers can just come in and do a tracking shot like this through multiple cells, which they obviously knock down walls to set up and not disturb the daily routine of our hard-working wardens. You need a better mic, or a better voice. I've been thinking, this movie is making a mockery of Citizen Kane. Kids. Today we review Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness starring these two pinatas that get beaten once again by a blunt object. I would have removed a sin for making fun of Sadvocate, but he's a bologna sandwich, not a broom, so a sin's a sin. I just want to know what's going on with this double-seated bike. I know everything is random, doesn't matter, is insane, etc. But could it be that this is possibly too random? Jeremy is a lottery quick pick machine. Sorry, no can do. Why not? I am your daughter. Hold up. You all know what's coming here. Look at the book! Roll credits! Yes, Shireen, since it's a book, read credits might be more appropriate. What's really going to blow Shireen's mind is when I tell you that you always read credits. No, I'm going back with my joy to my family to live my life, a happy life. Okay. Good luck with that. I have to stop it again. Holy sh! is everyone in this movie on their A-game? I'm gonna have to take a few cents off here. You guys with me? Michelle Yeoh, Stephanie Sue, JLC. Oh, speaking of JLC, did you see that video where she and the Daniels were talking about us? Play that, Ian. Play that shit. Sometimes we like to leave mistakes for the fans. So okay, well, I was just wondering. Yeah, in. yeah exactly. I will be quiet. We kept telling oh, is that why our movie looks like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> mistakes for the, fans. for the fans. I love, I love when. I didn't know. You, you know that YouTube channel, like, uh, what is it? Movie Sins or whatever? Cin we, Cinema Sins? Oh, I love yeah. Cinema Sins. I hate it. <laughs> we, we like to leave things in for them, you know, just oh, to make yeah. sure. It, our, right. We want our Cinema Sins to be very long. Yeah. Lots of things for them to call so out. Some smug yeah. guy can be like, oh, the clock okay. is different. <laughs> Come on, other Daniel, there's no universe where we sound like that. Ian, play JLC again. Oh, I love yeah. Cinema Sin. Yeah. Again! Oh, I love yeah. Cinema Sin. Oh, I love yeah. Cinema Sin. Oh, I love yeah. Cinema Sin. Amazing. Two sins, one for calling Jamie Lee Curtis JLC, nobody does that, and another for again breaking the premise. Aren't you stream sins right now? How do you know who Cinema Sins even is? You broke the fifth wall to wink at the fact that Jamie knows who you guys are. One of the Daniels literally said they hate you. Let's play that three times. You know that YouTube channel, like, uh, what is it? Movie Sins or whatever? Cinema, Cinema Sins? Oh, I love yeah. Cinema Sins. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. Look, I'm not sure where the Daniels got my colonoscopy video from, but I did not consent to it being used in the film. Castriff with the sub sin, let's go! Here's the sin for Castriff, a guy that literally makes shit up to be mad at the Birdman about. Where are you? I mean, 
to not even show up for your appointment? Shut up. Telling the incomparable Jamie Lee Curtis to shut up. He's a damn hero, I tell you. Sending Michelle Yeoh for following the script simply because Jamie said she loves CinemaSins. All that means is that Jamie hasn't yet seen my series. Won't be too much longer, though. Don't forget about her. Have you ever had animal control come out to your house? No, never. No, no, never, right? No, never. No, never. So maybe I shouldn't be so confident about this, but if there was a talking raccoon, they'd probably do more than just throw it in a cage in the back of a truck, right? Well, I would think so. It's a talking raccoon. I mean, it's a talking raccoon, right? You call someone about that. Like... David Letterman. Oh, that's funny. Stupid pet tricks, right? You're funny. Lies. Is that a f***ing vase screaming? <laughs> Forget the vase, man. I want to point out that this fruit bowl has three oranges in it. Classic case of over oranging. <laughs> Those are pears, idiots. Holy <laughs> sh I didn't even notice that. Since I'm so arrogant for being able to predict what CinemaSins would say in my Infinity War video, I'm going to also point out that this is a literal rip from my Captain Marvel video. I'll tell you what's real. Someone on this movie's set design team thinks this single mother living alone with her daughter keeps a bowl on the table with six f***ing lemons in it. That's real. That happened. Well, since we're nitpicking, how do you know these are lemons? I mean, if you zoom in, this one is half green, so it really could be anything, like a mango or a papaya. Hell, even oranges. Can we, can we just stop fighting? Wayman's just the best. Honestly, the sin is that the movie wasn't titled Everybody Loves Wayman. Jeremy sins something he likes cliche. Are these two the same age? Is that some weird coincidence or are they twins? Ched doesn't know people can have the same birthday. In fact, if you put 23 people in a room, there's a 50% chance two of them will have the same birthday. And if these two grew up together and got to know each other since they were kids in school or whatever, they'd have the same birth year too. I'm not saying that is the case, just saying that it is entirely possible and not as improbable as being implied. Kind of amazing that there are still people at the party after Evelyn smashed a window and the cop showed up. Amazing? That's the best part. Arranged marriages. Jeremy just shit on India, which they will then clean with their hands. Spanking other Daniel. So Jeremy removed a sin because he salty Daniel doesn't like his YouTube channel. Boo hoo. You don't see me shitting on people that don't like me. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I couldn't deliver that line with a straight face. Yeah, nigga, because I was about to say. You can't escape. I won't let you go. I must be in control of this process. You can't defy my ability to send you. I must persist. Permit this school of reading away from Logos. I'm tired. I don't want to hurt anymore. And for some reason, when I'm with you, it just it just hurts the both of us. Just let me go. Okay. Holy sh! This movie is so. Good. Agreed. What happened here was the two minutes of opening credits created a high-pressure system that simply couldn't be contained by the roof. It's actually a reference to blowing the roof off this motherfucker, something black people used to say all the time. And you can't give me the we're white excuse either, because Jordan Belfort said it in The Wolf of Wall Street, and that's the whitest story ever told. This gratuitous high top reveal only works when it's some kind of Chekhov's man bun. So what we have here is more of a red herring. Sinning kids iconic flat top. That's worth these many sins. And if you couldn't tell by now, yes, I am white. A fact that will be painful and obvious, not only during the sinning of this movie, but also during the post-sentence scene where I attempt to recreate some of the film's iconic dance moves. I apologize in advance. Wait, future Birdman, is it happening? Is this the thing? Mm-hmm. I'm gonna go ahead and give you this in advance. The stone? Am I ready? I don't think I'm ready. No, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, 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 wait. We wouldn't dare play the music, but still want to point out that Kid is listening to the title track off Kid and Play's 1990 album Funhouse. And so the sin, as always, is listening to your own f***ing music while taking a shower. Yeah, no. This is not Christopher Kid Reed. It's Christopher Kid Robinson, meaning he's not listening to his own music. I know that sounds pedantic, but CinemaSense is mixing realities here and conflating Doylist with Watsonian for the millionth time. Also, showering like this. 
What's the problem with the way he's showering? What the hell is this Sins video? Matter of fact, I've been meaning to ask, what's up with the Sins videos these days? They're getting lamer and lamer, almost like you're trying not to be offensive, but in doing so, you're giving us pointless guff like this. I'm going to tell you like I tell people in the comments section. Not every thought you have needs to be shared. Chris, finish your breakfast, boy! This asshole attempts to leave pancakes, eggs, hash browns, and bacon on the table and just take a piece of toast. As far as I'm concerned, this movie is not so much a coming-of-age comedy as it is an anti-hero origin story. I think you've touched on something the film doesn't necessarily address, and the later films don't either. Kid is incredibly selfish. Throughout the entire film, he is kind of an asshole, and this breakfast proves that point. His father is clearly struggling to pay the bills after his wife died, stays up late working and begging for overtime, and still made time to make this spread, and he only takes the toast, wasting everything else. This is incredibly unrealistic in black households because there isn't a universe where a poor black family is wasting this amount of food. I'll take a sin off, even if you didn't really think of all that. And I'm gonna be hooking you up with, man. This ain't no tackhead party. Yeah. Deaf women like those. For a moment I thought play was being ableist, but then I looked at the subtitles and realized my whiteness had crept up on me again. Even though no amount of wokeness can help with that, I figured I just might be able to distract you by pointing out how the male gaze just kicked in with full force before full force could enter the movie with medium force. Please don't cancel me. Oh my fucking god, nobody is that white they don't understand what deaf means in 2023. Outside of Ben Shapiro. That slang is over 30 years old. That's like saying you don't know what cool means. But what really grinds my gears is the usage of the word woke. That is not what woke means. Just like simp, y'all have distorted the meaning of that word and made it incredibly corny. Here, let the guy that edits these videos explain it to you. The word woke, I'm gonna explain it for you, um, Andrew, because like a lot of people, and I, I know I have like a, a large white audience, but my black audience knows what the word woke actually means. The word woke means your third eye is open. What do I mean by that? It's like you're aware of what's going on. You're you're aware that you know the government might be fucking you in some way. That's what woke means. It it's it's a corruption of the word awake. Like I'm awake, get it? Like I see what's going on. That's what woke actually means. It's the same thing with like the word simp, and it, like you guys just take it and then it it turns into something completely different than how you stole it from. Like <laughs> that's what the word woke is. Hey, don't don't play. This school cafeteria hot dog has some sort of gravitational pull on the same person that couldn't be bothered to eat the full breakfast that was laid out for him earlier. And yes, I'm still stuck on that. Well, it makes sense, doesn't it? He skipped breakfast. Stab, I'm really sorry. Having a character named Stab drink milk from a tiny carton, or just drink milk in general. How do you think Stab got so yoked? Milk has a hell of a lot of protein. And I know we're currently living in a world where you Seattleites have convinced everyone that oat milk is the goat milk, but this is a time period before Starbucks and Uggs were ubiquitous. Also, this guy's supposed to be a high school student. House Party clearly attended the Grease Academy for casting actors as high school students. I'm willing to shoot early 90s movies some bail for this practice. When I was a kid, this is exactly what high school students looked like. When I got to high school in the early 2000s, we looked like little kids probably because of all the oat milk, but still, look at what high school students in the 90s actually looked like. Where you plan to be in 10 years, man? 10 years from now, I'm gonna be in one of your movies. All right. You gonna be pimping? Pimping it. Oh, 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 I am not gonna be a Little did she know. Kid was on his way to get milk for full force, but then full force somehow got to the milk place before Kid. And even with the slight delay to talk to Sydney and Shireen, we have to assume he was taking the shortest route. You know what? Instead of trying to further explain how this doesn't make sense and just seems like they're all cramming a full day of bullying into one lunch period, I'm just giving the scene a sin for almost turning this into one of those I should care about two trains headed somewhere math problems. CinemaSins half manipulates nearly an entire minute of screen time where the film shows Kid interacting with Bilal and later Sydney and Shireen before bumping into Stab, Zilla, and Pee Wee. They got there before him because he was taking too long. Yo, I will break my leg off, up in your ass, so far that you be shitting sneaker for a month. Sure, I get it now, but I can tell you from experience that threatening to break your own leg off inside a person will confound a 15 year old from the suburbs who, upon viewing white men can't jump, ambitiously thought that his jumper was capable of earning him any kind of respect on the local courts. So, the scene, as always, is my J. <laughs> All right, I laughed, but only because this was hilariously corny. I'll preface this with I completely completely understand Jeremy is saying lingo like this might confuse people that aren't a part of this culture. Listen man, some things just ain't for everyone, and I'm entirely certain
certain house party wasn't marketed to kids in the suburbs, black or white. You can't set a film because it has cultural norms that you don't understand. In fact, I'd argue that you should take this opportunity to try learning those cultural norms, or if you're not interested, simply ignore them. I mean, you wouldn't send a Chinese film for their colloquialisms. Hell, in my last video, you got upset that the film didn't distinguish between Mandarin and Cantonese in the subtitles, demonstrating you do care about the intricacies of that culture. I wonder why you don't do that here. Yo, watch out! Watch out, man! Watch out. Come on, movie. They were two feet in front of him at most. My suspension of disbelief is going to need you to either move them further away or move Reagan closer. So your point is that it's impossible for someone to completely miss something point blank? Have you seen Russell Westbrook trying to make a layup? Russell Westbrook, the opening play here, comes up with a nice theft on Raymond Felton. And I don't know if he lost the basketball going up or not, but he tries the finger roll. It Kid will try to throw a punch here instead of delivering the obvious comeback of he who smelt it dealt it. Okay, maybe it's not the obvious comeback, but I've never heard it used in that way. And I'm pretty sure the sheer weight of confusion it would create in the lunchroom would have diffused the situation. Yeah, you definitely from the suburbs. Thinking you can talk bullies out of whipping your ass in front of the entire lunchroom is some Stephen King type shit. Could you tell me why in God's name you called his mother a garden tool? I'm not gonna lie, this got me to chuckle. But also I'm not buying that a high school principal in 1990 did not understand the derogatory meaning that the word hoe could imply. Bro, you just said that you didn't understand what deaf or breaking my leg off in your ass meant, and you were a white teen in the 90s when these phrases were at their peak. So you mean to tell me you don't get an even older white person not understanding what hoe means? Now that breaks my suspension of disbelief. Holy f***ing hell, that's stalker levels of pictures of scantily clad women on Bilal's wall. I'm assuming in House Party 2 we discover the next step in his evolution to a full-blown serial killer. Those are the jet beauties of the week, which is why there's so many. For all you Zoomers, this was our version of OnlyFans. They're basically meant to be on the wall and not stuck together, like mine. There's a party tonight at place. I mean Peter's house. Can I go? On a school night? School night parties, especially the ones I wasn't invited to. Damn, that's dark. But the real sin here is this film says this party happens on a school night, but later dialogue makes it seem like it's on a Saturday, which wouldn't make sense because of the earlier scene at school. Play, a kid who seems like he throws tons of parties, is making a rookie move by vacuuming beforehand. Sure, he is super smooth, always keeps it 100, and all the things kids say these days, but this still feels like more of a play that kid would make. Completely disagree. Play in everything we see him in, and I'm including class act, is incredibly neat. I suggest he's far more well put together than Kid, who doesn't really put much effort into his appearance. That would obviously translate into keeping his home clean. Besides, who the hell invites people over to a dirty house? Who raised you? Hey. <laughs> who are these niggas? <laughs> we need to stay away from these niggas. <laughs> you know what I mean? Toe to toe, Kid and Play is on a roll again. It's only right that we keep the crowd dancing. I get that Kid's dream is to become a hip-hop artist, and you can't always predict when the creative juices will start flowing, but he's trying to get the f*** out of the house before Pop finds out about the fight at school, so why does he think he has time for this? Jeremy, what are you talking about? Kid was doing his homework and finished it like his father told him he'd have to to attend the party. This is after that homework, and after he checked the mail, verifying the school's message hadn't arrived yet. He isn't yet on a time crunch. The only reason you are saying this is because as the audience member who has already seen this movie, you know what is coming. Kid doesn't have that knowledge yet. Let him f*** with this plastic. Play replaces his mother's nice stemware with plastic cups. A smart move that I wish I had learned a couple decades sooner. However, he puts them in the still very breakable china cabinet. Well, what the hell do you expect him to do? Move the china cabinet? If you know anything about china cabinets, you'd know you ain't moving them shits on short notice. He called mom out a name. Well, don't you think it's been long enough? Telling your kid how much to grieve over a parent's death. First of all, there are clearly limits. I mean, you can't use your parent's death as an excuse 30 years after it happened, right? Obviously, that would be egregious, meaning there is a point in time where you can criticize someone using that as an excuse for getting into trouble. But more importantly, I just gave away why Robin said that. Kid uses this as an excuse to get out of trouble. He's not telling him how much to grieve. He's saying take responsibility for your own actions. <sighs> well, don't you think it's been long enough? I am sick and tired of you using your mother for an excuse every time you get in trouble. I don't give a damn if Marvin Gaye gonna be there. You won't! I understand needing to discipline your child, but making one measly school fight out to be worth your kid missing a golden opportunity to mingle with the man that sang the ultimate f song seems like a little much. We all need priorities, but if Marvin Gay comes to the door, you f***ing answer it. I don't know about all that. I mean, even back in 1990, Marvin Gaye was dead. You're saying open the door for a zombie. Who's that in the car, Play? Oh, uh, that's a honey. Excuse me, that is Kelly Joe f***ing mentoring that car, and you will treat 80s, 90s young adult movie royalty with the respect it deserves. He did. He called her a honey. 
that's better than ho, right? Besides, she ain't me along. My mom ain't no bitch. If I'm a bitch, your mama's a bitch. This particularly sinful use of the symmetric property of equality. You just went on a whole fucking soliloquy about this chick only to nullify her point that she isn't a bitch. Congratulations. <laughs> movie plays this like it's just high school hijinks, but they just tried to murder him. Twice. Yeah, Stab is a murderous piece of shit that literally tries to burn down a house full of people later. You're not telling me anything I didn't already know. Besides, the real sin here is Stab's beat-up-ass Jordans. I mean, it's 1990 and those came out in 89. Why do they look like they stormed Normandy? Here's another dusty one for you dusties. I don't even feel good about saying this, but PCU has a better George Clinton plays a house party scene than house party. Good Burger has a better George Clinton plays a house party scene than both of them. They need discipline, not solitary confinement. That's true. To think this statement is now over 30 years old, and in all that time, this country has yet to properly deal with the over-policing and incarceration of young black men. So for the writers who included this relevant social commentary that is unfortunately still relevant, I'm going to have to remove a sip. But also, the writers will later on have full force try to burn down a house with people in it, making it super hard to sell the idea that Stab and company just need discipline. No, you had it right before. We're adding one. What the hell? Okay, I get it. It's usually all fun and games here, but on occasion we should acknowledge that the films we love to love hate do live in and are influenced by the world just like we are, and certain messages are more important than the sin count, so the removal stand and we can get back to the party. Good job. I was about to criticize you for immediately undermining your point. The point of the scene was that, from the perspective of the cops and patrons, they hadn't done anything worth locking them up for. Now, we know Stab probably should be under the jail for trying to kill a house full of innocent people through arson, but Zilla and Pee Wee shouldn't, yet they'd have been punished just as harshly, which is entirely the problem and something the film was attempting to point out, albeit a little clumsily. Black people are all criminals, even if they're not. Here's a sin removal. $15,000 for this house. Imagine being able to buy a house for 15 k So the sin, as always, is inflation. No, that's actually not inflation. It's just a bullshit line from a guy that was literally ad-libbing. First of all, $15,000 in 1990 is only 33000 today. And second, in an interview with Vlad TV, Kid told Vlad that comedians Robin Harris and John Witherspoon improvised most of their lines. In 1990, the median house price in California was just about $200,000. There is no universe in which he purchased that house in Los Angeles for 15 k and it's far more likely that John was referring to a down payment or a number he thought sounded big. I'm getting those digits. I too have confidenced myself into a British accent while on my way to get those digits, and the resulting drink that was thrown in my face is all the evidence I need to know that this will always be a sin. I agree. You trying to clown anyone for their British accent is always a sin. We know what you sound like, and for those that don't, watch my Minions video. I'll be alone with my woman sometimes, and I'm damn near about ready to wax that ass, and all I can do is vision this fool, man. What? Wouldn't be a 90s comedy without a little repressed homophobic humor added in. You're taking the progressivism too far. The joke wasn't homophobic. If you'd let the rest of the scene play, Zilla and Pee Wee make it clear that they wouldn't be focused on another man while having sex. But I know when it comes to my dick action, all I can think about is the pussy, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing about that is homophobic, and it's something I'd agree with them on. The hell are you thinking about your nemesis for when you're in bed? Why do you have enough blood in your brain to think? Also, also, why is Stab so obsessed with Kid? The movie makes it seem that their first scrap was earlier today, and all that happened was Stab got some of his milk spilled on him. Then you're clearly missing the characterization. This is the movie, right now, telling the audience that Stab and Kid always get into confrontations. That's why Kid reacted the way he did when he bumped into Stab earlier at school. It'll never not be funny that you always ask movies for info, but lose your mind when they give it. Come on, girl, put some use to them coins on your feet. Bilal believes this comment will entice Sydney to want to dance with him. To be fair, Bilal is comically unaware. Multiple people have implied or outright told him his breath is on dragon mode, but apparently he doesn't realize it. I'm just saying, if you don't brush your teeth, you're probably not good with women. All right, this dance battle scene is iconic. But it's also the reason that my younger self believed every dance was a dance battle. A view not shared by several clubs throughout the tri-state area, which I am still forbidden to patronize. Mmm, Jeremy sends something he likes cliche. Yo, Bilal! Switch again! Dickish kid is dickish for no reason. But also, the movie feels like it's missing a scene that would explain why he's so against dancing with this one random girl. I feel like this is the same one from earlier that caught him looking at Shireen. But even if that's the case, that doesn't explain why he's this eager to move on to dancing with someone else. All right, you've admitted you've already seen this movie, so you know Kid is trying to woo Shireen. You even admit you recognize the earlier scene where he's eyeballing her like an airport cop. 
It should be obvious why he wants to switch. I mean, bruh, have you seen Shireen? I'd be up in that house with a dashiki and afro and some barbecue. If you know, you know. Without this movie, we don't get Bad Boys 2. The disrespect. Bad Boys 2 is another classic. Rotten Tomatoes be damned. You don't know you f***ing with. I'm from a small town called Fresh Off a Cops Ahead. You're making me homesick. <laughs> Robin Harris steals every scene he's in and makes it look easy as hell in the process. We left this world way too early. It's a shame we didn't get 40 more great performances after this one. Agreed. He'll probably be best remembered for Bebe's kids, but his lines in this movie are iconic. And I remind you, they were all ad-libbed. Always and forever. Without this movie, we don't get Big Mama's House too. What's with the random hate on Martin? He's literally the biggest star in this entire film and went on to have the greatest career. Without this movie, we don't get Martin, th the show. And I know damn well you ain't sinning that. The Roof! The Roof! The fact that Play is singing The Roof is on Fire with zero knowledge of Stab's plans to burn his house down is some serious irony. And I'm not just talking about the Alanis Morissette kind of irony. Which is the point of the scene. You think pointing out what filmmakers were going for is a sin. And that's hilarious. Yo, who got a light? How about a Bud Light? Either a very strange product placement or the worst punchline ever told. Either works for me. The police arrest full force and just f*** off without even inquiring about the party obviously going on inside the house. Sure, attempted arson is more serious than a party, but the movie has established that these two are not really that concerned with public safety. Jeremy, arson is a felony. Attempted murder is a felony. I'm sorry, but you cannot convince me that a party, which is a please keep it down at best, would take any kind of priority over catching potential arsonists red-handed. The movie has not established that they don't care about public safety. You just made that up. Give me that mic. Oh, you want some of this? House Party rips off the rap battles from 8 Mile. This is an obvious chronology joke, but I'm still sending it anyway. Don't ever disrespect House Party by bringing up 8 Mile. That movie is okay, but this one is better by 8 Miles. Is it gonna be me or Eraserhead? This is the second Eraserhead reference, and as the rules state, each film is only allowed one. I would have pointed out that it's weird for people wearing 3-inch flat tops to criticize someone with a 6-inch flat top. It's like we have the same hairstyle, only your eraser has been used. Oh yeah? <laughs> Anything y'all could do, I, I also can do, but I could also do it better. Why does Martin Lawrence look as confused about the delivery of that line as I am after hearing it? Because this is a comedy film, Paul R Martin Lawrence. Come back to bed, Harry. Harry? <laughs> Infidelity. <laughs> that f***ing laugh. Why you gotta play the alky role at my party? Why are you not asking if this guy's still alive? P pro probably because he's still moving? You gotta take things slow at first. Nudging side boob with your arm isn't taking things slow? My college girlfriend gave me all the wrong tips. Considering how up in arms you get about potential gay jokes, I'm sure she gave you the right tip. Well, after Mr. Williams' son went crazy and started sniping people from the roof, most guys just drop me off on the corner and tell me to call him when they get home. <laughs> just because kids' steadfast pursuit of sexy time is in line with the results expected from the irrational cost-benefit analysis going on in a teenage brain doesn't make this any less of a power of boner sin. Considering the context is Shireen is a girl from the projects and the movie clearly shows kids' nervous laugh, I'm going to say that joke went over your head. Also, Jeremy says boner. I'll tell you what's not right. The way you keep fronting on me. That ain't right. Kid is giving shit to Sydney because she wants to take things slowly while he really wants to smash her subscribe button. It seems all cool because they do hash things out and come to an understanding. But it also seems uncool because every line Kid delivers feels and sounds like a lie. Even... You see, my mother's dead. Don't hate me, I'm just the messenger on this one. Huh? I'm not even sure what any of that has to do with this scene. Our contemporaries would point out that the scene shows Sydney withdrawing consent, while the actual film is saying Sydney is afraid because she thinks Kid prefers Shireen. Both of those would have been worthy topics to discuss, but you went the dummy route. Now that we're friends, let's get with the loving. Even with all the terrible pickup lines we have heard throughout the runtime of this movie, I feel like it's definitely a sin that this is the best one. How much experience do you have with women? Serious question. Watch the film, bro. Sydney is practically head over heels for Kid, meaning almost anything he says will garner this type of reaction. I've had women that like me so much, I could sit in silence and they'd be convinced I was spitting game. I guess it's been in here a little too long. Yep, keeping condoms in your wallet makes them not work good. So don't do that. As always, you'll get kids or a host of other bad shit. So are you agreeing with the movie or? Ah, the story suddenly grants this opossum the same you shall not pass powers as Gandalf. Sinning this scene. It's fucking hilarious. Also, Jeremy makes a pop culture Free! This well-dressed cameo of the director and his brother doing a bizarre crime is severely unexplained. Yeah, you, you definitely from the suburbs. That's why you can't be on CPT. 
I need you on Japanese people time. Stereotyping people as punctual is still stereotyping. It's so bizarre. You cape for other people but miss the black stereotype. You know what CPT stands for? Even if you don't, it's clearly the opposite of the other stereotype. Besides, I've been to Japan. They are extremely punctual. Hell, I've had girls break up with me because I wasn't on time for a date. Shit real. After we go get kid, we all gonna shoot over to Burger King. Burger King. This has got to be the first ever instance of Lady Boners and Burger King combining their powers to resolve a storyline. I'm not even mad. Hell, I don't even disagree. And believe it or not, my agreeing with things is usually a sin. I know. I always point it out. Also, boners. Getting this excited when your friend is making out with someone. It's called being a virgin. Don't you know all about this? Oh my fucking god. Yep, there it is. The trigger. Mine was for House Party 2 though, so our timelines are a little different. Dude, that was insanely cringe. You're telling me. Mine was longer. Anyway, I guess this is goodbye. Wait, what? Why? Well, you no longer need me. You are Future Birdman now. Which I maintain is a stupid ass name because it's incorrect, but yeah, I already knew this was coming. We can't exist as the same being in the same dimension. But you have the stone. You know what to do. You've got the juice now. Well, f Wait, if I'm future Birdman now, why the heck can't I curse? Cause I'm the goat bitch. <sighs> now, how the hell do you work this thing? <laughs> Uh, oh, what the f Ugh. These lazy ass birds are lazy. That strangely sounds like my comment section. Uh, anyway, my ears are ringing. Oh, God. Birds in Africa. There what are the hell? Examples of birds just hitching a ride on large is that? Animals, so I'm just counting is that me? Thirty-three second Disney logo in the nineties makes me thankful this isn't a Pixar joint as well. Except this obviously isn't the Disney logo from the nineties. This is Oof. I just got hit with a wave of deja vu. These lazy ass birds are lazy. That strangely sounds like my comment section. But anyway, this is a fairly accurate representation of birds in Africa. There are a ton of examples of birds just hitching a ride on larger animals, so I'm just counting this one as an ignorance of reality sin. This is a ritual that needs to be done for some reason. Sinning African rituals. Even God shares his approval of the new lion cub by shining light down at the appropriate moment. Hopefully he'll save Simba's dad when the time comes, too. Which God? Because I'm sure this story takes place in a location inspired by Kenya in a time period around 1280 BC, if we're giving any credence to Scar's appearance in the Hercules film. And if we are, then the Greco-Roman gods are the ones you're talking about, and I doubt Zeus gives a f If we aren't, then I'll assume you're talking about the god of the Jews, in which case, yeah, he approves of Simba. He supposedly created everything, right? You know, like evil, disease, and taxes? Of course he approves of the things he created. He's as mad as a hippo with a hernia. Wouldn't any mammal with a hernia be in basically the same amount of pain slash anger? I think the reference was about the fact that hippos are incredibly short-tempered there, Jer. They kill about 3,000 humans every year, which is incredible for something that looks like a Prius on legs. Scar pretty much had no choice but to be a villain, since his parents named him Scar, and he was born with evil eyes. Are green eyes considered evil? In most cases in animation, wouldn't you consider red eyes to be evil? Also, Scar's original name is Taka, which doesn't necessarily refute what you're saying, as Taka means garbage in Swahili, but still, his parents didn't name him Scar, and that's the sin here. What am I going to do with him? I don't know, but after this scene, I would definitely be on the lookout for Scar to pull some straight-up Hamlet in the next couple of days. Jeremy makes a pop culture reference that this movie is also making so it shouldn't count cliche. A son of the wake. So they got James Earl Jones and Madge Sinclair to basically reprise their roles as king and queen from coming to America. So does that mean Simba's gonna go to Queens and work at a McDowell's? No. Does Simba one day get pulled over for having a trans hooker in his car? Oof, talk about a dated video. I'm not one of them cancel culture types, but even I wouldn't have touched that one in 2015. Everything the light touches is our kingdom. Manifest destiny. 
Without getting too deeply into this, that is not what Manifest Destiny means, nor is it an example of it. That concept applies to land that wasn't already yours. We just saw an entire sequence showing the lions rule the Pride Lands, apparently with the consent of all the other animals. What about that shadowy place? That's beyond our borders. Okay, first of all, if it's a shadowy place, then the light ain't touching it, and Simba shouldn't have to ask. Second of all, you've just said the light and sight were your borders. But now suddenly, oh yeah, we have interior borders around that scary place. I forgot. I like how you contradict yourself by putting words in someone else's mouth. I've never seen a contradictory straw man before. Congratulations on inventing that. Mufasa didn't say anything about sight. You put that word there. You then chastise Simba for not understanding the very simple concept of everything the light touches while yourself asking the same question Simba did. I thought it was easy to understand. Everything the light touches. If it's in shadow... It's not a part of the kingdom. There is nothing sudden about that. It is explicitly implied the shadow area is not their kingdom because the light doesn't touch it. What the hell are you on? Everything you see exists together in a delicate balance. That's why there are gazelle bounding nearby with no fear whatsoever that I might eat them at any moment. Just like the real Africa. You realize you're showing a scene of gazelle running away, right? I mean, they're not just kicking it in front of the lions, they're obviously leaving the area. And even if they weren't, this is an animated film with lions and animals that talk. I don't think anyone was under any assumption this is depicting the real Africa, especially with a male lion taking a loving walk with a single male cub. You know that doesn't happen, right? But sure, let's focus on the gazelle. Mufasa? Simba? Mufasa allows Simba to be a dick to his loyal servants. That is entirely the point of a servant to serve a purpose. In this case, Zazu serves the purpose of teaching his son an invaluable trait necessary for a lion's survival, how to stalk prey. I never get to go anywhere. You're like six days old, dude, Jesus. It's so weird that you just answer the characters in movies. I might have to create a cliche for that. Wait, 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 Birdman. You've already created that cliche in a previous video. I did? Which one? And who are you? The Jurassic Park The Lost World video, and I'm you from the future. Well, kind of. Anyway, you should already have a cliché for that. Hmm, okay. W wait a minute, I've never done a video on Jurassic Park, let alone my favorite in the franchise. I mean, I would know. Hmm, I guess he was right. I'm technically not future Birdman. More like alternate dimension Birdman. Uh, hello? What are you mumbling about? I need to get back to sending this video, pal. Uh, yeah, whatever. The point is that you came up with a cliché for that already, so think of one now. Okay. I've got it! If you're me, then you know what I'm going to say. Ready? On three. One, two, three. three. Jeremy, Jeremy has run out of the material cliché. Cliche. Wait, what? That is not how this went last time. I mean, it is, because that's what I said originally, but the cliché is definitely Jeremy yells at the screen cliché. Uh, see? You're not the real Birdman. You're false Birdman. FB for short. Dude, was I this insufferable? I am so sorry, FB. You're mumbling again. And why would it be yelling at the screen if he isn't actually yelling? Jesus, you sound like Stan. Well, the point wasn't that he's actually yelling, but that just like the crazy people in the theater that talk to the screen like the characters in the movies could hear them, well, you know, they yell. I don't know. If it were me that came up with that, I'd have said talks to the screen cliche. Would have been worth five cents, too. When I'm king, what'll that make you? Why does everyone assume that Scar won't die well before Mufasa does? And why does Scar think he'll ever have a shot at the throne anyway? Scar seems well beyond the years where his possible royalty would even matter that much to him. He should have thought about killing Mufasa long ago before Simba was even born. That was two unrelated questions in a couple of statements. How is someone that's not me supposed to answer all of that? You package so much bullshit into a single sin, and that's why you get away with this nonsense. Why wouldn't people assume the older brother dies first, especially one that's a target like a king? And the film proves him right. Mufasa died first, and he became the king. I mean, you're quite literally arguing against the events of the film. And I honestly don't understand what you mean by Scar seems well beyond the years where his possible royalty would matter to him. Isn't Mufasa older than him, and doesn't he care about his throne? I mean, what? Simba walks in on Nala while she's taking a bath. He's also seen her nude, too. Any other revelation you want to share with us, you virgin? But you two turtle doves have no choice. Having no choice is like the baseline attribute of a Disney character. It's almost like Disney movies were usually about royalty or something. This whimsical break in the song could have been genuinely tragic. Okay. 
but it wasn't, so what's the sin for, exactly? Look, I know we're in a cartoon musical where anything can happen, but I'm drawing a line at synchronized animal pyramid stacking. Jeremy doesn't know what the word anything means. Zazu survives this, damn it. Jeremy doesn't know what the word anything means. <laughs> All right, it worked! Right, our plan to distract Zazu with song and then trap him under a rhino's butt came off without a hitch. How f***ing lucky are we? I'm aware that this is Jeremy we're talking about, but f***ing hell. The entire point was to ditch Zazu by any means necessary. This fool is pretending they were trying to get him crushed specifically. Hey, genius, it was my idea. It was? I distinctly remember you saying... So how are we gonna ditch the dodo? Oh, I know. And it was Simba doing the talking until Zazu interrupted. So how did you come up with it, Nala, you lying whore? I'm not going to get hung up on the fact that the now pretending to be progressive channel CinemaSins called a trans person a trans in a female child a <laughs> Oops, <laughs> got hung up on that. But I will say that there is a difference between an idea and a plan. It was Nala's idea, but Simba's plan. The elephant graveyard is creepy and cool, but how do all the elephants know to come here right before they die? Wouldn't some of them be like, F it, I'm dying right here where I am? Or are you saying they die, but then other elephants or hyenas or some animal carries the bones all the way here just to keep this creepy spot a thing? <sighs> I'm sure some elephants die on the spot, Jeremy. The point in this movie is this is the spot most elephants come to die. Do you just say that a human graveyard isn't a human graveyard because some people die at sea, for example? What do you think you're saying here? Hey, <laughs> did we order this dinner to go? No! Why? Cause there it goes! <laughs> nice joke, considering you spent precious seconds of escape time to come up with it. Jeremy sends something he likes cliché. Oh, so you do have that one. Uh, yeah? And dude, why do you sound like that? You don't need to know. It isn't your time yet, Daniel-san. Where's Zazu? Do you even worry about Zazu anymore after a rhino sat on his body? Dude, this is an animated film where hyenas work with a lion, a warthog chills with a mongoose, and a monkey is a shaman. Build your bridge and get over it. Editor Birdman chiming in here. When I originally uploaded this video, I realized quite a few people didn't actually go to school, so they missed the lesson where animal classification was explained. Like this guy. What's the animal in this world that you fear the least? Fish. Animal. Fish. <laughs> Don't start. Don't. Don't. You're starting and I'm not. A fish is an animal. No, it's not. I'm talking about an animal animal. Like fish! <laughs> fish fish! <laughs> fish! That's like saying like an ant. That's not an animal. Fish aren't animals. That's like a, that's a sea creature. A fish is an animal. You can't go to the zoo and see a fish. They don't have zoo fishes. There's actually so many fishes. There's fish zoos? No. You can go to a fish zoo. No, oh. there's so many fish that they have their own fucking attraction called an aquarium. That's different. That's like sharks and shit. <laughs> no, that's why they have different names. I'm talking about an animal like a monkey zebra. That's like saying a mammal. Is a lizard an animal? No, it's an insect. What's a, a reptile. Oh my God. Just like how that moron doesn't realize that fish are animals and that sharks are fish, a lot of people that originally watched this video were very clearly unaware that meerkats are mongooses. It's almost like I know what I'm talking about and don't put misinformation in my videos or something. Anyway, just thought I'd throw that in there for the zombie that was gearing up to type Timon is a meerkat, not a mongoose. You damn goofies basically said gorillas aren't apes. I'll bet I just blew someone's mind with even that. In other words, America. This is the longest spine anyone has ever slid down to escape in the history of spine slide escapes. Either you don't know how big an African bush elephant is in comparison to a lion cub, or you don't know what perception means. I'm actually fine with Mufasa knowing Simba was in the elephant graveyard, but knowing exactly where he was to save him in time? In time for what? This particular moment? You realize Simba and Nala have been running away from the hyenas for a while now, right? My point is, Mufasa could have saved them at any one of those points, but didn't or was unable to. Conveniently, for this convenient sin, you've chosen the point he was able to do so, forgetting all the other times they barely escaped death. You're not making the point you think you are. So Scar's plan to get Simba into the northern border actually worked, but if he successfully killed Simba, then what? Was his plan to then kill Mufasa? Potentially, sure. I mean, that's what ended up happening anyway. But if he didn't, Mufasa would have to sire another heir or die and transfer the crown to Scar. You deliberately disobeyed me. You just said that two minutes ago. You deliberately disobeyed me. Is this a repetitive dad or a copy-paste screenwriter? Discuss. Says the guy that starts off every single video with the logo sin. <laughs> wow, Scar found a way to get nature itself on board with his musical number. Sinning, be prepared. 
That's worth these many sins. Maybe frightened wildebeest would stampede down into a gulch like this. Maybe they wouldn't. I have my doubts. But my real question is, with a ridge that steep, how come half of them aren't falling and slipping and rolling all the way down this steep-ass goddamn rock surface? Um, because wildebeests are pretty good at this sort of thing? Tons of clear area to the right here, but Simba also went to the Prometheus school of running away from things. I don't think anything annoys me more about modern film discourse than the insistence that characters behave perfectly, especially when under stress. If characters don't have flaws or make mistakes, why would you watch them? Who the hell wants to watch a movie called The Perfect Puffingtons, where nothing happens because everyone does everything perfectly? Simba is, for any length of time, able to outrun the herd. Jeremy is unaware that lions run at the same speed as wildebeests and that this one had a head start. Long live the king. Well, sh this movie has some balls. The death of Mufasa is something very few cartoons are willing to do. It's plot appropriate, it's dramatic, so we will remove five sins. Despite that, those remove sins only to immediately undermine the removal cliche. <laughs> Do you have that one, fake Birdman? Huh? What? No, we didn't have that one. And why the hell am I a fake? <sighs> I was nowhere near this untrusting when he showed up in my Cloverfield Paradox video. Run away and never return. Question, why doesn't he just kill and or eat Simba right now? There are no witnesses. And if he's telling him to run away, there's obviously a benefit for Scar to having Simba out of the picture. And he's a wimpy baby lion, who you already tried to have killed earlier anyway. So why send away alive the one dude that can challenge your claim to the throne? This is so much worse than monologuing. Kill him. What? This is even worse than not killing him. Why didn't you kill him six seconds ago? Why are you letting this turn into a game for the hyenas and shit? You want him dead, right? They're the fools that failed you last time, dog. The f <laughs> Am I to believe that you have never seen this film and are only now reviewing it for the first time in 2015? Because that's the only possible way these two sins make any logical sense. But even then, upon Scar plainly refuting the previous sin, you left it in the video. Simba has to climb this to avoid the hyenas, but the movie glosses over that and he's at the top before they even catch up. Probably because cats can climb things and hyenas cannot. Sazu conveniently forgets that Scar punched him into a rock a minute ago when this started getting real. It's almost like he forgets the guy has all the markings of a true villain, that this is what he wanted all along and he was probably responsible for it. Even if he suspects Scar, which would be a weird thing to suspect considering Mufasa was killed by wildebeests, what the hell is he going to do about it? He's a bird! Buzzards start swirling around an animal that is clearly not dead and hasn't begun to decay for them to be attracted to it yet. That is not how vultures work. They will follow a stranded animal and wait for it to die in addition to scavenging already dead creatures. In fact, vultures love following lions specifically because they kill other animals that they'll attempt to scavenge and they absolutely will eat a lion that appears to be dead. What Jeremy isn't showing you is that this is what Simba currently looks like. Timon and Pumbaa ex machina. But my question is, why do they even give a sh a blatant scene manipulation. Timon and Pumbaa answer your question explicitly and you cut it out of the video. Get out! Get out! Get out! I love Woo! this bowling for buzzards! <laughs> Get some every time! It means no worries for the rest of your day. Even if you killed your dad, we promise that's not bad. Wait. <laughs> that was funny. Dude, what the f***? Were you seriously about to remove a sin while he was singing? Have you not created Jeremy sings in a video cliche yet? Holy shit, you sounded like me for a second. Cause I am you, you idiot. What kind of pussy universe is this? Oh man, we got a lot of work to do. Anyway, Jeremy sings in a video cliche. That was a lot of sins, man. You patting my sin count, bro? Cute song, but shaving his claws down like this is a horrible idea that only endangers him further out here in the wild, you dolt. It's almost like, being a mongoose, he doesn't give a dick about what endangers the dangerous lion and only about his own safety like he intimated at the beginning of this scene. And I got down How did you feel? Every time that I... Hey, Pumba, not in front of the kids. Oh. So it's completely okay to show and sound out farts on screen, just not call them by their name. Gotcha. I mean, it's possible the next lyric was sharded. Hakuna Matata! Hakuna Matata glosses over the thing that made Timon an outcast. Did he murder a family of four? I bet he murdered a family of four. Typically, when making these videos, I do a ton of research, especially those regarding animals, because I love learning about them irrespective of my job here on YouTube. But for this film, I've seen it so many times, I didn't really feel the need to do much. I said all that to say this. Timon is a meerkat. One of the most obvious parts of a meerkat's behavior is that they look out for others. To me, this means it's blatantly obvious that Timon is an outcast because he failed at his job. Now, I haven't looked that up, and it doesn't really matter because CinemaSins is not the arbiter of film criticism, so I don't have to take everything they say seriously, unlike the stands. Oh god, he's here too? 
silence you, but I'm willing to put my intuition to the test and allow the audience to fact check me there. Go on, why is Timon an outcast? Let me know in the comments section. How a bug's life should have ended. I mean, Hopper was kind of eaten by a bird. Simba definitely wasn't interesting during the time he grew into an adult, so we'll tell that story and dissolves as he walks across a log. Bruv, this movie is an hour and 30 minutes. Do you really need unnecessary side story stuff? Wait a minute, don't answer that. The answer is yes, so you can shit on it for no reason. Scar wanted to be king for some reason. More food? Surely he had enough. More women? Um, uh, knowing Scar, definitely not. So what the hell did he want from being king? At least King Claudius wanted to get a wife out of the deal. I don't see what Scar's motive is. The only thing he did was make the hyenas and lions live together. And then profits? What do you mean, surely he had enough food? How do you know that for sure? I mean, he wasn't exactly emaciated, but he damn sure wasn't as yoked as Mufasa. And are you implying Scar is gay? I mean, I know members of the LGBT like to ship and fantasize about certain characters representing their community, but you're hetero, so you're pandering. In a video where you shit on a trans person. Ninja Magic Medicine Monkey is so ninja, I wonder why any of this movie had to happen. And I'm left wondering what the hell Rafiki could have done to Scar to prevent it. Movie about remote African animals simply jam-packed with pop culture references. You know, for kids. Actually, for adults. I keep telling you that kids' movies often come packed with references that adults can enjoy as well. The irony is that you are always suggesting these are films only kids will see, but then you make a video on them. You're calling yourself and your audience children, is what I'm saying. Thankfully for the resolution of the story, Nala wanders really f***ing far from the Pride Lands to hunt, and does so on the huge continent of Africa, in the exact direction where Simba is. Phew, close one there. I see we're ignoring the passage of time you yourself pointed out earlier. My point is that Nala hasn't come here once in the three to four years it's taken Simba to reach sexual maturity, so this convenience sin you're attempting to make doesn't hold much water. You're also forgetting the plot. Scar's rule has created a drought that forced Nala to hunt this far out. Also, Nala, a freaking force of nature lioness, can't catch up to a freaking warthog. In addition to lions and wildebeest, Jeremy doesn't know how fast and agile warthogs are. I'm not saying they always escape lions, but it's just about 50-50. By the way, Simba should get his ass kicked in this fight. He's been living the Hakuna Matata life, remember? He hasn't never had to hunt or do anything badass his entire life. Doesn't really matter. He's still a healthy adult male lion. Males are significantly larger and stronger than the females of the species. If this were reality, Nala's ass would be as dead as fried chicken. Pleasure's all mine. Wait a minute, Pumbaa was food a minute ago. Are you telling me if someone vouches for him, he ceases to be food? Yeah. Can you feel the love I realize they knew each other as kids and were betrothed even as kids, and that they're still the only two lions way out here. But still, this hey I recognize you now I love you it seems rushed as hell. It's called being in heat. Something you've never experienced, apparently. Timber, if you don't do something soon, everyone will starve. I can't. Why can't you do something? Why can only the heir to the throne we just now learned was alive do something? Because not only is he the remaining piece of evidence that Scar was lying, males are significantly larger and stronger than the females of the species. If this were reality- He's alive! And I'll show him to you! Rafiki gets Simba's hopes up again, only to show him the idea of his dad being alive is one of those metaphorical things. I think Simba would have been happier with one of those Hogwarts paintings of living dead people. He lives in you. The power was inside you all along, cliche. Again, another two sins for the same concept. Rafiki telling Simba that his father was still alive was an obvious nod to the he lives in you thing, something you clearly recognized because you pointed it out. So you've just said the same thing twice and doubled the sins. You know you can do that in a single sin blurb, right? Cool part of the movie, I suppose, but would Simba have gone back to claim his throne without this supernatural dad vision? I feel like his character would have been stronger if he hadn't needed this vision to make the choice. Am I alone here? Yes, you are alone here. Most people understand the need for motivation. Why the heck do you think we follow fit chicks on IG doing pointless exercises that aren't actually targeting muscle groups? So they can yell about the creeps watching them in the gym? No, it's so that we can creep on them without them even knowing about it. Simba's going home, but you know what? This scene isn't inspiring enough. Let's add a shooting star. You know what? We need another. Okay, one more and we'll call it a perfect shot. Thank you. It's amazing how you live in Tennessee, but have never actually experienced the wilderness without any light pollution. In case you were unaware, there are millions of meteors in our sky every single night. Considering the African savanna doesn't have a drop of light pollution, you should see shooting stars in every night scene. The real sin is that there weren't more. You guys have to create a diversion. Oh, really? What did you plan to do if Timon and Pumbaa didn't make the trip? Something else. Next question. Tell me it's not true. It's true. Simba tells the truth, but somehow doesn't give the full story. One that he would easily be forgiven for, even if it's 100% true. You'd think as an adult, he'd be like, my stupid little kid roar caused a bunch of wildebeest to stampede? 
I think not. The point of the scene is that Simba still feels responsible for his father's death after having been gaslit by Scar and left to stew on it for a few years. And let's be clear here, Mufasa's death doesn't happen if Simba wasn't there in the first place. I mean, are you not watching this movie? Are you just skimming through it? He was there to save his son, and if his son was home where he was supposed to be, Mufasa might still be alive. He is partially to blame. That is not a lie. <laughs> Well, it's over now. Benson has joined the battle. Jeremy makes a pop culture record. Are you talking to me? Now they're in for it. They call me Mr. Pig. Finally, Taxi Driver and In the Heat of the Night together at last. Jeremy sends a movie for making a pop culture reference after literally just doing one himself. Villain does some bullshit to justify the good hearted hero straight up killing them cliche. In other words, a villain. I'm sorry, I want him to win for sure, but Simba has never been in a fight. Unless during that unimportant time where he was walking across a log and age five years, he somehow joined a dojo or something we didn't see, he should get his ass kicked right here. <laughs> Such a weird assortment of criticism. Have you ever seen Scar in a fight? I know you haven't seen the sequels and spinoffs at this point, so where is the idea that Scar should win coming from? Because you're using the same logic for Simba that we didn't see him fighting. These are lions, dog. They fight on instinct. You literally raise cats. Do you think your house cat doesn't instinctually know how to defend itself? Arranged marriages are always accurate and perfect, and you shouldn't fight them. I don't know. I think if someone were to arrange a marriage between me and Karuchi, it would be perfect, and she shouldn't fight it. And of course I set it to Icelandic time because we share a love of the Aurora Borealis Gordy. Movie kicks off with some bad 90s sitcom dialogue and I suddenly wonder if I've been tricked into watching a live action Bojack Horseman. With the way the film treats the Gordy sitcom, I'm sure it was bad on purpose. This means you're sending a film for accomplishing something it set out to do, and that's a huge problem with film discourse in 2023. Everyone thinks they know better than the filmmakers and yet they miss when things are being done on purpose. Somehow you'd think that a man who can send a rocket into space would be able to manage a halfway decent birthday present. This false equivalence being passed off as comedy in the audio track to your fake sitcom. Again, a double sin for the same issue. Explain how this is functionally any different than the first sin. You're saying the sitcom's dialogue is bad and or a sin. Cool, we got it the first time. Also, also, 45 seconds for two logos. See, this is that bull that I've been talking about. You understand the reason for the length of the logos is the dialogue from the sitcom that's being played in the background, but you emphasize two as if you're just watching these sequences for no reason. That's why this series exists, to get people to question those they mindlessly listen to, most especially film critics on YouTube who, if they aren't Jeremy Johns, Chris Stuckman, or Anthony West, you're probably being lied to. This feels like a still shot for a grisly 1990s remake of The Wizard of Oz. Fantastic. I'm glad you were able to share your harebrained thoughts with the audience. I guess my main question is, what the hell does that have to do with everything wrong with Nope? You saying this is something wrong with Nope? Okay, why is this feeling like a steal from a remake of The Wizard of Oz a bad thing? You got nothing, right? You just wanted to make sure something important to the film makes it into your video even though you actually have nothing to say about it, right? Oh, and they already kinda did that. It's called Return to Oz, and it was f***ing fantastic. Also, it's so goddamn obvious that this shoe means something, and I love that, but are we supposed to have fun not knowing what it means until we consult second, third, and fourth sources? I thought that was the fun of film discourse up until recently. Gone are the days where we talked and theorized about what things meant, and here are the days where having a woman as your protagonist becomes a political battleground. The good films leave you with something to chew on. Considering that a sin tells everyone just how seriously they should take you. This search for a group of missing hikers is set to resume this morning just outside Awadulse. Everything we are hearing in the news report is relevant to the story. But did it need to be? Or could we maybe sometimes just watch a horse eating hay and let it be what it is? Have you not spent the last 10 years on this platform saying things that aren't important to the story are sins? I guess I'm confused at why the film delivering the audience information is a sin when you always ask for more information. This debris is the pocket remnants of some hikers that had recently been feasted on. So where's all the blood? The next time Denim Dan dines and purges, it will cover a whole house with blood. Here I would at least expect a light drizzle. At this point in their abduction, they haven't yet gotten consumed or masticated. In the scene with the blood, Jean Jacket is regurgitating, trying to spit up the horse decoy. This is why all throughout the scene you can still hear people screaming, and in the one you're talking about, 
you can't. Hot. That's all we get is two minutes of Keith David. You had Keith David and you went the two minutes route? He and Roddy Piper beat each other up longer than this. They live? No, he did! Oh, hush you. I remember what you said about Keith David's voice in the Princess and the Frog video. Also, I don't know if I like your take on African-American vernacular right there. Whenever white people try to speak it, it always comes across as racist for some reason. Like, the lack of flavor just makes it sound like you're making fun of us. So the sin here is, that's racist. Nigga. The man's been dead for almost 200 years, but you still can't trust Thomas Jefferson around black people. That was pretty funny, but this is one of those times where you should just ding the ding, but not raise the sin count. You know, like what I'm going to do, since I like the joke, but needed to chastise you for something. Also, would they have given OJ this coin so soon? Or at all, for that matter? Is this not evidence in an unexplained death? Okay, I could maybe see this being a representation of the police not doing their due diligence in the situation, and if that's the case, the movie will just have to receive this sin on behalf of poor police work. I really don't see why not, considering this isn't a homicide case and it isn't a murder weapon. OJ probably asked what the hell happened, and they gave him the coin, saying, this... I've said this before, but this is one of those instances where the film answers a question you're asking in a roundabout way. The answer is the police ruled this as an accident, and you later learn they believe the objects fell from a plane. Having a key with one ring. I mean, a ring with one key. I mean, one key to rule them all. Jeremy makes a pop culture ref- One minute of viewing the inside of this sphincter without knowing that we're inside a sphincter. How is this not worthy of a sin off? This is one of the best things about watching a Jordan Peele movie. He hides things like this in plain sight, and it's not until a second watch that you start to pick them up. Your name is O.J.? This is an extremely strange way to show that this washed-up actor on a commercial set might be oj -ist. Yeah, it's a Gen X filmmaker making an O.J. joke. They still think those are funny. But I mean, you have to admit, anyone being nicknamed O.J. is going to garner some type of reaction. Think about all the people watching this video that haven't seen this movie when you mentioned the name back in Sin 13. Considering the nature of that sin, I'm almost certain someone thought you were making an O.J. Simpson joke. Now, I know you guys know Edward Warbrick. We do not. I don't think I can name a bigger sin than a channel literally named Cinema that does not know one of the pioneers of cinema. He's just begging you guys to unsubscribe. That's why back at the Haywood Ranch, as the only black-owned horse trainers in Hollywood, we like to say since the moment pitchers could move, we had skin in the game. <laughs> this presentation deserves a whole lot more reaction to it, and that's probably the point, and it might even be true to life, but it feels like Emerald Spiel is too good to get just an isolated, embarrassed chuckle from the director. That's exactly the point. When it's brought up how black people have been integral to the fabric and culture of this country, you get crickets in the best case, or met with outright antagonism in the worst. That's why this scene is so effective. It's them saying, we don't care what you've done for us, we just want to use you. Again, this should be another sin off. Your dad left an enormous hole, I know that, but don't worry, they'll be ass. I know that this is the guy who probably got Otis and Emerald the job, but who the f*** is this guy? He just showed up out of nowhere. This could have just as easily been one of the people on set we saw earlier, but they went with some random dude, stuck a northern exposure cap on his head, and put him in the film. Again, this is another instance of the film answering a question before you've asked it, and amazingly, you still ask that question. It's clearly the guy that got them the work. The film presents a minor character, and through dialogue and context, you understand these people have history. It's as simple as that, and you've made this into a huge deal. Oh, the well is a camera, too. It's like everything in this movie is a f***ing camera. I bet the goddamn villain is a camera. Could you imagine? It's almost like that's what they were going for, or something. Why does the poster for Kid Sheriff look way too much like the poster for Holes? It's almost like that's what they were going for, or something. These scissors on display for us to see are in no way related to making crafts. Jeremy makes an us pop culture reference that isn't a sin. You know, I don't think anyone's ever accused Mad Magazine of being topical, but what the f*** are they doing flame-broiling Dante's Peak in July 1997 when that movie came out in February? In the real July 1997, Mad went after Batman and Robin, which was a recent release. Of course, Mad also went after July's Air Force One in December 1997, so the sin, as always, is mad. So what you're saying is you contradicted your own sin within that sin and that the film does in fact line up with reality? Thanks. Gordy's Home began airing in the fall of 96 and it was an immediate hit. The movie wants me to believe that Gordy's Home had a chance against Everybody Loves Raymond, Moesha, Spin City, Third Rock from the Sun, Seventh Heaven, Sabrina the Teenage Witch, Nash Bridges, The Jamie Foxx Show, Keenan and Kel, Arthur, Hey Arnold, Dexter's Laboratory. You know what? I can't tell if 96's TV lineup was stacked or if I just watched way too much television. It could also be that none of those shows existed in this universe. You know, on account of this movie having a different mad issue than the one in reality? You always do this, trying to assert our reality on the reality of a film universe. This is 
why you and the morons you've bred on YouTube believe that magic has to have rules, because you think movies are subject to the rules in our world. They're not. That's why we call them fiction. This Dutch couple paid me 50k to come in here and spend the night. Those who don't respect other people's cultures and the Dutch. Jeremy makes an Austin Powers pop culture reference that isn't a sin of the... Also, while SNL has been known to push boundaries, would they have made a sketch about a TV show where a chimp actually kill actors on set? Well, not the pussy SNL of today, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna have to go ahead and look that one up on YouTube. <laughs> details, you know. The typical reaction you receive after telling someone about Cinema Sin somehow makes it into the script. The fact you think people go to you guys for details is hilarious, even if you might be right. So the sin here is for, as always, your dumbass audience. I was supposed to get the train jean jacket. But then Pops got some Western and jean jacket wasn't mine no more. It was Scorpion King, actually. It wasn't a Western. Dashing your daughter's dreams over the Scorpion King. Since you've never been an actor or worked on a set, let me give you a bit of information as a person that has. The money is green. You see, a lot of people like to make fun of what other people do for a living. I, myself, get flack for talking about films and playing games because some people's idea of a job is sitting in traffic for an hour, clocking in at a place they don't want to be, and taking orders from someone they don't even like. But my point is, the money is still green. While you make fun of the Scorpion King, the production still paid a lot of money to those that worked the set. The Scorpion King might have been bad, but a $10,000 check for a few days' work isn't bad at all. Busters? And stuff? In the machine? In the shell? Oh, I got it! Sam Wheat in the shell! No, wait. Sam Wheat on the half shell! God, turtles on the half shell! My dude, this is not the everything, everywhere, all at once video. Boom. Power now. See? Wow. Stop. Why does Otis tell Emerald to stop the footage some two hours before the footage they're examining? Because the power goes out, thereby stopping the recording? He's trying to see if the camera's captured anything earlier than the blackout. Like Oprah? Yeah, like Oprah, for example. Yeah, that wasn't on Oprah. I didn't say Oprah. You said Oprah. You love Oprah. This Oprah's on for so long that I thought they were trying to manifest her, like Beetlejuice or the Candyman. It was literally 12 seconds, Jeremy. Jesus Christ. I hear you laughed at least double that time. Well, I'm saying there's plenty of videos of flying shit online. I saw one the other day that wasn't on Oprah. Also, it was probably not on Oprah because the Oprah Winfrey show ended in 2011. Yet movies still somehow refer to it as if it's a program that's still on. While the Oprah Winfrey show might have ended in 2011, Oprah was still doing television. The Oprah conversation and Oprah's book club are still Oprah, and as recent as 2021, she conducted interviews with interesting people. This film was made in 2021. Smell of poor sh and fresh air. Employees who assume you're okay with casual swearing. To which I would reply, customers who are not. Ah! Whoa, 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 whoa. Angel is not immediately asked to leave. I mean, he is delivering equipment that will make them internationally famous and rich, so. So they changed the name to UAPs. No one knows what the f a UAP is. All I'm going to say is that my college girlfriend had UAP long before Cardi B came out with WAP. So some people do know whether they want to or not. Nobody wants to hear about the ugly ass postules on your hand, Jeremy Jesus. OJ goes through the trouble of making this VFX ball that looks very similar to the one that spooked Lucky on set earlier. Now, I for one am very interested to see how this tool will factor into the story. This is great because we never see this thing again for the rest of this movie. You don't need to. OJ is a horse wrangler. Take some time to let that sink in. I understand that you believe his job is searching for UFOs, but he's still taking care of his real responsibility. He saw how violently Lucky reacted to this device, so he's building one to desensitize his horses to them. That's it. That's all. Nope. Mm -mm. Nope. I'm out. Uh, nope. And your heart is worth two in the barn. Sending this scene. That's worth these many sins. Also, a movie raises our expectations about an alien encounter just so it can sh all over us. This is like those asshole kids in Jaws who put a fin on their back as a practical joke and panics an entire beach and distracted everyone so that the real Jaws could murder that one dude in the orange rowboat. This is not like that at all, considering these kids are cosplaying as an alien we never get to see. The kids in Jaws were playing as sharks. Jean Jacket isn't an alien. Hey. Sneaking up on someone with Cheetos in hand, but not offering them any Cheetos. Jeremy thinks people share hot Cheetos. Jeremy is clearly a Doritos guy. Oh, get your f***ing bunny mantis. Hi, 
You like Sour Patch Kids? While throwing candy at a praying mantis may not be illegal, wasting Sour Patch Kids is unacceptable, especially when there is clearly a lower part of the roof that M could have climbed up to remove the mantis from the camera. That also looks extremely steep and dangerous, considering the part of the roof that she'd be able to climb is literally the edge. She said she does a little singing on the side, not that she was an athlete. I will say y'all been knocking horses out your damn head. Okay, I know nothing about the day-to-day -day activities on a horse ranch, but maybe you should go to his job and do that. That would be unwise, considering that's an actual thing. Look, I'm not going to risk getting demonetized by showing it, but horse breeding kind of requires you to whack off a horse with a giant camera. As for how I came about this knowledge, uh, let's just say my friends are bigger dicks than the horses. I mean, we have proof of aliens on video. I mean, yeah, I wouldn't call it proof. How the f*** does she think that's proof? They've recorded a still cloud with no UFO visible. I feel like Emerald thinks this so that there's a reason for Angel to exist, so he can tell her why the video they've shot doesn't prove shit. There's a lot to unpack here. First, your question doesn't make sense. She might be saying it incorrectly, but she's right. She has videographic evidence of the supernatural. That cloud not moving in a time lapse means there is something blatantly wrong. And hell, as far as we know, Jean Jacket created that cloud, or it's a part of it, as it doesn't obey physics the way a real cloud would. Regardless of Angel's existence, she would feel like she had something. You know, because she thought that when they went to Fry's? Remember? Oprah? And Angel is here because he wants to be here. They've been trying to get rid of this dude from the jump. Also, oh good, the Gordy section of the movie. This will be interesting, but it'll be like watching an entirely different movie within the movie we're watching. Kind of like the beginning of The Exorcist. Besides, Gordy was a terrible pig movie in 1995 that came out before Babe. So thanks for making me remember that. The Gordy section of the film is incredibly relevant, and I'll explain why. First of all, it details what happens to Jupe as a kid, giving context to the opening credits and first scene in the film. We learn precisely why Jupe believes he has a connection with Jean Jacket, ultimately leading to his own demise. This is in contrast to the more introverted Otis Jr., where he's grown up around unruly animals, and his job is to tame them. One believes he is gifted with animals, so he dies. The other respects animals, so he survives. Wait a minute, 1998, but the Mad Magazine cover with the Gordy birthday episode on it was from July 1997. This is an actual cinema sin. Jupe specifically states the Mad cover was in reference to the attack, but it prints a year before the actual events. Now, I have a question for the fans of CinemaSins that come here to claim that CinemaSins isn't being serious and that this is all a joke. Is CinemaSins joking here? Is this factual error a joke CinemaSins made up? You know, because you all tell me that we shouldn't take these videos seriously? Or are you upset that I'm making fun of a thing you like so you pick and choose what to defend CinemaSins over and your panties are in a bunch? Because my money is on the latter. Why the f*** is this guy casually walking down the steps right after Gordy went f***ing ape sh on the cast? I wouldn't say casually. That's clear trepidation. In the part of the scene that you cut out, you can hear his rapid footsteps and then he yells at Gordy, chastising the ape. Ew, uh, storm's coming. Just scarping up, just be safe. You're just now telling him this? If you take this very difficult action called paying attention, you'd see that OJ was coming out of the stable pushing a wheelbarrow. This is the second time I'm having to tell you this, but OJ is a horse wrangler and he's doing his regular job. He was obviously in the stable for a while and we saw the stable is somewhat cut off from the outside world in the scene with the kid aliens. But first, my boy's gonna come out and do a little number for us, would that be all right? Asking people a yes or no question that you have no intention of accepting no for. The word you're looking for is rhetorical, Jeremy, like every question I ask you. <laughs> Digestion. Sending this scene and skipping the one where Jupe gets eaten, even though you always find silly reasons to include iconic movie scenes. That's worth these many sins. I've heard a lot of arguments suggesting the alien's design is supposed to resemble a camera aperture, but not one suggesting that it's the butthole of the old Instagram icon. It's almost like the old Instagram icon is a camera aperture. Damn, I was right. It's not a ship. Yes, you're right, but I don't know what part of the experience you just had proved that it wasn't a ship. It doesn't act like any spaceships you've ever seen, sure, but have you seen any other non-human spaceships for comparison? Again, as I explained with the Gordy sequence, OJ is an animal tamer. He understands how they think and behave. The other part of the conversation that you omitted from this sin shows him explaining that he knows it ate the people at Jupiter's claim and that it was performing a territory display. It ate them, man. It ate them all. It's alive, man. It's an animal. Are you saying it's some sort of animal from an alien world? A predator, if you will? Have you considered calling Arnold Schwarzenegger or Danny Glover? <sighs> it's territorial. 
and it thinks that this is its home. It's been surviving on one horse every once in a while for the last six months, despite being the size of two school buses. He says, even though he just saw it eat about 40 people, kill Keith David with a coin because it ate people at the beginning of the film and ate OJ's horses, Clover and Ghost. But yeah, one horse every once in a while. No. Nope. We've been through every kind of nope there is. A little bitty stinging nope, and a big old fat nope, nope that flew in sideways, and sometimes nope even seemed to come straight up from underneath. Sinning this scene. That's worth these many sins. We're not going to tempt fate by playing the slowed down version of the Corey Hart mega hip sunglasses at night, but why the f is it playing in slow motion? Yes, yes, I understand that means the alien monster thing is probably close, so that's why it's only playing at half power, but the headlights of this van are fully on, and they should at least be flickering or strobing a little bit. I've got to admit, hearing the song slowed down definitely gives this scene an eerie soundtrack, which is more than likely 100% the goal, but I'm still sinning the f*** out of it. And the only reason you're sinning it is because the headlights on the van aren't flickering. Amazing. You detail plenty of reasons why the scene is great, even stating that you understood the goal of the scene, but you took all of that away because the headlights aren't strobing. Knees too pointy, zero out of 10. Don't look at an eyes, please. It is one big, huge convenience that Levi's Sky Monster obeys the same don't look it in the sphincter rules that Lucky and Gordy go by. Well, it's a movie monster and it abides by the rules the filmmakers gave it. Kind of crazy, huh? Like, why can't Godzilla just fly? I mean, he's got laser breath, so why can't he fly? Why can't E.T. just teleport home? I mean, he's an alien, right? Sheesh, these movies don't make a lick of sense. Hard to hard, bro. Yeah, like, read the room. Acronyms made from all one-syllable words that you still have to explain. You know, ever since the Doctor Strange video, you've been whining about acronyms and the syllables those words have as if that has any correlation to why people use acronyms. Like, you actually believe acronyms exist because the words have too many syllables, and I can assure you that's not the reason people acronymize things. Every animal got rules, right? We know what it wants, and we know how it comes, so... You don't really know sh Angel would be excellent at Cinema Sins. And OJ would be excellent at The Birdman, considering he's the one that found out Jean Jacket won't attack if you don't look at it, that it's an animal and not a ship, and that it can be lured. Look, I know Otis tried a thing one time and it worked, but before yesterday, the alien was fine eating horses and the occasional hiker, then it ate a whole audience. Its behavior is erratic at best. No, it's not erratic at all. It eats alive things. That's clearly the mark of a carnivorous predator. That was Juke. He got caught up trying to tame a predator. You can't do that. You gotta end an agreement with one. Oh, huh? You don't turn your back on a bear. You don't wear red around a bull. It's like that. In the middle of the plan to get evidence of the alien predator, Otis starts spouting out his advice for a successful career on Wall Street. See? Completely ignoring the fact that OJ understands animals and is currently the only one that knows what he's talking about. This helmet is all symbolism over function. Not true. This visor actually exists. You believe he can't see out of it, but I remind the audience, even if I didn't show you this visor, mirrored glasses are literally a thing. Jeremy thinks that because he's never seen anything like this before, it doesn't exist. It's kind of f***ed up that the tube man's eyes count as f***ing eyes to the alien. Why wouldn't they count, though? Don't they look like eyes? To this creature that couldn't tell the difference between a real horse and a decoy, do you really think it should be able to tell? Lucky should have been named Convenience. Irony. With the alien this close, why does the motorcycle still have power? Because it's actually not that close. It's just really f***ing big. My liking of the Akira slide doesn't make it necessary for this scenario or mean the physics involved is any less confusing. Who gives a shit? You're watching a movie with a giant parachute that eats horses. Why are you concerned with physics at this moment, you goddamn goofball? I don't know, but you don't either. Let's do the standard New Line logo, but since it's vampires, let's make it red instead of blue. Get it? And that's a sin because... Well, I guess just because CinemaSin says it's one. Yippee. Trained medical professional slams a pregnant woman's head on the table. It's almost like she's fighting against them while they're trying to examine her during a tense medical emergency. Y you left out that part, so I didn't think you noticed. Hey, childbirth isn't remotely frightening enough as it is. Let's cut it like a horror film and have random background characters talk about her being bitten. You know, to help comfort the viewer. <laughs> what the hell is this in? This is an action horror film about vampires. I'm almost positive no one on the screenwriting team was interested in comforting the viewers. You act like a horror film's entire purpose isn't to at the very least unsettle the viewer. Zip code 90031 is in Los Angeles, but the state is listed as Florida. Nice catch. This is a cinema sin. But I'm extremely petty, so I won't be removing a sin here. Why? 
because of the unclear nature of your sins, which has caused a glut of moronic followers that change their stance on a whim. For example, they always tell me these videos are jokes, but where is the joke here? 90031 is Lincoln Heights, not Florida, so this is CinemaSins accurately pointing out a movie mistake. Why does this count, but when I prove them wrong about something, it doesn't count? Grand Theft Baby. Do you not hear this woman's EKG? She dead. Her baby belongs to the state. By making the movie's title card the same font and size as its immediately preceding lead actor credits, it's possible some of the original viewing audience suspected Blade was just another actor in this film. And maybe he is? So people that purchased tickets to Blade saw Blade in the title credits and thought Blade was just another actor in a movie called Blade? I'm sorry, but I don't think the general population is as dumb as you. Sped up time-lapse opening credits footage is both a waste of time and a metaphor for humanity's rat race. Then why did you send it? That was at best a wash, and at worst, a wash. What the f*** is that? Guy clearly sees a body in a bag and still follows her deeper into the slaughterhouse. I mean, it's a slaughterhouse. You're going to see bodies in bags. But dude, the chick that he's following is Tracy Lords, one of the most famous and infamous porn stars of her time. If this lady is taking you somewhere seedy, you'd better go. Ladies and gentlemen, Tracy Lord's honest film career in three seconds. Considering Tracy's porn career was absolutely ridiculous, this is an upgrade, frankly. This guy took dance lessons from Elaine Bennis. If he did, he'd absolutely have everyone's attention. You know, because Elaine was killing it, right? Right? So, who hooked the sprinklers up to blood instead of water in this illegal temporary club? Where is the blood reservoir this is tapping into? Jeremy's watching a film where the premise is a half-vampire hunting an underground society of vampires, and his question is, who set up the blood reservoirs in clubs meant for vampires? Who? As in, not obviously other vampires that presumably built this place. Also, this would be like if a normal nightclub decided to spray beer all over everyone, which would be very sticky. And most of the nightclub occupants would rather just drink the beer normally. Besides being kind of gross, this seems incredibly wasteful. I mean, I guess, but vampires aren't exactly like humans. I mean, they usually revel in the morbid and take pleasure in gore, blood, and filth. Besides, when's the last time you've been to EDC? I'd wager the patrons of that excuse for women to be half-naked would love for cocaine to be sprinkled down on them like fresh powdered snow. Is this guy the only mortal they brought to the vampire ball to eat? Most of the other vampires here are probably going to be super pissed that they didn't get to have any human blood, because there's no way he could feed all of them. This would be like if it was my turn to bring donuts on donut day and I only brought one donut. I'd probably have fired. It's not like that at all. You just lamented the blood sprinklers. They were getting their fill already. Perhaps some of them prefer to kill a fresh human, but they were all clearly here having a good time without this dude. Everyone in this joint coordinates the stoppage of the blood play upon Blade's arrival. Jeremy points out things on the screen cliche. Also, Blade was somehow able to 100% sneak into this spot at this moment with no one seeing it, which is goddamn impossible, but whatever. Wait, you think it's impossible for one guy to show up and not be noticed in a club with loud music and a scrum happening in the mosh pit? And I like the caveat you threw in there. They didn't notice him until this moment? When should they have noticed him? Because that moment would have been exactly like this one. If they would have noticed him earlier or later, you're saying you wouldn't have called those moments convenient too? Stop the cap. <laughs> There were hundreds of them standing there, right? Is the movie really trying to tell me they couldn't all take him on and instantly succeed? But no, nope, they take him on one by one. You cut the context out of this scene. In the scene where you were complaining about them not noticing him, the audio of the footage you're showing is the vampires realizing who Blade is and saying aloud that they know him. That scene shows them giving him space and some of the vampires fleeing, which shows they are afraid of him. So the in-universe reason for them attacking one at a time is those that did were the only ones brave enough to face him. The out-of-universe reason is one-on-one -on -one fights, even brief ones look better on film and give the audience something to focus on in a frenetic scene. Stormtroopers eat your heart out. We found a group with even shittier aim than you. Vampires. He says over footage of the vampires hitting Blade square in the back, a spot that could potentially prove fatal for most people. <laughs> this bull Sinning this bullshit. That's worth these many sins. Blade is able to maintain a normal level of back flexibility even though his scabbard is built into his jacket and runs down his back. Okay. You pointed that out like it was impossible, despite actual footage of it being done. This is the windiest alley in the history of cinematic alleys, Jesus. Everything wrong with Blade, ladies and gentlemen. Wind. What are the odds a character about to be drawn into this vampire story is a hematologist? Like, lottery winning odds, right? Whatever the odds are, they are not zero. 
The hematologist was drawn into the story because the coroner asked her to look at a blood sample of a vampire, which turned out to be abnormal. I would think a hematologist would be the least surprising person to exist in a story like this. Hell, technically Whistler is a hematologist, so really you're asking what are the odds of there being two? Honestly. You ever have second thoughts about us? Guy demonstrates, with the timing of this question, why any sensible girl would break up with him. Yet another instance of you saying something the film is also saying, but treating it as something wrong with the film. With a reality as populated by vampires as this movie will suggest, it's a wonder this shit never happened before, honestly. What evidence does this film give you that it hasn't happened before? I mean, you saw a club full of suckheads, right? Surely at least a handful of them were turned in a manner similar to this, no? Also, this supercharged burn victim now appears to be cosplaying as a burn victim, given his freedom of movement and the silliness of his appearance. You're aware that's a vampire, right? As in a supernatural entity with superhuman powers and abilities? I get it, 1998 special effects weren't the best, but you're also trying to make the case that he shouldn't be able to move around so freely, forgetting that he has a healing factor. Despite leaving tons of victims behind at crime scenes prior to this, Blade decides to get invested in this one, which turns out to be a really good idea later, but whatever. The film shows us Blade takes pity on her because she reminds him of his own mother. Blade just had a flashback of his mother that he definitely couldn't remember because he was just born. No, I agree, but that is the reason he saves her, which nullifies your previous sin. I think these cops might be even worse shots than the vampires earlier. Why even have guns in your movie? I get it's a trope to make fun of stormtroopers, but why do you think that everyone with a gun is a crack shot? Real-life cops themselves will tell you they don't hit every shot, and neither do soldiers, people that train to be as accurate as possible. In fact, films like John Wick, where the character hits almost every target he fires at, are the inaccurate ones. If you're looking for authenticity, this is it. We can't play the song, but Marvel paid money to play one and a half seconds of Bad Moon Rising. New Line Cinema paid money to play one and a half seconds of Bad Moon Rising. Deacon Frost. I'm going to have a prominent bruise if this movie keeps beating me over the head with character names like this. Are they sure they don't want to change Karen's name to Dr. Pretty Brave Smart Brain? I'm not entirely sure what the criticism is here. Are you saying they're saying everyone's full name? I get why a dude named Jeremy Scott wouldn't like everyone saying full names all the time, but then what does Karen have to do with this? Because the other insinuation is that everyone's name is relevant to their characterization, which is a stupid criticism considering Deacon Frost is a comic book character. That is his name in the books, and they didn't just make up a character like they did with Whistler, who strangely has escaped criticism from all those people angry about the race change in The Little Mermaid. You know, because Blade turned a black character into a white one? Funny that. I think my favorite thing about this vampire movie is the undead UN meeting, where they argue about which kind of vampire is more important. I was born a vampire, but you, Frost, you were merely turned. That's racist. That's vampire racist. Yes, that was the point of this meeting. And I think it's hilarious you tried to invoke modern politics on ancient supernatural blood drinkers. Who's gonna go tell them? You? <laughs> Good luck, homie. Karen triggers the hand-exploding mechanism in Blade's sword without hurting herself. Because, as we are clearly shown, it is on a timer, which activated and made her remove her hand. Gas wasting is waste. And then he lights a cigarette! I'm pretty sure they show that specifically to show how much of a maverick badass Whistler is, Jeremy. So where am I supposed to go? You've been exposed to them. One way or another, somebody's gonna take you out. All the more reason for you to answer her f***ing question. That was an answer to her question. His point was that she's going to die no matter what she does. He already told her to get out of the city. Also, Jeremy talks to the, ahem, yells at the screen cliche. I still think it's strange to say yells. Here, vampire mace. <sighs> What's the problem? Mace filled with garlic instead of capsaicin because they're dealing with vampires. It makes all the sense. If there's one thing people fear about vampires, it's their raw computational power. In this same scene, the film tells you this is an archive. That means these devices you see are servers. These archives are restricted to the members of the House of Erebus. If I'm being honest, I only understood like 50% of what that guy just said. I don't doubt it. Danny Frost, I'm talking to you! You bore me. What? What is even going on right now? You cut out half the f scene. Blade drops off this vampire victim girl he helped save in the heart of Danger Town. Why did you even save her ass, eh? Is this your first time watching Blade? I find that incredibly difficult to believe, meaning you know he's using her as bait. You know the answer to your question, yet you still ask it and treat it as something the film just does for no reason. Back in my day, we called that Jeremy Fane's ignorance cliché. So Blade drops her off, she enters building, and immediately draws vampire assassin followers? How much does Blade suck at his job? <sighs> Oh, police officer, I didn't mean to scare you. 
The front door was open. This guy followed the police protocol. If the front door is open, the officer is required to sneak up on the occupant of the home. Wait, let me get this one. In my universe, Jeremy said this about the cop in Home Alone. Oh, in home, the house looks secure. This asshole says the house is secure, even though Kevin didn't lock the door as he was running away from Marley. Smells fishy. This cop must be on Sal Maroney's payroll or something. He says the house looks secure. What does Kevin not locking the door have to do with that statement? You're suggesting the cops have the right to just enter someone's home, and they don't. So the point is, he would later contradict this reasoning. Oh, dude, wait, you were telling the truth. You are from a different universe, because I definitely didn't do that video yet. Jesus Christ, you still up to this point thought I was making that up? It's been three videos. Which is another thing, because back in my universe, I was outputting over three a month. What? I've been busy. Suck my dick. So forget what you've seen in the movies. Does that include this movie? I'd love to forget what I've seen in this movie. This ain't Deadpool. He said that to a character within the movie, little guy. Which means you are talking yelling at the screen again. You ain't for the head or the heart. Anything else is your ass. Even though Blade has killed countless vampires during the course of this movie by hitting them anywhere in their midsection. Because he was using silver, which is one of their weaknesses, and he's clearly a seasoned fighter knowing precisely where to hit them. He's giving her targets suited for a beginner. Look, they're using the girl as bait. And you are stupid enough to say Shut up. I appreciate the help, random vampire chick, but I've got this. And you were stupid enough to take it? Jeremy thinks he's in the movie again. Vampire the Hut. Jeremy makes a pop culture reference that isn't a sin of the movie cliche. Instead of luring Blade out of the vampire Bible room, they decide to bring the fight there so they can destroy these priceless artifacts. Well, technically, only the glass displays got destroyed. And what do they care anyway? They're the low-class Saiyans of this franchise, and not one of them is named Kakarot. Catch you f***ers at a bad time. Whistler ex machina. Continuing to butcher the Latin language. Blade's mother was attacked by a vampire while she was pregnant. And the vampire somehow didn't just kill and eat the fetus. Instead, a super vamp was born. Is there anything funnier than Jeremy thinking vampires are zombies that actually eat people? He'd undergone certain genetic changes. Oh. I thought the serum was supposed to suppress that. His body started to reject it. Exposition, exposition, exposition? Yes, exposition, f***ing exposition, exposition! Yes, exposition that you clearly need, Mr. Why didn't the vampires eat a fetus? He told me what you are. You don't know anything about me. Except for all that stuff that Abraham just told her, basically your entire backstory. Yeah, but this phrase is a shortened form of, you might know my backstory, but you don't know me. It means just because you know a little about me doesn't mean you actually know me. For example, we all thought we knew R. Kelly, right? Get it? Neither Frost nor any of his vampire friends are affected by the sun rising quite like the guy they brought out here to kill. Yeah, yeah, sunscreen schmunscreen. He explicitly mentions the reason they aren't affected by the sun, and still questions why they aren't affected by the sun. You can't make this shit up. Also, this guy is already burning, even though the sun hasn't risen yet. That's probably because even though you can't see the sun, its rays are already being scattered by the atmosphere at the cusp of sunrise. This is called twilight. Science is fun. Why the hell is no one else burning up right now? I see that they have on their motorcycle get up, but their faces are still exposed to the sun until they put down these visors. And don't tell me it's because they put on this sunscreen, because I call bullshit on that being effective. And Dragon Eddie was definitely burning through his clothes earlier, so they should all be reenacting the Ark of the Covenant right now. You are conveniently leaving out that Deacon is wearing a thick black turtleneck with a leather jacket, and Dragon Eddie has on a thin white button-up shirt, which easily allows more sunlight to the skin. Take a step back. The reaction's energetic. Why not just say, don't put your eyes on that because it's about to explode, y'all? Is that not what she just said? She's a scientist, so she just said it more elegantly. Sun black. Booby continues to expect me to believe that Frost is completely impervious to the sun's UV rays because he's wearing sunblock. I mean, that's kind of how sunblock works. By blocking out the sun's UV rays. Besides, this is very clearly a supernatural film about vampires, something that doesn't exist in our reality. If the film says vampires, who notoriously hate the sun, invented a sunblock that is better than ours, I have no reason to doubt that. It makes logical sense in that world. How long are these assholes standing here like this without someone calling 911 about the creeper and the abducted Asian girl? Let me invoke the geniuses that keep commenting on my Age of Ultron video. How would those people know she's not adopted? That's racist. Jesus, even Blade is a goddamn stormtrooper with the gun in his hands. Or Deacon Frost is on another level compared to lesser vampires who are themselves incredibly fast. They literally show this dude dodging bullets in bullet time, something they did before the Matrix. Blade rescues girl who should not have been in danger anyway since this truck should have f***ing slammed on the brakes ages ago. Two sins. 
one for calling an obvious bus a truck, and another for thinking a bus can slam on the brakes at street speeds and still stop at this distance. And for everyone that thinks that bus could have stopped, we once again have an instance of Jeremy, and whoever thinks this, misunderstanding things that are happening at the same time. In this shot, you can see the bus is almost directly on top of the girl the moment she lands in the street. The other scenes are just showing you what happened in that same span of time. Frost took her. Fine, but why did he leave you even a little bit alive? To leave a message for Blade? I thought that was obvious. You seem a bit tense. She actually looks calm as f but whatever. Right, because this is totally the face of a chick that is calm as f Last time I saw a woman's face like this, she tried ending me. Take it how you want. The blood god's come as a hurricane. An act of God. He's referring to the Blood God as an act of God, even though the Blood God's name calls him a god himself, which would seem to negate THE God's involvement in these proceedings. This is very similar to the conversations I have with religious folks in the comments section. They believe their god is responsible for everything, except of course the bad things, even though he himself stated he created evil. But if he created everything, then everything that happens is literally an act of God, including the actions of a lesser god. He supposedly set the events of everything in motion, so yes, everything that happens is because of his actions. Of course, we understand that Deacon is simply using a metaphor that Karen would understand, which is why he called a hurricane an act of God. Which, of course, some religious people don't believe their God is responsible for either, the cherry-picking bastards. Blade is stupid enough to let his guard down after the dead mother's trick, so as to be easily tased here. F***ing dead mother's, man. The guy that has his dead mother's driver's license after a couple decades after her apparent death would absolutely be stunned by the sudden appearance of his dead mother. Come the hell off it. Also, tasers work on the undead. Who knew? Blade is not undead. Besides, the body literally runs on electricity, so overloading the nervous system with an electrical stimulus can still cause the body to react, even a dead one. This is why when you pour soy sauce on an octopus, the tentacles move due to the sodium in the sauce being an electrolyte. You have to bite me and turn me in order to save the world cliche I ripped off from every vampire movie ever. I can't think of any movie before this where the vampire is trying to save the world and needed to bite someone to do it. You're doing what you did with Blade Runner, sending the inventor of the trope by claiming others did it first. Didn't you just bite and turn her? She's not a f***ing daywalker, right? Or does anyone you bite turn into- you know what? F*** it. I officially don't care. F*** you and the undead horse you rode in on, movie. Even if Blade turned Karen, we are shown that becoming a vampire clearly takes some time. Karen was bitten earlier in the film and she cured herself days after it happened. Sure, Whistler injects her with garlic, but even then the implication was that she at least had until daybreak. This scene is happening maybe an hour after he bites her. Why the f*** is he in Moscow right now hunting vampires? Did he run out of vampires in the US to hunt? I guess we won't know until Blade 2. So you know that Blade is in Europe right now searching for Whistler, but you just pretend to not have information you obviously do? And even if you were trying to speak from the perspective of a person watching this film for the first time, why wouldn't Blade be here killing vampires after we saw the UN of vampires get wiped out? Wouldn't the implication be that he's going after the head of the snake again? God damn, you watch movies like I watch porn. Damn the story, I'm here for the ass. King T'Challa's heart rate has fallen to 31 beats per minute. Hmm, I guess it was always going to be tough to figure out how to open this film, but I'm not sure experiencing the death of T'Challa was the best choice. It's not that I disagree, it's that I don't know your reasoning. Why isn't it the best choice? I have my reasons why I'd have preferred this not to be the case, but unlike you, I'm not sinning the movie. What I'm saying is, there should be a justification here and not just this thing bad. I know T'Challa is still alive, conspiracy theorist, but that coffin sure seems super light. Yeah, I know these women warriors are very strong, but that coffin is empty. Jeremy answers himself cliche with the dash of pointing out obvious things ex machina. You know I hate logos, but I got chills from this very respectful and moving tribute to Chadwick Boseman and the work that he put into this character. It is truly a sin that he was taken from us so soon. I agree, but are we only removing sins for logos that feature people who died? I mean, think about what you're saying here for a second. This evolution of the Flipbook logo has featured many actors who have done great work, but they're not worthy unless they pass away? This kind of sets a dangerous precedent, wouldn't you say? 
Okay, now I'm just confused from a storytelling perspective why we needed the opening funeral scene. We all knew the character of T'Challa would be deceased in this sequel, so I'm not sure why they showed us his sister finding out and then his funeral if they were only going to then jump one year forward in time. Why not just start there? The silent Chadwick-themed Marvel logo was a beautiful tribute. Would have made a much better opening. Why did you film the funeral? Because they have to immediately address the elephant in the room that was Chadwick's passing, and because they respected the man, they gave him a movie funeral that allowed fans to partake. It's kind of blatantly obvious. And now give the floor to Her Majesty Queen Ramonda. But literally only two other people have spoken. There has been all of 55 seconds of opening discourse. And? This film shows that only the United States and France has an issue with Wakanda's reluctance to share vibranium, or at least the only two that were willing to speak on it. If they're not featured in the story, do you really need to hear from Spain or the UK on this? Oi, those blackies there, yeah? They don't share the magic metal so that we can have fancy plates for our seams on Ghost. These light daggers only seem to electrocute this guy instead of going right through him like they did the gun earlier. But you show clear evidence they did penetrate the guy. Our foremothers gave us its fear because it is precise, elegant, and deadly. Oh, they're doing the thing where they have a conversation while fighting, so we know it's easy. What's the problem? Should they have done this action scene silently? Would that have been better for you? Like, who gives a shit? Proof of the involvement of a member state is being uploaded to your mobile devices as we speak. These assholes at the UN all have a hard-on for vibranium weapons, but are not concerned about whatever Queen Ramonda just used to upload files to all of their government's secured mobile devices. You mean the technology they derived from vibranium, the thing you said they were interested in? I thought you retired! I thought I had too! They said that machine had a one in a billion chance of finding vibranium! I'm beginning to feel like, whether it needs it or not, every sentence in this movie is going to be followed up with one about vibranium. Well, considering vibranium is Wakanda's claim to fame, and the fact this film's plot revolves around an entirely independent society also having the material, yeah, they should totally talk about steel. It's highly suspect that this person's blood pressure is exactly 120 over 80. What? Why? Almost every single reading I've gotten has been exactly 120 over 80. That's a normal reading for most non-obese Americans. This is a crazy nitpick. This drill bit looks like a giant penis, and no one looked at the props guy and said, Really? Jeremy points out Boner. Also, if your dick is shaped like that, I feel sorry for the women that have to deal with this. I mean, you're not touching any walls with that thing. Great. Splendid. Here's another movie that wants to give us mass suicide visuals for the clout, I guess. I don't f***ing know. It's like they watched Matrix Resurrections and said, let's do that. You know, you could have had these water people hypnotize everyone on the boat into falling asleep. Instead, you chose their Pied Piper melody to be a suicide song. Why? F***ing why? This is so unnecessary. You don't know what clout means either, but that's a whole nother conversation. But this is the classic depiction of a siren, a water-dwelling entity that lures men to their deaths with a song. You're sending it because because the Matrix 4 had something similar? Okay, you're basically sitting Jabaro, and we got major problems if that's the case, home skillet. Also, I'm not sure I care how noble the water people are or how true a gripe they really have. They just killed a ton of people unnecessarily, so they just lost my vote. From their perspective, these people are invading their home and taking a valuable resource. I don't care who you are. You invade my home and steal my shit, you're probably waking up dead. How in the hell do you wake up dead? Because you're alive when you go to sleep. Wait, just tell me you can So you're telling me. me that you can go to bed dead and wake up alive? You can't go to bed dead, man. That shit would be redundant. Just tell me No, it wouldn't. Because you can go to bed and not be dead, and you can die but not be in a bed. But you are in a bed, man. That's how you wake up dead in the first place, fool. Damn! That's some quantum shit right there, man. What are you talking about? You should be teaching classes. You stay dropping out. It's Wakandans. It has to be. Suspecting the Wakandans before the French. <laughs> the French can't fight. Ben Ash! What the f*** are we doing here with the font and the color changes for the subtitles? French was in white, Wakandan is in yellow, and now Avatarian is in blue, and the font is super gothic for no reason. So he points out they're using different colors for different languages and still doesn't get it? I think that one day artificial intelligence is going to kill us all. Agreed. And that day is probably next Tuesday. Jeremy sends something he likes cliché. My AI isn't like the movies, mother. Marvel tries to act like Avengers Age of Ultron didn't happen. You mean the movie that presented a viable AI system whose sacrifice helped save the universe? The Black Panther is a relic, mother. I wasn't trying to save the mantle with the herb. I was trying to save my brother. But still, an herb that gives you super strength is pretty useful. You think she doesn't know that? 
You're quite literally showing on screen her working alternative to the herb, which grants the user superhuman strength, speed, and durability. Uh, I'm gonna need some renowned physics minds to weigh in here on the ability of shoe fish to generate enough lift to make the entire man fly, and I'm guessing they're going to give me a big old nope about this horse. Oh, come the hell on. Are we seriously doing this? Since when do we question the physics as presented in comic book movies? Besides the fact that Namor doesn't actually use his wings to fly, you gonna hold Superman to that same standard? He doesn't even have foot wings, he can fly just because. Spider-Man has on boots but can still stick to walls. Hell, Captain America was injected with performance-enhancing drugs that turned him into a superhuman. Uh, that last one's realistic, though. <clears throat> We all know taking roids doesn't give you abilities like these. Take Chun-Ri Kim, a Korean bodybuilder. She's massive and clearly juiced to the gills, but on a Korean reality show, she got absolutely demolished in a feat of strength and athletic ability. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think she's going to be flipping a motorcycle anytime soon. All I'm saying is none of this shit is realistic, so it's incredibly disingenuous to start treating the physics of comic book movies as sins now. That ship sailed decades ago. I have more soldiers than this land has flakes of grass. Numbers and graphs, or it didn't happen. Namor can manipulate sea life, which means he quite literally has all the animals in the ocean. I think we ought to take his word here. Namor's people sneakily placed this machine here and it's all the bullshit. See, I knew I chose my adversary well. This sin is for pronouncing Namor as Namor. So I thought I'd go ahead and put that to bed. When Bill Everett created the character way back in 1939, he came up with the name Namor by writing the word Roman backwards. That should be your first clue as to the pronunciation of his name, considering you don't pronounce Roman as Romaine. So since we're being pedantic, I've taken the liberty of recording myself saying Roman and Namor a few times, and I've reversed the track. Take a listen. Roman. Namor. Roman. Namor. Namor. Roman. Namor. Roman. So I think I've definitively debunked this talking point, no matter what your cartoon says. Call me Namor. Director said give him a red carrot because crudite is the new apple. Moving the goalposts. I am still struggling to believe that vibranium exists outside of Wakanda. It can definitely be difficult to reconcile what had previously been gospel with what is now reality. But we all go through it eventually, in one form or another. Eh, not if you're an Islam apostate. We don't call that difficulty, we call that getting killed. I do have an idea. Hmm. I'm going to need the princess. This big idea is to meet up with Everett Ross on his jog, and it is in no way clear why Cherie was needed to accomplish this. Why is it so difficult for this man to pronounce names? They say Cherie's name a million times in this movie. Who the hell is Cherie? It's not the Americans that I'm worried about. This tracks. America is too busy tearing itself apart to be much of a bother to anyone else on Earth, except all the countries where we have military bases, and the countries we are actively bombing, but just not talking about. The Americans are quite ready to do violence, and the Queen of Wakanda should absolutely be concerned about that. As they have explained many times, including the opening scene that you totally watched and sinned, America does not want smoke with Wakanda, at least not militarily. Wakanda is the most technologically advanced society on the planet, and they have an indestructible wonder metal. If Wakanda wanted to erase the United States off the map, it could be done. They took on Thanos' army and are still standing. They are essentially what aliens are to us here in reality. Our most powerful weapon is a nuke. 
What happens when your nuke gets absorbed as an energy source? You didn't think to call? Now why would I have your number? You don't have his number, but you can find his exact location on the planet? If you can do that, you can get his number. Just say you wanted to surprise him. And this ties into what I just talked about. Wakanda's technology and the fact they can infiltrate the U.S. this easily shows how superfluous America's technology is in comparison. They communicate with vibranium beads, bro. Phones are last gen. 30 of their top guys, two of our best officers, friends of mine. If you thought the Wakandans killed two of your friends, would you not start the conversation with that instead of the fun banter? I'm going to antagonize two superheroes that helped kill Thanos without my gun. Brilliant! Is it the makeup? No. It's the wrong shade, isn't it? It's the right shade. 2440, you look good. Movie creates time for this instead of allowing the characters to take an existential threat to their nation seriously because Marvel is supposed to be the fun comic book universe. I've never understood this criticism. Since when do movies not have time for levity? Especially Marvel films, which have had comedic moments from the first film in the series. I could understand if the entire film undercuts its tone with moments like these, but it doesn't, so you're like white girls in horror movies, tripping over nothing. Oh sh am I getting recruited? No. But she kind of is. The characters may not know it, but the audience sure does. It's almost like the characters were the ones speaking, though, so the audience's knowledge is the audience's knowledge. You can come to Wakanda, conscious or unconscious. You need to be conscious of the way that you look. Walking around here with that ash on your head. <laughs> Moments like these really confuse the tone of this movie. It goes from being serious to making jokes and then back again in a way that undermines the seriousness of what's going on and makes the jokes feel poorly timed. Except it doesn't. This is the tail end of the first act of the film. Oversimplifying, but the first act is where a conflict is presented. Typically, at that part of a story, you'd want to contain your comedic elements there, especially if a theme of the story is lost, which in this case, it is. This sets the audience up for the big emotional moments, such as the death of the queen in the second act and Shuri's Black Panther reveal at the beginning of the third act. You don't see these types of jokes after the queen dies, and there's a reason for that. The film's tone has shifted. You, like these other idiot Film critics on YouTube probably didn't even realize a film can have a deliberate tone shift, but I assure you, that is a thing. You are also forgetting the cultural aspect of these types of jokes. As a black person, I feel like I can speak for all black people when I say, we joke with each other like this all the time, even in so-called inappropriate moments. It's called bagging or in the young folks parlance, roasting. She called her head ashy. You probably don't even get the context for that, but it's something we say all the time. My point is, this film was made by a black filmmaker with an almost entirely black cast. There are going to be in-jokes like that simply due to that fact alone. But again, I see you're jumping on the Marvel now undercut serious moments with jokes bandwagon. And like all bandwagons, that's for followers that don't actually know what they're talking about. What about the Wakanda fight in Infinity War where there were multiple jokes back to back to back during a fight for the universe. How much for the gun? Not for sale. Okay, how much for the arm? Oh, I'll get that arm. Your haircut? Notice you've copied my beard. Oh, by the way, this is a friend of mine, a tree. I am Groot! I am Steve Rogers. Oh, but that doesn't count and was different because some lame ass excuse, right? Give me a break. I got 2065 byte encryption on that thing. I got a 2065 byte encryption once. Doctor gave me a cream. Jeremy's VD counts as a sin. I had to build a functional quantum computer just to crack my own encryption. And that's all I ever did with it. And you know that based on what exactly? What is it you're building here? Is it static? I said don't touch anything. Cherie's question has nothing to do with touching. While technically she did caress the blueprints slightly, Riri didn't see that, and this question only proves that Cherie saw the blueprints which you have hung up in plain sight on this board. I don't have a problem with this sin. Outside of you saying she didn't see her touching the board, which you couldn't have known since we aren't shown her perspective. But who the hell is Cherie? I get it. It's not a typical Anglo name, but they say her name in the movie because she is the protagonist. How is it even remotely possible to mispronounce the protagonist of a film's name? that is spoken multiple times. It's like that time you called Professor Xavier, Xavier. There's an entire YouTube channel dedicated to Sidon Zumi. There's also a whole YouTube channel dedicated to whatever Don't Hug Me I'm Scared is. So don't get too excited. YouTube elitism. Once we get to the other side of the bridge, we can lose them in Boston traffic. The only thing I've ever lost in Boston traffic is my patience. I don't see how that's going to help anyone in this situation. Jeremy says what the movie is saying and still treats it as a sin ex machina. Oh, he got Iron Man suit. After seeing what the Dora Milaje are capable of, you would think the team of agents tasked with the mission of capturing a group of Wakandans would be more prepared and less surprised by this. Prepare for women with indestructible spears, but don't be surprised by Iron Girl Jr. Got it. 
After everything we've done for whale conservation, those dickheads are on the Avatarian side. That can't be a real question. He says whale conservation and doesn't get the irony. Now, I know a few of y'all don't get it either, so let me spell it out for some of you slower folks. Who are the whales being protected from? Stew on that until you understand why his question was stupid. Oh, you're making a humpback show jump now, too? How are you any better than SeaWorld, Namor? Stop using sea creatures for your own porpoises. Calling a very obvious orca a humpback, even if I liked the porpoise joke. Cherie was unconscious from the crash, but a splash of water wakes her up. Cold water stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system, which can wake up an unconscious person. Smelling salts have a similar physiological action. Here's a bit of product placement weirdness. He gets out of a Toyota, but the other two government-issued black SUVs are a Chevy and a Hyundai. It's almost like that's evidence it's not product placement. You will be stripped of your rank as general of Wakanda's armies. This seems overly harsh. The enemy attacked in greater numbers and without any notice. She at most should be busted down to colonel. Overly harsh? Her mission resulted in a hostile enemy kidnapping the widowed queen's only surviving child. I'll say that again. Shuri is Ramonda's only surviving family member. Okoye is lucky to still have her ashy ass head. Someone's gonna have to fix that. Clay, they're gonna have to fix the clay. Creo. Did Shuri have her earrings with her? I lost track of them in the North Atlantic, but the people who took her spoke Yucatec Mayan. I realize this is an AI, but she asked about earrings and got an answer about languages. You apparently don't realize this is an AI. You know what the I stands for? Intelligence. And as you remove the scene from its context, you're treating your audience as if they don't have any. Grio was the interface that allowed Ramonda to speak to Ross, and the conversation was about Shuri being kidnapped. Since it's an AI, obviously it understood the language was pertinent information. Otro que lo han buscado con mal en su corazón. No, I'm that ill in their hearts clause is kind of everything though, right? She's going to seek them out with a pure heart and therefore might return. You say this as if she's trying to convince Nakia to not go. She simply warned her that going there with ill intentions does not usually end well. How? How is never as important as why? Then why do you start your flashback position showing us how instead of immediately telling us why? I think you've got your definitions confused. He is telling us why. He is who he is because of what happened to his mother and her people. That's the why. Hell, the how isn't really explained. Some magic shit turned my people into sea creatures is not an explanation. The blank gave me wings on my ankles and ears that point into the clouds. I was a mutant. Your people all changed after drinking the blue juice, so they are all mutants. Sure, you're different, but you're not special. That difference is what makes him special. He's the only one that doesn't need water to breathe on land, has winged ankles, can fly, and is far stronger than any of them. And let me take this time to explain something for the lay people. Namor is a mutant. His people are mutates. There is a difference. Mutants possess the X gene, a genetic marker that was placed in humanity by the Celestials. They are born, not bred. Human mutates are people and their descendants that were changed by some force, such as a potion or an irradiated spider. Yes, Spider-Man is a human mutate. This will probably be explained in the MCU once the X-Men are introduced, but it's pretty cool that they introduced Namor first, an homage to him being the very first Marvel character. The problem with all underwater human societies is that human biology is clearly not adapted to living in the water, so it will never make sense that they all have normal arms and legs as we do, and it makes even less sense that they would be as prepared to fight on land as they are. As these are human mutates, their bodies have adapted to being underwater, but being that they were changed after evolving into modern humans, they still mostly have traits of normal human beings. This is why Spider-Man still has two arms and legs and not eight appendages, and why he doesn't produce silk outside of that stupid Raimi invention. They've only been underwater for a couple hundred years. That's not long enough for visible evolution to take place, especially if they were already well adapted through the mutagen itself. For centuries, the surface nation have conquered and enslaved people like us. Really? You live underwater in a protective bubble. Other than general pollution, how are the surface people conquering you when they don't even know about you? Did you just fall asleep while he was talking about his mother? He quite literally explained that the Spanish came and conquered the Mayan people, an event he lived through, and he is speaking to an African woman. Do you not understand how both these ethnic groups were colonized and enslaved by Europeans? You just did the you were never a slave thing, which is a fallacious argument that misses the point by a mile. The point is, never again. There isn't a nation that would have plundered Wakanda if given a chance.
sorry, this is a nice line, but it's demonstrably untrue. Many nations are so used to having nothing that the thought of stealing from a wavering nation wouldn't even be an option. And at least a few nations still have morals. In what reality are you living in, CinemaSins? Because it sure as f ain't this one. The only nations that wouldn't plunder a resource-rich African nation are... are... Damn, I'm having a hard time thinking of something other than they're too far. Even the Chinese are trying to exploit Africa, and that's real-life Africa with boring shit like gold and diamonds. We're talking about Wakanda, a place that has a metal that literally advanced their technology into the sci-fi age. This man says nations have morals. That's comedy. Then when the threat of this nation have been eliminated, the scientists will be returned to Wakanda. Anyone trusting or rooting for Namor at this point is a pure psychopath. He's evil, he uses evil means, and he kills innocent people, and he's bloodthirsty. I don't think anyone is explicitly rooting for the film's antagonist, but sometimes violence needs to be met with violence. If I'm more powerful than you, and I sense you have bad intentions, I'm taking you out. Namor isn't evil, he's morally gray. If he were evil, he would be a tyrant to his people, but he's not. This is exactly who Namor is in the comics, an anti-hero who's often at odds with other heroes. What type of offensive action? Why is Vice President Elaine even here? Who and what and why is she? And so help me God, if you point me to a Marvel TV show, I will kick you in the digital crotch really f***ing hard. Okay, how about a movie? Black Widow's In Credits, a movie you saw in Sin that contained a scene with this character. Maybe you'd like a shot at the man responsible for your sister's death. I can't wait to find out how Yelena goes after Hawkeye, a man that I'm sure her sister never talked about, and she will somehow easily be convinced as a bad guy, and then will... So why are you pretending to not know a character you definitely saw? And again with this, I shouldn't have to watch outside media to blah blah blah, which is a sorry evolution of the books don't matter nonsense. That doesn't work here because the MCU is interconnected and has been for the past 15 years. If you don't want to watch the shows, that's on you, but you cannot then treat not knowing who the characters are as sins of a film. You can't willingly miss pieces of relevant media, then complain about not knowing anything. And that's on top of you lying about not knowing her and this film explaining who she is. Are you telling me that after the events of Infinity War, the Wakandans didn't think that making a more formidable energy barrier that you can't swim under was at the top of the to-do list? You say that as if Thanos' army used this river to attack this landlocked country. Doing that would cut off the water supply and the fishing routes that the Jabari use for food being pescatarians. I guess they can just control water. It might have been cool to talk about that or show us how that works. Really anything to make this random flooding seem less random. So the earlier part of the film where they showed they had water bombs didn't count? And think about what you're asking for. You're saying the film should stop its story and explain, hey, we can control water to some degree, here's how, instead of simply showing you they can do this. Do you know how movies work? Oh look, more suicide imagery. I hope they do this every battle. But it's not suicide if someone forces you to do it, therefore this is homicide imagery. And what's your problem with this anyway? I understand that you advocate for suicide awareness on your Twitter and whatnot, but since when do movies have to protect someone's sensibilities? Since when do movies not challenge one's thinking and perspectives? This society has gotten to the point where we can't even depict villains without some deranged lunatic on Twitter complaining about the tactics a villain uses. It's like, it's a villain, you idiot. Do you want them to kindly ask the protagonist to fuck off? Fiction does not have to conform to your politics, your morals, or your common sense. I'd argue fiction should challenge what we consider to be righteous, because how do you know you're right if you've never engaged what is wrong? Understanding thy enemy is how you defeat thy enemy. The fish man. You're under attack by an underwater army using water bombs, and you're surprised their leader is the fish man? As per usual, CinemaSins is manipulating a scene. Man-Ape isn't showing surprise that this attack is being conducted by Namor. He's responding to seeing him and having an opportunity to immediately engage him. Not saying it's impossible, but it is really f***ing confusing how the queen got Riri up and out of the water but still managed to drown. If you understand that it's not impossible, how is it still confusing you? She saved someone and in the process drowned herself. This has happened to plenty of lifeguards in reality. This movie is a dick to Cherie's emotions. And you're a dick to Cherie's name. I'm hungry. And... She says this, then turns on the TV, and Anderson Cooper is back to say the very piece of news she wanted Bilbo to learn. You quite literally show evidence that she had the TV paused. Here is a scene where Cherie is going to figure out how to synthetically recreate a magic powers bequeathing flower faster than Tony Stark invented time travel in Endgame. Literally untrue. Stark was able to figure out time travel in an afternoon. There's no way you think synthesizing a plant they already have knowledge of is more complex than figuring out how to navigate time due to a conversation. Come the hell off it. You have such a rebellious spirit. Why did you join the Dora? 
Why do you care? Anika is great and deserved to be a bigger part of this movie. Jeremy sends something he likes, cliche? At best, this was a wash. So Grio, the AI, will now 3D print a synthetic heart flower that will give abilities to whoever eats it. And that's a lot to ask of 3D printable materials. Let's think about this for a second. We are currently able to 3D print proteins and cellulose. This is a plant, which is mostly cellulose. Raw vibranium gives off a certain type of radiation that imbues the plant with its abilities, and that is what gives the Black Panther power. The radiation. You know, like the Hulk. Was my mother's life not worth eternal war? Of course it was. Hold the f***ing phone here, folks. I humbly submit that no single life is worth eternal war. God f***ing damn. It's very easy to sit in a cushy recording studio and say something like that. Her entire family is gone, and the last member was taken by a dude that wasn't even mad at them specifically. I'm sorry, but from her perspective, that makes sense. It's also almost certainly hyperbole, meant as an homage to the Black Panther and Namor beef that has been eternal in the comics. What matters? It's what I want, and what I want is Namor dead. In this movie, both Queen Ramonda and Shuri put their personal feelings ahead of what is good for their people. It's confusing, and I don't know why M'Baku doesn't challenge her for the mantle of Black Panther right now. That's the complexity of the character. She didn't become the Black Panther out of some noble goal of protecting her people. She did it for revenge. It's hilarious how you sit here video after video and complain about these movies not doing something different, but when we get a hero that is doing it for all the wrong reasons, you clutch your pearls. And he can't challenge her for the mantle. That's not what the challenge is for. You challenge for the throne. God damn, we had an entire movie explaining this. If you go to war for vengeance, it will not feel the hole left from her loss. But if she goes to war to preemptively avoid a larger war, like as a strategic decision, then it's okay and the whole insider will be filled? No, you went on a whole ass irrelevant rant that had nothing to do with what Nakia said. Her point is that this campaign will not bring her mother back, whether she fights for vengeance or for noble reasons. I do not like this Ironheart suit design one bit. Okay, so? All these women warriors jump off the boat with a single tether tied to their lower backs, and the Wakandan chiropractic industry is about to have a moment. I'm just going to take this time to point out the dude that points out suicide awareness, a real medical and social issue, is still promoting chiropractic, a scientifically disproven form of quackery. Oh, Wakanda forever! Did Cherie know those engines were still functional, or was this a lucky guess? That ship exploded into a million pieces. There was no reason to believe this would work. What Jeremy isn't showing you is that Cherie tapped a device on her wrist that controlled the engine. Now, I'm just a dude playing a dude that's sending another dude, but my common sense tells me that the very advanced technology in her suit would let her know if the ship was still functional. The Black Panther sends her regards. But she will not be joining us today. I, Mbaku, leader of the Jabari tribe, son of Wakanda, wish to challenge for the throne. Well, this is just a fun way to raise several questions about the succession of the mantle and the throne, but not answer a single one of them. Again, the throne and the Black Panther are two separate entities. This has been a thing since Civil War, where T'Challa's father was the king, but T'Challa himself was the panther. Did you think that old-ass man was running around as the Black Panther? I'm sorry, were there zero logos before this movie? Did we just head straight into the story without the need to marvel us to completion before getting started? That's amazing! I'm taking a sin off, but if you try some sort of cold open bullshit that forces the marveling into the middle of an already running narrative, just be ready for the consequences. Quite a few Marvel films over the years have opened this way. What makes this one so special that you had to remove a sin that you admit you're going to put back anyway? This is just a waste of our time, dude. Burying a body in the desert like this will last an hour max, and then someone will find it, and then the police get involved, and then your own brother is like, yeah, he seems like- Skip! Our life is lost, but our faith in you never wavered, and now we await the promise of the eternal reward. Look, I'm just gonna get this out of the way here. Bale is maybe the best thing about this entire movie. Of course, the way the movie completely wastes and belittles the performance later is also maybe the worst thing about this movie. So the potential sin-off could just go f off while the ding orchestra gleefully plays. Why not just give credit where it is due and remove the sin here? If you have an issue later, elaborate and then give the film a sin. This nebulous bullshit only works on people whose preconceived notions were to hate on this movie in the first place. Those of us using our brains would like for you to explain your issues clearly. Clearly. It's like, we all know Adolf was an inhuman monster, but he was German, not Italian. You can't just say wrong things about someone because you dislike them. In other words, Jeremy sends something he likes cliche. We just vanquished the holder of a necro sword. 
before he could harm any other gods with that cursed blade. Giving away the one way to kill you to a humble servant you're about to royally piss off. Not paying attention to the scene you just showed. He just said he vanquished the guy holding that sword, meaning this god is potentially more powerful than a wielder of the necro sword. Besides, it's not like Gore picked it up, it literally went to him. Gore's only thought in this moment was to renounce this god. Go to eternity. Expositional necro sword voices are so expositional that they literally list the steps of necro sorting like their instructions on the side of the mac and cheese box. This is stupidity. The sword brainwashes the user. What the hell else were they supposed to show here? How do you depict voices in your head without them actually speaking? What is the sin here? You were warned, Marvel. You were warned. This man just gave 30 sins for something he knew was coming while pretending he didn't know. Look, man, it's your video, and I'm aware the sin number itself doesn't really matter, something I've also adopted in my videos. But at least have things make sense and keep a sense of continuity and integrity. This, to me, looks like you're playing to the crowd, trying to increase the number of sins for no reason to please the very loud minority that dislikes this film. As film reviewers, it's our job to explain why things work or do not work. It's not our job to placate an audience looking for someone to confirm their biases. If you have a real criticism, state it and leave it up to peer review and public scrutiny. In other words, grow some fucking balls. He loved a wolf woman on a woman wolf. I'm sure Thor and the wolf woman are having a howling good time, but really, what's in it for the woman wolf here? Her needs should be considered as well. As a dude that has dated many women that own dogs, trust me, they always get in the way of the action. But Thor's one true love was an earth woman named Jane Fonda. If you think it's funny when Korg says the wrong name, you'll be laughing for at least five minutes of this movie. Bruv, aren't you the guy that thinks this scene does not contain a lap dance is funny? I really, really, really think you are the last person that should be making value judgments on comedy. Must hurry, okay? People are dying. See you down there. At some point you cross over from comedy to Old Spice commercial, and this movie completely underestimates how little I want to watch a 100 minute Old Spice commercial. Okay, fine, movie completely underestimates how little I want to watch this 100 minute Old Spice commercial. So far, the sins have been about this brand of comedy not working for you. Great, we get it. Give the whole film a sin or a number of sins for failing to make you laugh and move on. Can we talk about the other components of a film, like the narrative, the characters, the cinematography, or the litany of other elements that make a movie a movie? I am good! Ah, uh, you got sap all over it. For a battle that Thor just said he had to hurry to because people were dying, the movie sure does feel like it has time for some Groot and Rocket Picker bullshit. Kinda like every other movie with these characters, huh? <sighs> he flew on Stormbreaker to get down to the battlefield, so why didn't he keep it on him? Where would he have even put it once he got down here? There are people trying to kill you, man, along with your friends. Keep the f acts on you at all times. You cut out minutes of movie time showing that Thor had an entire conversation with the king and him demonstrating that he's not afraid of these weak attackers. Hell, the Guardians themselves seem to have no problem dispatching Buskins. And why does it even matter? Thor can summon his weapon at any time from any distance. Why exactly does he need to keep it on him at all times? Van Damme and the Buskins is the new jumping the shark. You're a Thor movie late, my friend. And bury my sword deep in Asgard. Oh, hang on. Give it a second. I swear, I'm not even moving, it's just doing this on its own. Behold! My stuff. Ooh. Oh, don't forget your umbrella. Oh, yes. S sorry. I have been falling for 30 minutes! I choose to run toward my problems and not away from them. That's what Can't jump the shark if you've already done it. Going directly from Thor's wacky fun time playhouse into stage four cancer treatment, there's tonal whiplash and then there's tonal irreversible spinal detachment. Ah, here's the, my main problem with this movie is the comedy, so when it's being serious, I have to downplay that it does have serious moments by criticizing tone, part of the sins video. Interstellar? Uh, no. That movie explains everything really clearly. <laughs> Wait. Was that a joke? The idea that Interstellar explains anything clearly is clearly a joke, but the fact that this movie doesn't clearly explain if this explanation is clearly a joke is clearly a sin. Dude, they're talking about Einstein Rosen bridges, and they give the exact explanation Interstellar gave for wormholes. So you're clearly ill informed on the subject, saying Interstellar's explanation for wormholes wasn't clear. Gene, it's stage four. I have like, how many stages? Four. 
that we know about. We've got cancer jokes, y'all. What's next for this guy? Trying to make Hitler funny? Jeremy makes a Jojo Rabbit pop culture reference that is just wrong. Hitler in that movie was funny. Smell like a king because you're worthy. Old Spice. I legitimately had no clue earlier when I made that Old Spice crap that this movie actually was an Old Spice commercial. And let me stop you right there. You are lying. Besides the fact that you definitely saw this movie in theaters, you quite literally made a quip about you having knowledge of what happens with gore throughout the rest of the movie. And now we await the promise of the Atomic Robots. Look, I'm just gonna get this out of the way here. Bale is maybe the best thing about this entire movie. Of course, the way the movie completely wastes and belittles the performance later is also maybe the worst thing about this movie. So the potential sit-off could just go f off while the ding orchestra gleefully plays. Why not just give credit where it is due and remove the sin here? If you have an issue later, elaborate and then give the film a sin. We know the script writing process isn't the first time you watch big budget movies, so why even fib like this, boss? Casually naming your ice cream shop after the thing that stole five years from half the population. I mean, if you're gonna make light of half the population's trauma, at least make sure it's a pun. Like a t-shirt place called Infinities, or a pot shop called Infinity Stone. How do you not realize cones rhymes with stones? And by the way, those same singularities are what saved everyone, so I really don't see the issue. Sure, the Matt Damon and Luke Hemsworth cameos in Ragnarok were kind of fun, but when you bring them back in the next movie, they're no longer cameos and have just become part of this universe, and are a lot less special and no longer funny, which seems to be a pretty major theme running throughout this movie. I'll grant you the last part of this sin. I'd much rather not waste time in this video arguing whether or not something was funny, because frankly I only care if I found something funny. What I do take issue with is saying a cameo means they're not a part of a universe. That is like, objectively wrong. Also, I have questions about this acting troupe, since Jane mentioned both Event Horizon and Interstellar. Uh, we know Sam Neill and Matt Damon actually exist in this world. So are these identical lookalikes, or are these A-list actors slumming at a new Asgard? Let's be frank. If gods and godlike beings actually existed in this world, they would be the celebrities, and the people we consider celebrities would be on a second tier to them. That is to say, calling this slumming it up is to suggest gods are beneath men, and I'm pretty sure that's not how godhood works. I am hell! Goddess of death! Alright, I've had enough. Now you're just getting too much Austin Powers gold member in my Thor love and thunder. This is one of the issues I have with the recent wave of criticism the MCU has garnered. Hypocrisy. While I do think some of it is warranted, things like this get on my nerves. This shit was okay when it was in Ragnarok, but it's not okay here? Look, man, movies are a business. If you show them you're interested, and you do that through sales, not ranting on Twitter or three-hour YouTube videos, they're going to give you more of that thing. We all told them we liked Ragnarok, so they put more Ragnarok in our Ragnarok, dog. I've been saying for years that these comic book movies should just put what's on the page on the screen, but I get shouted down by casuals that think comic book movies shouldn't follow the books. So reap what you sow, mainstream. Although, to be fair, the mainstream does like this movie, so f*** me, am I right? Jane has been standing there the whole time, so why wasn't Mjolnir reacting to her until after the crowd left? And how does Jane even get the hammer out of the case without alerting all of the f security guards standing around here? Movie chooses to just skip over that explanation, and I want to know! Okay, I'll answer all your questions. The first is that Mjolnir is reacting to Jane willing the hammer to her. As we have seen many times, the will of the worthy is what makes the hammer fly to you. The second is that if someone is able to wield Mjolnir, how exactly do you propose they stop them? She's Lady Thor at that point. What the hell could they even do? Also, little known fact, in the original language, Mjolnir actually means convenient plot device to be used anytime a story needs an easy turn. You can squeeze a lot into two syllables in Old Norse. Convenient plot device? Dude, the weapon failed to heal her and actually accelerated her death, which was the opposite of what she thought it'd do. How the hell was this convenient? Look at all of these gods murdered. Yes, Thor, we got it from the blatant distress call that was basically like, The God Butcher is killing so many gods, he's called the God Butcher because of all the God Butchering. Did we mention he goes by the name, the God Butcher? And we all know if this didn't happen, you'd be all like, He's called the God Butcher, but I don't see too many gods being butchered. Stop complaining about shit you would sin if it didn't happen. Who or what is that? And more importantly, why didn't we get to see the amazing fight it must have taken for Discount Nux to take him down? Because this film is adapting the gore storyline from the comics, and in that storyline, we didn't see Falagar being killed either, only the aftermath. In that respect, the film is extremely comic accurate, down to the panel. I've had this book for a while. This is a, 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 pa a repackaging of the entire gore, the God Butcher. 
like all the it, it's like the, the whole run this run was from 2012 or 2013 it, it was either 2011 12 or 13 so it's just about 10 years old this run first of all the name of the movie love and thunder comes from this book but it's it's slightly changed from these books it was blood and thunder and they changed it to love and thunder for the mcu mcu changes a lot of stuff right love and thunder is i i think a decent film when it comes to the the idea of adapting source material because they adapt this this story quite well actually they adapt it quite well I know it's like over the top, you know, with the, the comedy. And I get that. I, I think that was one of my complaints when I reviewed the film. Um, but a lot of people hated the goats. The goats are mentioned in this book. <laughs> Thor talks about uh, his his uh, his ship being pulled by magical goats. That's in this book. Um, going to Omnipotent City. That's in Love and Thunder too. You know, the, the, the council where all the, the pantheons of... of every world convene that's in this book again this is 10 years old then you have this and i want you to pay attention to this look at this recognize that this was put into the movie perfectly it was it's you could overlay this on the shot in the film and it perfectly lines up and when i say perfectly i mean perfectly the amount of teeth that this god has exactly perfect the spikes in the exact place these fucking rocks are in the same place i will give you a chance to look at it here and when you have a chance go to disney plus and pull up love and thunder and see if i'm bullshitting i'm not um the only difference is that it's Thor standing here by himself in the book and in um, Love and Thunder, it's Thor and Korg. They even have similar dialogue. I knew this God, Falagar, the behemoth, a patron God of the galactic frontier, champion of the tournament of immortals for five centuries straight. They say he wrestled black holes just for fun. I last saw him barely a hundred years ago. We passed one another in the spaceways and waved. So basically what they're trying to get across is that he looks ridiculous, but he's a very nice God. And Thor has that dialogue in Love and Thunder. This is why it's so important, I think, to read the books. Not to say, oh, you need the books to understand the film. Not to say that uh, the film, you know, uh, you, you need to read a book so that the film makes sense or anything like that. I'm not saying that, uh, like, I, I feel like the MCU stands on its own. Like you don't need, you know, the, the materials but i think it's important to have a foundation and to see the shit that they put in dc don't do this you know dc has some things that are like kind of like the books kind of sort if you squint side you know and turn your head sideways but i feel like the mcu does this better because they put this shit that's in here there and then they adapt it and then they tell a different story you know they have different elements and i think it's super important to have that foundation so that you don't miss those things those little nods like people always ask me hey birdman what do you think about cinema wins now i don't really watch cinema wins okay what i do know is that that's the type of shit he would win that's that right there hey look they did a thing that was in the books something the fans have been asking for win i i appreciate that as a person who's a fan of the books when I see shit like that on the screen, I'm like, that's awesome, dude. The God Butcher is coming. He seeks the extinction of the gods. But left me here alive for reasons. It's entirely possible that Gore assumed he killed her when he used the cursed sword to lop off a major appendage. She was clearly unconscious until Thor got here, so like Falagar, her body not immediately disintegrating probably lured Gore into a false belief that he'd won. Who'd you piss off now? Engaging in witty repartee while people are dying all around you. Also known in the industry as MCUing. Let me draw an analogy here. For Thor and Valkyrie, these shadow creatures are little more than fodder. Yeah, they know they gotta clean them up, but they pose no real threat to 
them. So think of this in terms of a video game. How many of us play action adventure games and talk and laugh with our friends on Discord while doing so? That's essentially what the scene is trying to convey. These creatures aren't a threat to them and they can quip while mopping them up. On the flip side, how often do you see these characters quip with each other when fighting real threats such as Thanos, Ultron, the Accuser, or Kang? Those are like the times you're playing Dark Souls and have to deal with a boss. Shit just got real and you need to concentrate. Have you seen my hammer? Instead of continuing to help the citizens of Asgard fight off these creatures, Thor is going up to them and asking if they have seen his hammer. Even for Thor, that seems a little f***ed up. This is a manipulation of a scene and removing it from its context. Thor is currently disoriented by the sudden appearance of his longtime weapon, considering it was destroyed in the last movie, prompting him to create an entirely new one. And Lady Thor is cleaning up the enemies Jeremy is saying Thor isn't helping to kill. He blatantly cut out Mjolnir penetrating multiple enemies. That's right, Jane is Thor now. But how much have we missed of that process and why? Sure, we'd have sent a tropey training montage too, but for Jane to just show up for an applause break moment for a hero we've literally never even seen is beyond baffling. This is the mother load of bullshit. First of all, CinemaSins admits they'd consider it a sin either way, so they're deliberately being dishonest, and they know you don't care because ha ha, this movie sucks anyway. Second, the audience applause break is for fans of the material, and Lady Thor has existed in the comics since 1978, when she was Thordis. And how could the movie have introduced this character in any other fashion? Are you forgetting the moment Rogers picked up the hammer he knew how to summon electricity? But that was cool, so we didn't need a training montage for him, right? And we've literally never even seen any characters until we've seen them. What the heck are you even trying to say with this nonsense? <laughs> Jane? Chris Hemsworth clearly attended the 1980s sitcom school for reactions to big character reveals. Jeremy sins himself, as evidenced by the previous sin. And eventually the space between them grew and grew. If you don't have time to watch Marriage Story, just watch this little interlude of Thor, Love and Thunder, a truly devastating look at how relationships end. Try to watch this and not sob. Some really important character work going on here in this movie that totally understands how to balance its tones. Or you don't understand that movies can have more than one tone in addition to tonal shifts. This simplistic movies can only have one tone rhetoric only works on people with terrible media literacy. I did not hear a no, nor did I. Men. The guy that lamented a cancer joke makes grape jokes, y'all. Come to daddy. Come on. No need. Hey, there you are. <laughs> okay, that was funny. In a movie where the humor is a bit more missed than hit, this jealous Stormbreaker bit is pure gold. Agreed. This is an incredible bit of whiteboard repiping from Meek here. But how exactly did he know about the God Butcher's origin story in this much detail? First of all, Meek is a female. But I think the fact that you noticed that, but don't realize the board is also predicting the future, is sinful as shit. Astrid, are you okay? I no longer go by the name Astrid. I'm now known as Axel. Astrid Axel thinking they have time for this. Sorry, the writers of this movie thinking that they have time for this. Should have stuck with Watsonian there, bud. This criticism does not work on a doylist level. You know, the good news is you're Asgardians. So if you die, you'll end up in Valhalla. Oh my god, go away. I'm just trying to figure out if none of the characters are treating any of this as seriously. How exactly are we supposed to? I can kind of understand that critique on a macro level about Thor, but Axel is clearly taking this seriously. That's why he reacted like that. And on Thor, well, he is a warrior, and Asgardian warriors want to go to Valhalla, which explains his flippant attitude here. How many catchphrases have there been? A lot. The exact conversation I had when my friend tried to get me to watch the WWE somehow makes it into the script. I just have to take a moment and ponder the balls the person that claims this movie's comedy is overcooked has to have to write incredibly not funny jokes as a criticism of said movie. You moved on quick, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Some piece of work. You can play jilted lover all you want, Thor, but you two clearly already had an open relationship. We all saw how happy you were when Mr. Rogers handled that neighborhood. Oh, you saw that, huh? It's a wonder you tried to slam Jane for the same thing. It means you pretty much have to die in battle. It needs to be devastatingly painful, otherwise you don't get into Valhalla. But now there's a pain scale for getting into Valhalla? There is not. That was a joke. Moving on. A hand grenade? No. It's a portable speaker. This movie spent so much time being not funny, it's not even funny. Says CinemaSins. If you don't mind keeping the sink thing under wraps. But why? The story would go like, hey, Jane got irritated and destroyed her sink. And then Thor would be like, that's weird. Are there any Cheetos left? And I mean the puppy ones, not the crunchy ones, because f those. Case in point. Where are the emotion gods? Mm, don't ask. Again, you mean don't ask again. 
Don't tell someone to not ask something they've already asked. It's annoying and requires a time machine, which they likely do not have. I admit it. I am not perfect. That's why I'm still a fan of CinemaSins. But more than that, I'm willing to admit something may have gone over my head. Like this sin. What the heck is Jeremy talking about? She asks this question once. I have no idea why Jeremy is saying, don't ask again. Don't ask is always stated to someone who has already asked something. Why are you taking umbrage with a very common idiom that this movie didn't invent? If your mouth and nose have to be this close to your feet and toes, don't you think you might take better care of them? I mean, you're a god, right? Certainly you can afford a podiatrist. Are you referring to the naturally occurring melanin in this Hedfidian's clause? That's racist. Amazing that those emotion gods you happen to grab cloaks from have the exact size chairs that each of you need. Is convenience an emotion? What's really going to blow your mind is their clothes fit them too. It's almost like they're obviously humanoid size, which is why Valkyrie kicked their ass and took their cloaks. I tell you, one time, now you shut up, you be quiet because you are this close to being uninvited to the orgy. Russell Crowe showed up on set and was like, I'm doing a thing! And then Tiger was like, good news, this is doing a thing the movie! And Russell was like, It's not a Rude Nudy festival. Says the god who just said, Where are we going to hold this year's orgy? As part of today's agenda. Apparently, Jeremy thinks people who participate in orgies don't understand there is a time and place for nudity, which was Zeus's point. Eternity. It's a very powerful being at the center of the universe. This movie alternates between hardcore expositional explanations and frivolous nonsense so much it might as well be my dad. With as silly as you are, you obviously didn't have a dad. You were created in a lab in Wuhan. That's the sound of lightning. Am I supposed to feel something about this? Is this supposed to be some sort of 30 second vengeance quest that I'm supposed to celebrate? Am I supposed to actually believe he killed Zeus permanently? Oh joy, another one of those I knew so and so wasn't really dead that you've been pulling since Winter Soldier. Just like Nick Fury, you did not know Zeus survived that. You are watching a movie where it is proven gods in the MCU can be killed and Thor just put a lightning bolt through his sternum. There is no logic in suggesting you knew he was still alive, especially since there is no supporting evidence of that in this scene. We don't believe you or anyone else that continuously lies about this. You killed Zeus. I mean, that may or may not be catastrophic for the whole universe, and sure, the entire God Kingdom is probably in Hunter's Down. But Will they, though? Because they just sat by after Thor killed Zeus and let Thor and his crew escape from Omnipotent City. So, honestly, they didn't seem that concerned about the whole thing. Which is f***ing odd. Thor put a lightning bolt through Zeus's chest. First of all, just saying that aloud is kind of shocking, and I can't even imagine what it must have been like for the gods that were there. What I'm saying is, they could have been in shock at the events, but after gathering themselves would most likely consider Thor a wanted outcast. Hell, considering Zeus's behavior, some of them might have secretly cheered them on. In any case, we will see the consequences of that the next time we see Thor, as Hercules is on his tail. Space uh, dolphins. What? <clears throat> this, you should see some space dolphins. If they're anything like Earth dolphins, then I'll pass. Why do most people not realize how awful and mean dolphins really are? They bite frequently, are sexually aggressive, they actually enjoy torturing their victims, and they're always testing out new ways to hunt and kill their prey. They are a f***ed up species, and we need to get the word out. Think about all that next time you're watching Flipper. Besmirching the good name of cetaceans. That's worth these many sins. <laughs> song that my dad sang to my other dad when they were courting. This movie has non sequitur itself from a conversation about the life commitments of polyamorous space dolphins to Korg detailing his dad's mating rituals, and I swear this is the movie version of that kid from Jerry Maguire. Cute for a bit, but if I have to hear one more time about the weight of a human head, I'm walking. The real sin of this scene is that Korg was retconned into having two dads as he explicitly mentioned his mother in Ragnarok. It's either that or Korg is an unprovoked liar. You made me worthy. Well, this certainly isn't the place to completely unpack that big ball of unhealthy relational codependency. My worth is only in you bull But yeah, well, it's a big ball of unhealthy relational codependency. My worth is only in you bull Excuse me? Telling someone who is going to die how much they meant to you and your personal growth is bullshit now? That's almost as bad as the time you said promises to dead people don't matter. Movie really went all in on those goats, didn't they? The real sin here is how many times you brought up irrelevant nonsense but left those goats unscathed for nearly 15 minutes. Okay, this entire scene is spectacular. I wish it was in a better movie, sure, but I'm having eyegasms and the sin removal is just automatic at that point. I agree. I mentioned that this would probably be considered some of the best cinematography ever in the MCU, but what I didn't realize is that everything good about this movie would be ignored by some people to push the agenda that Marvel sucks now. Glad you didn't miss it, my old friend. Well, at least Gore's a good MCU villain and left some expositional materials out for us and our heroes. 
It's a trap! Indeed, and no one should be surprised by this. Thor even mentioned this is a real possibility earlier, so why is Jane going full Akbar on this when they should all have been cautiously aware already? The information the scene is trying to get across is that the axe is the important part of the puzzle here, not that they are shocked it's a trap. I'm sure the lack of color already tipped them off there, pal. Let me tell me why you just threw Stormbreaker out the window. It was really more of an open air skylight than a window, so maybe you should be a little clearer on your defenestration declaration. Besides this scene proving what I said in the previous sin, a skylight is by definition a window. Choose love. Call the axe. Rejected body spray slogans. Nothing more exciting than watching an action scene full of actors having to fight off CGI monsters that look like they came off the set of Lavalantula. I mean, if I told you this was a made for sci-fi original and you didn't know who Chris Hemsworth, Christian Bale, Natalie Portman, and Tessa Thompson were, you would totally believe me. What? We just agreed this scene was gorgeous. Also, what the heck is up with the microphone there, buddy? Is Birdman gonna have to donate a mic to a bitch? Stop pretending to kill people, movie! You're like the boy who cried homicide! To be fair, the boy that cried wolf did it more than twice. Also, if the axe can go to Thor whenever he calls it, then why doesn't he just call it back after Gore grabs it? We have an answer to this question. Thor apparently can't summon the axe when someone else is holding it. This was shown in Avengers Endgame when he tried summoning the axe, but Thanos grabbed it out of the air, apparently overriding the summon. If Thor could control it while someone else was holding it, when Thanos was about to kill him with it, he should have been able to make it fly away or to an outstretched hand. That he needed Captain America to save him proves he couldn't. I don't care how common superheroes in their superhero get-ups are in this universe. Scenes with this kind of juxtaposition between an armor-clad Thor trying to have a serious conversation with an everyday citizen like this doctor will always crack me up. Okay, so? What's the point of more time at this? Because I love you. The question, would you prefer a shorter amount of high quality of life or a longer amount of low quality of life, is a really nuanced and fascinating philosophical and emotional discussion. But this movie never even explores it. Instead, Thor just wants the opposite of whatever Jane wants, so the movie can have its precious third act conflict cliche and then get back to the surrealist fight scenes and goat jokes. The movie never explores it? That's the literal conflict of Jane's character arc in this film. Look, man, I know this movie ain't the greatest, but you don't have to lie to prove that point. This is why your four minute videos were seen as better because you didn't have to pad them with bad jokes, scene manipulations, and outright lies. Well, you didn't have to do that for 25 minutes, I mean. Do all gods automatically know how to travel with another god's weapon? Because if that's the case, then all these weapons are the same, and that's pretty fing boring. Way to ruin the fun of mythology, Marvel. Uh, Jeremy? It's lightning. I'm not sure if you've paid attention, but Thor can control and manipulate lightning. It's like an intrinsic part of his abilities. Besides, Mjolnir can't teleport, so you're at least 33% incorrect and 67% is not all. Eternity. Yep, apparently its location is easily enough known and it has a giant obvious insert Bifrost here symbol on its chest. So the fact that no one has captured its one and done power before now is the true eternal question. The answer is clearly Heimdall and Odin have not allowed anyone to reach this location, considering they had control over the Bifrost. I feel like that's obvious, but then again, you're you. Hey, don't forget you're Asgardian kids. I'm not. I'm just a liking kid. I would give all the sins back if we found out this was Thor's kid from his affair with the wolf woman and have Thor come to this realization and then scream, I've abandoned my child! So you spent about 20 minutes crying about the slapstick, but suggest it would be better with more slapstick? Today is a day that will go down in history. A day when a movie asked you to believe that a bunch of untrained kids jacked up on special lightning juice defeated an army of shadow monsters. A day when you had to make the choice, does my disbelief really suspend that far? A day when movies finally said, no brain necessary to proceed, carry on without them. Today will forever be that day. Whosoever holds this hammer, if he be worthy, shall possess the power of Thor. With the examples of Captain America instinctually knowing how to summon lightning, and Jane automatically knowing how to fight upon wielding the hammer, there is no suspension of disbelief required. That is what giving someone Thor's abilities means. Whosoever holds these weapons and believes in getting home, if they be true of heart, is therefore worthy, and shall possess, for a limited time only, the power. It's amazing how Thor has these random powers whenever it's convenient to have them. This is almost as dumb as that giant cape Superman created in Superman 2. I said almost. Ah, uh, swing and a miss. This is clearly a power Odin possessed that was passed on to his biological son. It's called the Odin Force. 
technically now the Thor Force. This is the same spell Odin placed on Mjolnir that gave Steve his powers, and the same one Thor put on the weapon that gave Jane hers. If this is possible, nothing means anything anymore, and why has it never been used before in other dire situations? Well, the answer the film gives is that Thor didn't know he had this ability until now. That was the point of the scene showing Thor and Jane's history where he accidentally blessed the hammer and is the reason she was able to wield it. Thor not understanding how she was able to pick up the hammer is part of the narrative here, where, like in Ragnarok, Thor comes to realize he has certain abilities. So Jane throws the hammer to break the sword, and then calls the pieces of the hammer to envelop the pieces of the sword, and then uses light to mold them all together and then slams it down in a way that destroys both the hammer and the sword. And my question is, how does anyone know how to do any of this? Why does it always work? Did you just forget the scene that you sinned where Valkyrie explained to defeat Gore you have to destroy his sword? That Thor literally told her... Destroy that sword and he's dead. She's been using the pieces of Mjolnir offensively this entire movie, and as Uru is unbreakable, unless you're Hela's hands, <laughs> this is kind of an inevitable outcome, I'd say. Do you understand me, Hercules? Do you understand me, my son? The Greek Zeus would not refer to his son with the Roman name Hercules. He would call him Heracles. And Loki is not Thor's brother. And Mjolnir doesn't have a worthiness enchantment on it. And Zeus never interacts with Odin or even knows of Odin. Seriously, if you're going to use real-life mythology as the basis for Marvels, you should have started this a long time ago. Like in Thor. You are very welcome here to the land of the gods. Seriously, these Valhalla rules are confusing. Thor told Sif you have to die in battle to get to Valhalla. Jane died after the battle and from cancer. She neither died while in battle or even from a battle. She did technically die in battle, as Mjolnir drained her life force while she fought Gore. And if you really want to get pedantic, she lost her battle with cancer. A little someone who turned him from sad god into dad god. This means that Thor will either be an absentee father or this kid will have to be in any movies that he finds himself in in the MCU's future. And this is a preemptive sin for whatever nonsense happens because of that. Well, Love is a superhero now. And considering the shenanigans they pulled with Ant-Man's daughter and the shit they're going to have to pull with T'Challa too. What was I saying again? Oh, sh Sorry. Movies that make COVID an unnecessary part of the plot. Except I wouldn't exactly label it as unnecessary when it was used to characterize the characters in the doc scene by their mask choice was the reason for the painting and because the film is set in 2020. Do you honestly expect any show or movie set in 2020 to ignore the biggest event in human history in decades? Seriously? It's from Miles! Not understanding the dynamics of a live broadcast feed. Would be a great sin if she was live at the time he said that. I'm a hard light on climate change. If that scares you, go stick your head back in the sand. This is not how political candidates courting votes usually speak. This is how political commentators usually speak. Which is exactly why Jake Tapper said. Governor Claire DeBella, whose Senate campaign is picking up steam as she has positioned herself as a very different kind of candidate. Everything is so woke these days, it's out of control. Yes. Love you. Yes. There's no possible way that A, Bertie has a straight visual shot to any corner of this crowded room while sitting on the floor, or B, would have been able to hear him say this with all the COVID pod shenanigans going on all around her. She appears to be pointing at this corner to see and hear this guy. How? That's the same thing I'd like to ask you, considering you said she was pointing at this corner, but when you see the scene of the guy, it does not have a lamp in his corner. She's actually pointing at this corner. So you have deliberately or accidentally misled the audience here. Props crew prop for making this an actual stereogram. But if you're going to design a hidden button, don't you think it should be somewhere a little more off center? Finding the boxes click Taurus should be much more difficult. Imagine not being able to find the literal top of a vagina so often that this is the joke you went with. It's a compass. Ma. <laughs> Jackie Hoffman is the best. So a few is a beautiful musical puzzle based on just one tune. Songs as a musical puzzle? Is this movie stealing from the January Man? Also, thank God Birdie is having a party in the middle of a pandemic so that Yo-Yo Ma can solve the music puzzle for them. Or else, how do they figure this out? So you just removed a sin for Duke's mother solving a puzzle without even seeing it, but you sin Yo-Yo Ma for doing the exact same thing, only it's more realistic because he's actually a musician? Bro, get your priorities straight. Also, this marks Angela Lansbury and Stephen Sondheim's final appearances on film. So here are a couple more sins for these legends no longer being among us. Everything wrong with Glass Onion. Actors died in real life, so the movie is responsible for that. Lockdown hasn't been easy for any of us. 
But Philip told me you haven't left the bath for a week. Baths are gross, even at reasonable amounts of time. You're basically just stewing in your own filth. Add to that, once you're in there for a while, the water gets cold. I'm just saying, I don't care how bored he is. I'm guessing Blanc isn't likely to sit there long enough to be germ soup or freeze his Benoit balls off. I'll never be able to square in my head Jeremy telling the creators of a property how likely or unlikely a character they created would do something. I swear, audience members have gotten too bold. Tight with Miles? No, never met. Did Miles not send a manifest with the boat? Or even to sudden throat spray Ethan Hawk? I know he's an idiot, but with that much money, certainly he pays someone to keep the uninvited off the island. And the movie shows you he clearly doesn't because the box itself is the invitation. Look at the background. This is occurring during COVID and there is no one else on the dock. Only people that know about this party could have shown up here. Besides, Duke's girlfriend and Peg weren't invited either, so clearly the boat's crew takes plus ones into account. It's amazing how mysterious Ethan Hawke doesn't bother to get out of the car and give Andy the weird COVID shot during this entire dramatic entrance. He shows up in the background as the scene ends. And and let me stop you right there, because you are not only answering yourself, you're willfully ignoring evidence that proves you wrong. The question isn't why did he invite her, it's why did she show up? No, why did he invite her is a good question, actually. If they just went through heavy litigation and had a major falling out, what would the purpose be of inviting her? Aside from the there's no movie if it doesn't happen reason. Sure, I guess he could have invited Andy as cover in case her apparent suicide was ruled a murder, but he had almost no time to use the puzzle box for that purpose. Andy sends the threatening email on May 11th. She was murdered the next day, and the puzzle box was delivered to everybody on May 13th. Behold, everyone, a textbook example of a gish gallop. Everything Jeremy said after there's no movie if it doesn't happen happen was to throw you off the fact that his actual point is bull jive. The characters in the movie do not know Andy is dead. This is why Lionel asks why Andy shows up. Jeremy just forgot that he's not a character in this movie, but an audience member that has more knowledge than the characters do. I'll prove it. Why is Jeremy talking about Andy's murder if he's pretending to be speaking from the perspective of someone watching this movie for the first time? We don't yet know she is dead, so he's clearly using knowledge of the film's later events here. So saying, why did he invite her is a good question only makes sense if you know Andy is dead and Lionel does not. Hey, hey, hey bro. Not here. But you are here. And unless Trooper Wagner from Knives Out has a twin brother we don't know about, but Benoit Blanc somehow did, I'm going to need an explanation as to why he doesn't immediately recognize your face. Besides the fact that Benoit is looking at the back of his head, Daryl has long hair and more facial hair than Wagner. And if those chicks that try to equate makeup and facial hair are to be believed, facial hair makes you look like an entirely different person. You remember that night you almost pancaked me with it on the road outside right? Anderson Cooper's birthday. When this conversation is flashed back to later in the movie, Duke clearly says Andy, and yet here the Andy is missing. And this is weird, since we don't know Andy is dead yet and that her twin sister is playing her. I suppose the movie doesn't want you referring back to this later before it reveals Miles as the killer, but it's a pretty massive cheat. Actually, it was two different takes that the editor used for some reason. It seems more like an actual cinema sin than anything nefarious on the part of the filmmakers. You could also rationalize this as, in-universe, Lord the volume of Duke saying the word Andes is a visualization of the characters not realizing the importance of Duke's words in that moment. Also, Duke doesn't even bother to correct Miles over this, even though he doesn't even know Andy is dead yet and has no idea how to benefit from that knowledge. Well, that's exactly it, isn't it? He doesn't know Andy is dead at this time, so perhaps to him it seemed more like an eccentric billionaire being an eccentric billionaire. You know, like how Trump told people it was okay to ingest bleach and no one corrected him in the moment. That was some real red pill stuff, Miles. Using a Matrix pill reference to win any philosophical argument, no matter what side of the argument you're on, cliche. Aren't you the guy that perpetuates the stupidity that is calling a thing within a thing inception? I don't think you are in any position to call this out, mister. It's a dangerous thing to mistake speaking without thought for speaking the truth, don't you think? Preach, baby, preach! When CinemaSins doesn't realize Benoit is speaking to them. During this entire sequence, before the murder mystery dinner, Benoit finds himself in all the perfect places to witness all sorts of important information at just the right time. I don't know how the f*** he does it. It's f***ing insane how much pertinent information he received during his walk around the mansion. Which is why it will blow your mind to realize that Helen was the one who gathered the most information, not Benoit. This is a smokeless garden. Having this kind of a system, but no signs that tell you not to light up in the first place. Jeremy thinks billionaires should or would put up tacky signs that say no smoking on their property. Or, come on. Wait, 
That's impossible. I agree. Look, I love everything about the setup and payoff of what the Mona Lisa means to this movie. But, but I don't care how hard the pandemic hits, no one is renting it out without a man detailed to oversee its protection. They would when it's fake, and since this is on canvas and not wood like the real Mona Lisa, I'd say they got over on a documented idiot. Ruining your headlines alliteration by having one P word start with an F sound. I'm not entirely sure they were trying to be alliterative here. Besides, PH doesn't make an F sound, PH makes a PH sound. Blanc is now going through all the murder Miles motives for everyone on the island except Andy, who he knows is Helen. Seems like that would be the one to lead with, and leaving it out seems like a careless and unblanquian way to draw attention to her. It's almost like you're not paying attention to the movie. Andy is the most obvious candidate for his potential murder. Why would he even need to explain her motive? That's like trying to figure out who stole your hamburger and not immediately fingering the hamburglar. Duke smiling. Yeah, we find out later it's because he just got a Google alert that Andy was dead. So you're telling me that Duke... Duke, of all people, saw that news, and instead of freaking out about who was impersonating a dead woman on the island, he immediately figured out that Miles killed her and came up with the plan to blackmail him for a TV slot? This makes none of the sense on so many levels. I understand that you see a large dude with tattoos and immediately think he's a scary meathead that can't think, but from everything we've seen from Duke, he's always chill. I mean, you pointed out Duke not correcting Miles for changing the meaning of his words in the pool. In all of his scenes, Duke had come across as a laid-back dude whose only interest was getting his subscriber numbers up on YouTube, so much so that he was willing to be a cuck to do so. A red pillar. Willing to cuck. Duke staying quiet to blackmail Miles makes more sense than you're letting on. This is a nice sleight of hand here when Miles gives Duke the glass of alcohol that's going to poison him, but it sure makes me wonder why we couldn't hear Duke say Andy a minute ago if we're gonna cheat the viewer. You're either sinning something you like or double sinning for the same thing. Both are sins. Duke takes exactly 10 seconds to go from taking a drink to full anaphylaxis. And that's just too fast. It can happen within two or three minutes, yes, but 10 seconds is what happens when a movie develops an allergy to inconvenient medical reality. My guess is something was put in his drink intentionally. How is no one here immediately on the pineapple train? The plot needs everyone to think it's poison so that they could be misled that Miles was the target. But this is clearly an allergic reaction, and Duke's aversion to pineapple is public knowledge. And wouldn't you think that's why people wouldn't go straight to pineapple, at least initially? If it's public knowledge their friend has a major allergy, wouldn't you think the friend group would keep the allergen away from him? Heck, the only reason they didn't have time to ponder this was that a lot of events happened right after that prevented anyone from being able to think. Boat can't come to low tide in the morning, 6 a.m. at the earliest. Do they understand the situation? Do you understand the situation? I understand Miles' boat captain doesn't want to make the trip because the dock is a piece of shit, but cell phones work, right? Duke was getting Google alerts. Why can't anyone call the police? Plus, there's a dead guy. Swim the last few feet, slackers. It's not that they can't call the cops. It's that at least one person doesn't want to call the cops. And even if they did, they are on an island that can only be reached by a single dock. That dock isn't buoyant, so there is no way for a boat to reach them. Telling them to swim with a body that needs an autopsy is supremely ignorant. He picked up mine. Sorry guys, but I'm not watching this in a theater. I'm watching it on Netflix. So I decided to rewind to the scene that is being flashback to here. And I noticed that Miles gave him the glass. So case solved. It's not 1933 anymore, bitches. Well, that was a waste of time. Benoit now runs after Andy and they end up running into each other in a place where the killer just so happens to be perfectly set up to shoot her. Okay, and? Hey. Radio the mainland. Tell him to send the boats now. Does Peg have a more persuasive tone of voice than Lyle does? Didn't they tell him they wouldn't go out there because Miles only has a low tide dock? I think you're gonna have to give her more instructions, right? So you understand why they weren't more proactive in attempting to get a boat to the island, but now you're sending Benoit for trying to do what you send him for not doing? Underneath this transition to the second half of the movie is the fugue that Yo-Yo Ma was so kind to come in and mosplain to us earlier, indicating that the movie itself will now play the same tune underneath itself for the second half to reveal hidden layers of musicality and meaning, because apparently I didn't hate Ryan Johnson enough for being a genius yet. Of course, it should be another sin off, but my spite will turn it into a sin because I too have hidden layers. Yes, and one of them is called Jeremy Sin Something He Likes Cliché. Miss Brad, what can I do for you? The question for me is, how did Helen find Benoit's address in a short time, and why did she go straight there instead of making a call first, especially in the teeth of the pandemic? You know exactly why she did that, because you've seen this movie already. In fact, you're going to send that very thing. Google said you were the world's greatest detective. So wait, it didn't give you a bunch of fictional detectives like Batman or Sherlock Holmes? How did you refine your search to get Benoit Blanc so easily? See? I'm a detective, Helen. I'm not a bodyguard. I'm sorry. I can't help you. Blanc rightly realizes he's putting Helen in harm's way and calls off the plan. 
for about 15 seconds until she convinces him to put her life back in jeopardy by showing him her revenge boner. Jeremy says boner. I have been studying this napkin for what exactly Andy and Miles turned into the company called Alpha and why it's such a huge deal, but I guess the movie's answer is they got into crypto and that's all we need to know. It's pretty funny that you missed the meta-analysis of this film, which is a satirical jab at eccentric tech bro billionaires and tech startups. Like Meta, or whatever the hell Elon is doing with Twitter, you're not supposed to know what the hyper-successful tech company is doing. The movie is making fun of them. This is why Miles Braun is portrayed as an idiot that steals and takes credit for ideas that are not his own, and why he makes constant malapropisms. It's an obvious pastiche of Elon Musk and his various companies, especially considering the political leanings of the director. There's no doubt that James Baxter is the best journalist writing about capital E entrepreneurs today. But can we just for a moment recognize that when I frequently hear the word entrepreneurs out in public, I think it's the French word for sexual intercourse. Jeremy dit bonheur. You must be really great at Clue, huh? It's just a terrible, terrible game. Well, my students love it. You play Clue with third graders over Zoom? She's talking about her regular classes before the pandemic, genius. This movie has given you no indication that she started teaching three months ago, which is why the date at the beginning of this movie was important. March 2020 was the start of school closures. Damn, man, I expect you to be stupid about movies, but real life too? You're telling me that... It could literally turn people's homes into the Hindenburg? How the f*** could she not talk to Lionel about this yet? Like, if she cared more about people's lives or her reputation than the money or getting elected, wouldn't she have asked the science guy of the group about the dangers before signing off on it as governor? Your assumption is wrong. She does not care about people more than getting elected. Her reaction is because it would kill her political career. Besides, when the hell would she have had time to discuss this with Lionel? Andy and Miles started talking about Clear within the last two years, and Agatha here was busy being the governor of Connecticut and running a campaign for the Senate. I'm not sure if you understand that this film is poking fun at stereotypes, but there are plenty of examples of political candidates that flippantly sign bills at the behest of their lobbyists. That was the reason for this film showing you how hectic Claire's life was at the beginning. Do you think that woman was corresponding with a scientist over the efficacy of a mystery chemical? You didn't even write back! I never email anything that I wouldn't want to see on the front page of the Times. That's why I called. We all did. Claire says she didn't email back because she's a politician. But what is everyone else's excuse? Did they not email back so that the movie could put everyone at Andy's house on the day of her murder? They answered your question. They tried calling her multiple times. Because she never answered, they went to her house because the letter could implicate all of them and ruin their careers. If someone whose phone number you have sent you an email that could harm you, why would you not attempt to get an immediate response by calling them? What is this, 2002? He almost got in an accident on his motorcycle he was driving so fast. Andy, I almost got pancaked. Since both of these characters don't have any idea that Miles killed Andy and that Helen is playing Andy right now, why is Duke still not mentioning that the person who nearly pancaked him was Miles? Yes, Miles interrupted him earlier to say Anderson Cooper's birthday, so maybe he feels the need to keep his mouth shut? But keep his mouth shut about what? That Miles was at her house for a murder he doesn't even know happened? This entire scene is of these characters saying everyone went to Andy's house on the same day. Because Duke never finds out that Miles killed Andy, the implicit assumption is that she understands Miles went there too because, wait for it, everyone did. From his perspective, it makes no sense to explicitly say Miles almost hit him in that moment, especially because he already said it. Also, he's obviously told this story before to Claire, and he was about to ask Miles if he remembered him nearly pancaking him outside of Andy's house before with no hesitation. So doesn't Claire know that Miles was there too? Or was Duke being careful about mentioning it when he told her? Same thing with the last sin. Why would Miles being there mean anything to Claire at this point in the film? She doesn't know Andy is dead. Andy is standing right in front of her, so of what significance is Miles doing something they all did? You might as well tell Claire Lionel was there. It's like, she knows. The YouTube channel's dying. He needs the exposure. Look, I barely believe Duke heard this sh through the window, but I really don't believe Benoit or Helen heard it from their vantage points. At least have the window open, for God's sake. You'll note that I have never disrespected you for being partially deaf. But I have a hard time accepting that a person who is, themselves, hard of hearing, suggesting others can't hear something. I mean, from your perspective, I could understand why you'd think they'd be unable to hear, but as a person with perfect hearing, they are very obviously speaking loud enough for their neighbors to hear. And they're on an island. He deserved what he got, and you are better off without him. Boy, a good thing for the movie that Helen, fresh off her argument with Duke, had the presence of mind to say, He's a son of a b whiskey. Leave his ass. So that there could be a misunderstanding during this scene when Helen has no idea that Duke is dead. It's the catalyst for Miles running out of the room and getting everyone separated so that Helen Andy's attempted murder can happen.
Welcome to Bird News. I'm Bird D-Man. Our top story, a movie in a murder mystery has things that throws off the audience and the characters in the movie. In other news, gorillas really, really, really like fruit. Why exactly would you keep the red envelope or the napkin for any reason? I know you don't expect anyone to rummage around your room in a house on a private island looking for this thing, so it makes sense why he thought it would never be found, but sh man, he could burn this thing and it wouldn't hurt you one bit. And that's exactly what you do in front of everybody later. No, 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 hell no. You are literally repeating what the movie says. Benoit explains that Miles is dumb, and in that same scene, Lionel says this. And after all that, you... You still kept the envelope. Uh, you didn't burn it or anything? So you are not only agreeing with the film, you're trying to use its own critique against a character against the film itself. Why would he still be carrying the phone around? All right, he's an idiot. But how? And let me stop you right there because you are answering yourself. It's so dumb, it's brilliant. No! It's just dumb! Writing a line so hilarious, sneaky, meaningful, and brilliant that it will become a meme misused to defend all sorts of dumb sh thus becoming an ironic Ouroboros eating its tail in a never-ending circle of brilliant stupidity. Aren't you the guy that perpetuates the stupidity that is calling a thing within a thing inception? I don't think you are in any position to call this out, mister. But this is the real world, and in the real world, you need more than a neat little detective story. You need evidence, and you've got nothing. Nothing? What about the fact that Duke told everyone your car was seen speeding away from the crime scene? Or that you were caught red-handed with Duke's phone? Or that everyone just saw you burn that napkin? I'm not saying it's a slam dunk case, but there's certainly enough here for a jury to make it interesting. And this is why you would never be a prosecutor, because that is textbook hearsay. His word against theirs, and that is exactly how Andy lost her case in the first place. You likely don't even make it to court without some form of physical evidence in the first place. So how would a jury hear a case that doesn't even make it out of mediation? He's right. The contents of that envelope and his possession of it were our only physical evidence. Yeah, but you guys f***ed that up, right? By merely taking the envelope out of the office and showing it to everybody in the big reveal, that ship had already sailed. Because all I have to do now is say, envelope? What envelope? You mean the one Andy's twin sister produced and nobody saw where it came from? I'm kind of surprised Benoit didn't tell Helen about the chain of evidence here. I'm kind of surprised you even know what that is, considering you just argued they'd have a case based on testimony alone. The fact that any fire safety systems wait until the script says it's time to kick in is some bullshit. Fire safety systems can't even read. Fire safety systems sends himself. Also, burning the Mona Lisa just because some asshole owns it. Borrowed it. And again, considering the real Mona Lisa is wood and not on canvas, as it is being depicted here, it's highly likely the French tricked Miles because he's stupid. The French are very tricky. You know, because they can't fight. Do you really need a wall-sized TV screen when you're sitting three inches from it? You don't need anything like this. You want it. Why are the coffins in the future made out of cardboard? I think the better question is why you're assuming they are cardboard. I guess it kind of looks like cardboard, but until told otherwise, you don't have any proof that is the case. Yes, a planet full of trees has no oxygen. I don't know if you're aware, but Pandora is an extraterrestrial body. That is to say, the trees on this moon went through an entirely different evolutionary process and only share a superficial resemblance to the trees we are familiar with. It's possible these trees produce carbon dioxide or nothing at all. Besides, it's not like there isn't any oxygen, it's that the other gases prove fatal. Like how if you leave your car running in a garage, clearly there's oxygen in the house, but the CO2 will kill you. Gripped. I mean, once you've obtained some of it, shouldn't you change its name to can obtain, but still really f***ing rare? It doesn't have the same ring to it. Unobtainium is a real word that has been used since at least the 1950s. It just means something rare. Besides, if something is so rare to only exist on one moon in the enormity of the universe, I feel like unobtainium is a fair, if not kooky, label. So in order to take control of his avatar, Jake has to jack into the Matrix. I'm getting the strangest urge to say that Jeremy is referencing a form of pop culture without telling us why that's a sin. Think I felt like a shave tail, Louie? No, I think you felt like a toothbrush antenna Gary. And what the hell is that? Visionary science fiction director rips off the mechanical robot suits from aliens. You... you mean the suits he created? I'm just gonna go take a walk in my robot suit for no reason. It's obvious he's going to train in the suit, dude. You'd have to be the second most oblivious dude on the internet. Jim Sterling's the first. A dozen cows and some juveniles. Actually just looks like really bad CG. Oof, swing and a miss. Avatar CG is exceptional, even four years later here in 2013. It's like, have you seen Marvel CGI? They have Thanos looking like a California raisin. 
always go wandering off into the jungle on strange f***ing far off planets. It's almost like that's their job as researchers and scientists. Marine regresses to a four-year-old popping bubbles. What Jeremy's leaving out here is that this Marine wasn't trained for this situation and is a fish out of water on a wondrous moon light years away from his home. He's also going to f a 10-foot alien that bears a striking resemblance to Zoe Saldana, so yeah, I'd be like a child in a candy store too. Tommy Lee Jones will never catch the no-legged man. Another pop culture nonsense. Next. Jellyfish omens. Pointing things out on the screen. Also, those are seeds. If the Nami can spot the Sky People even while in their avatars, then what's the point of having a f***ing avatar? The reason they can tell is due to the Sky People wearing clothing and having five fingers. Obviously, having five digits on the hand and suddenly missing one could potentially cause the driver to disassociate from the avatar. Phantom pain and all that. But the point of the avatar is to build a connection with the natives by looking like them and relating to them physically. It's like if you were in Japan, you probably should speak Japanese to the locals. Sure, it might be broken Japanese, but they will appreciate the attempt. And for that matter, isn't that strategy sort of like missionaries approaching native African tribes while wearing blackface? It's absolutely not the same. Blackface is painting your face with paint or some other coloring in an attempt at mocking black people. Blackface has a history of being used in minstrel shows where the actors were trying to make black people look inept, dangerous, and stupid. The Avatar program is meant as a way to connect with people of this moon, not to denigrate them. Stupid sin is stupid. Since they're on another planet altogether, are they still called Native American? Why am I suddenly thinking of Justin Timberlake? Jake Sully. Why does she pronounce his name as Sully when she just heard him say it was Sully and she hasn't ever seen it in print? And that's very interesting, coming from the guy that always mispronounces someone's name even after hearing it. I wouldn't be surprised if, in the future, there's a movie about Africans and you just refuse to pronounce one of their names correctly. There's a skull making an O face on her forehead. That's... racist? This movie has a terrible naked people to actual nudity ratio. The Navi are a different species. There's no difference in saying that you'd like to look at the nips and badge of a gorilla. National Geographic exists, you freak. Is the Avatar safe? How can they have a person linked to an Avatar in the year 2154 but have no f***ing clue how to track where the Avatar went? That's a fair question, but I don't think that's what Grace was asking. She's simply asking if the body is still functioning. Oh look, she's painting with all the colors of the wind. I know you do this for comedy's sake, but I wonder what your definition of comedy actually is. Um, this is not a sin, but I do feel the need to go to confession. Waterfalling is sexual to this man. Is there nothing you won't put your digital penis into? That's how you get a computer virus. It's not flirting if there's no possibility of death. Jeremy has never dated a warrior before. I mean, I haven't either, but I assume trying to kill you is part of how they f To death! <laughs> By Snoo Snoo! Yeah! yeah! <laughs> what are you, gay? These creatures have video game weak spots. Not true. They're not glowing orange. Visionary science fiction director rips off Turok the Dinosaur Hunter. See what I mean? This man just said Turok. It's Turok. Rhymes with cock. Er, spaniel. Ponytail f***ing. Oh no, that's just the foreplay. There's a reason they're wearing loincloths is what I'm saying. Typical James Cameron. Preaches peace with one hand while masturbating to all the explosions and violence with the other. The more astute of us recognize that in order to campaign against something, you have to show the horrors of it. Otherwise, people won't care and continue living their lives blissfully unaware. You know, CinemaSense fans. I didn't sign up for this shit. You fly a military helicopter and you didn't sign up for this shit. This shit is in reference to slaughtering non-belligerent natives and destroying their homes for no reason. It's called having a conscience, something you haven't had since starting this series. Ah, I see they went to the Prometheus school of running away from large, toppling objects. Ah, but that sin only makes sense if they were directly in its path and ultimately end up being crushed by said object. They weren't, so it doesn't. Where are the cameras for them to be able to see all this? Didn't the ships all go back to base? Perhaps these things were taking place at the same time when the cameras were still there, and that, as a movie, we can't be shown two things at once? Have you thought about that? I love how this guy's not the least bit suspicious that the helicopter pilot is now delivering room service. Jeremy acts as if everyone knows everyone in the military. Isn't that precisely why they all wear insignias on their dress? Max, stay here. I need someone on the inside I can trust. Okay, but how will we communicate? And when? You really gotta give me more detail than this. We? Me? Are you talking to the characters in the movie again? So the equipment can tell you if one of the ship's engines starts up, but it doesn't give you a way to disable it remotely? I don't think the equipment signaled the copter's startup. It was more like the cameras caught them. So she died anyway. Awesome. Glad we watched that 20-minute healing scene. 
Do you honestly believe that the protagonist should never fail at anything in a story? How boring would that be? And I got a strong feeling she's not totally dead. She's probably with Awa, and they still have her avatar so she could potentially come back in a sequel. Might even have a daughter that looks freakishly like her who has no problem swimming and an unexplained connection to the creatures on the planet, maybe even some plesiosaurs. You know how these things go. You tell the other clans to come. Wait, other clans? How do you think this moon houses only one kind of Navi? I know we think moons are small, but compared to us, they are still enormous. It would make less sense if there were only one tribe. That wouldn't be anywhere near enough to sustain their numbers, and natural selection would have taken them out centuries ago. You were able to tame the beast, so we instantly forgive your betrayal. Yeah, that's kind of how religious societies go. Isn't that what Christians believe? That in order to get to heaven, you have to ride on the back of an aerodactyl, drink the blood of the first virgin to be born during Ramadan, and scream, Yeah! Visionary science fiction director rips off the Battle of Endor. You and I remember the Battle of Endor very differently. When and why did she paint a ridiculous blue stripe on her helicopter and face? I can't answer the when, but the why is to clearly delineate her from the other ships that will be in the battle so that the Navi don't put an arrow through her chest. You know all humans look alike. This guy's flying backwards before the bow even hits him. Is it possible that he was trying to dodge an incoming attack? Space rhinos conveniently missed the tree Nateria's hiding behind. Misrepresenting the movie, Awa called these animals to her defense, and as we are shown earlier in the film, these animals can see where they are going. In other words, they're not trying to hit Natiri. You can officially fall from any height on Pandora and still live. Misrepresenting the movie again. There was a training montage earlier that showed Natiri training Jake how to use the giant leaves to slow a fall from a great height. Shouldn't the emergency breathing masks be, you know, easier to obtain? But they are. For able-bodied people. I guess you forgot that Jake is paralyzed and relies on a wheelchair to get around. We almost brought someone back from the dead a few minutes ago, but f it, let's just stab this guy. But that was through the usage of an avatar. This is a real Navi. He's going through Awa's butthole and there's nothing he can do about it. When I was lying there in the VA hospital. Narration. Sending the thing you do yourself. You even list yourself as the narrator on IMDb. Sooner or later, though, you always have to wake up. Blue shadowing. Mm, I don't think so. Jake is saying you have to wake up from a dream, and as he is referring to flying, the context being on a banshee, that will be his reality, thereby nullifying the potential foreshadowing. And since your genome is identical to his, you could step into his shoes. Hey, generic government guys, do you want to maybe save the recruitment speech for when his brother isn't being cremated in front of him? You know, just as a courtesy. Jeremy yells at the screen cliche. Flying, flying, still flying, landing, landing, still landing, still, still landing. Excitement? I want to say this will be the only FFS, FLL, SLSS, LE sin that we have in this movie, but it isn't. And from the perspective of the audience watching this video, that shit was sinful. Yeah, they fully mature on the flight out. But who braids their hair around their jiggling bonding bits? Mother Nature. Who's got my goddamn cigarette? Who needs character development when you can just rely on an addiction, am I right? Who needs film analysis when you can just rely on incessant nitpicks and an audible ding sound to make it seem like you've made an actual point? She wrote the book. I mean, literally wrote the book. Bragging about authors. Everyone knows that books lead to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. Jeremy describes everyone that's read The Ables. I know who you are and I don't need you. I need your brother. You know, the PhD who trained for three years for this mission? They seem to have made Dr. Grace super mean in the scene, and considering that she's pretty friendly for the rest of the movie, it seems to almost be for purely expositional purposes. Except her exposition is like a sandpaper exfoliant. She's upset because suits are interfering with her science. You know, the thing that's been happening to scientists since forever and why we can't get climate change, obesity, or social harmony under control? She becomes friendlier because Jake takes to the Avatar program really well and helps further her research. Get it? Negative stimulus equals unhappy. Positive stimulus equals happy. He has no business sticking his nose in my department. We all came here for the blue aliens on the magical planet. Many of us came prepared with edibles already on board. Why are we pretending like the departments haven't talked about plans already? Or at the very least, aren't familiar with who is in charge of various decisions that allow humans onto the planet in the first place. Get me to the planet before the political tension kills my fucking buzz. A movie still has to get its events into motion, home skillet. This is a story after all. I mean, the first chapter of Harry Potter is almost entirely about the fucking Dursleys. Avatar is about the juxtaposition of the natives of a moon home to an incredible resource and the people looking to exploit that resource. I'd say this conversation is entirely what the movie is about. 
You know, I used to think it was benign neglect, but now I see that you're intentionally screwing me. My college girlfriend's Yelp review of our last intimate connection somehow makes its way into the script. When you think about what Jeremy just said and listen again to Sigourney's words, you'll realize that that shit didn't make any sense. I need a researcher, not some jarhead dropout. He's not a fucking dropout. He was severely wounded in the line of duty. I can understand these assholes being assholes to him because that's their shtick. They're assholes. But aren't we supposed to be rooting for Grace at some point? It doesn't matter what made him drop out. He's still technically a dropout. And again, mature adults realize that Grace has a legitimate grievance because of the interference with her work, especially since it was clear that she hadn't been consulted. People can be upset, Jeremy. You don't have to agree with her, but let's not act like her feelings aren't justified. You're supposed to be winning the hearts and the minds of the natives. Isn't that the whole point of your little puppet show? If you look like them and you talk like them, then they'll start trusting us. I guess by the 2150s, they just stop teaching about American history or colonialism. Let's not pretend Americans even care. There are literally people arguing against critical race theory because they think it teaches racism instead of American history. And China is currently exploiting Africa right now. That is real colonialism that nobody seems to care about. The truth is, if there is a resource that is valuable, the powerful are going to exploit anyone or anything to get it. This movie is simply reflecting a reality. This is why we're here. Unobtainium. Yes, unobtainium. Because can't f***ing get it right. Useful for reasons eight. And plotisium are just too on the nose. As past future old Birdman told you, unobtainium is a real word and has been used in science and science fiction for more than 70 years. The only reason you people have a problem with it is because this movie was your first exposure to that word. Personally, I enjoy that Cameron used this term for the film's MacGuffin. It's an on-the-nose jab at people like you that care so much about the minute details of things that don't matter. In other words, James Cameron would be excellent at the Birdman. This little gray rock sells for 20 million a kilo. And yet I leave it floating on my desk just in case I need it for expositional purposes or a fucking paperweight. Or as a reminder of why he's there doing the morally gray things that he's doing. Kiss the darkest part of my lily white. Having seen many a white lily in my day, if I were to kiss the darkest petally part, it would be sort of a deep yellow color. So now for the remainder of the movie, we can all envision Jake's asshole being a deep sunshine hue and be disgusted by his nasty diet. Jeremy, assholes are brown or pink. Jake! Jake! Listen to me, on. you're not used to your avatar body. This is dangerous. Jake has logged zero hours of avatar training, and yet no one was prepared for a totally understandable out-of-body freakout. Everyone was just like, sure, let's unleash this 10-foot carbon fiber beast being controlled by a brain it wasn't even initially built for. What's the worst that can happen? I mean, this guy was a Marine. You would think discipline and ability to follow orders would be something that was instilled in him a long time ago, something I'm sure those involved assumed as well. <laughs> Who forgot to lock the fucking door to the super most important room with super expensive alien things? The door was clearly locked, Jeremy. That's why you saw him press the striped handle that unlocks the door. Or are you under the assumption scientists lock doors from the inside? Think fast. Why would he assume any of this is edible? Putting anything in your mouth on an alien planet is a dumb idea. I agree. But the scientist that's been on this moon for some time pulled what looks like an obvious fruit from a plant and offered it to him. I also find this sin questionable, considering you originally assumed these trees produce breathable oxygen. You're trying to eat your cake and have it too. That's kind of freaky. It is the f***ing nighttime, and still nothing has been explained to him about the Navi, like, at all. In the scene before Jake entered his Avatar world, he explicitly states he read a manual when questioned by Grace on how much link time he's logged. That implies he isn't exactly going in blind and has some understanding of what he was getting into. But there's a difference between reading and hearing about something and actually experiencing it. Someone approved setting up some weightlifting gear in this fucking weapons locker all so that we'd be certain of Colonel Rogue Warfare's ass swollery. He literally explains that being on this small moon makes you weaker. This is a real concept about space, as when you don't experience the gravity of Earth or an Earth-sized body in space, the human body gets weaker. This is why astronauts on the ISS have to regularly exercise, and even then, they still experience muscular atrophy. I want you to gain their trust. I need to know how to force their cooperation or hammer them hard if they won't. Can you do that for me, sir? Hell yeah, sir. Yep, that wasn't just a yes, sir. That was a hell yes, sir. We're supposed to be rooting for a protagonist that is all in helping screw the Navi until, of course, he actually screws one of them and decides to do the right thing by screwing the original screwers. Jeremy just described a character arc, people. Nothing to see here. 
I realize I'm not supposed to understand the science behind linking a human to a Navi body, but I'm already confused about how Jake's consciousness stays linked at great distances. And maybe I'm just pissed off because I am yet to successfully connect a Bluetooth device to anything, but I'm still sitting the hand waviness of this tech. But it's science fiction. There will always be a point where you must suspend your disbelief, no matter how well something is explained. You just described a technology that, today, is capable of wirelessly connecting things over a distance. This film is set in the latter half of the 22nd century. I'm positive in 130 years we will have wireless technology that makes Bluetooth look like a rotary phone. Got it down, we're gonna stay a while. That wasn't clear before now? Are none of the mission parameters decided ahead of time? Their mission is clearly one of exploration. Grace decided they'd spend time in this location. Why would that be something that needed to be decided beforehand? If you're in an uncharted territory, how could you even decide something like that? Norm, you've yeah. contaminated the sample with your salon. Does the movie really benefit from making Norm, who is supposed to be a trained scientist, a total dumbass? I would think the competition to join the Avatar program would be pretty fierce. So is the very slight chuckle from the audience really worth making him look dumber than he should be? Apparently, the comedy channel that needs comedy explained to them. Grace is making a joke about Norm's enthusiasm. She nor the movie are trying to make Norm look dumb. As far as you, however, she definitely succeeded. It's a territorial threat display. Do not run or he'll charge. So we've established pretty clearly that no one on the science side of things has briefed Jake. But now we see that the military hasn't bothered either. Colonel Pandora will piss in your eye hole knows he's on protection duty. So shouldn't he have at least covered how to deal with the Pandorasaurs that are most likely to kill you? I mean, technically he did. He told him basically everything would try to kill him. And as far as specifics, I'm pretty sure Corridge has a shoot first policy, meaning he wouldn't know what Grace knows and how to peacefully deal with these animals. Run, don't run, what? Run, definitely run! Or shoot, maybe shoot, definitely shoot. And that would be terrible advice, considering that animal is incredibly nimble and this is a stressful situation. Any hunter will tell you that shooting at charging game is a bad idea, because if you miss, you're going to have a bad day. Getting the hell out of dodge is the better option in this situation, and using the weapon should be the last resort. We're not allowed to run night ops, Colonel's orders. I'm sorry, Doc, he's just gonna have to hang on till morning. People chip their goddamn luggage, so the army would certainly track the Avatar bodies that cost millions of dollars. But apparently, all investors, scientists, military strategists, and janitors have yet to figure out a Find My Foe feature. Let's ignore for the moment that this is bleeding-edge technology that they are implementing for the very first time. They haven't run enough ops to ever lose an Avatar, so why would that even be something they needed to think of? It's a biological being that is remotely controlled at base. That's their solution. Jake is literally at the base, and he can tell them where the body is. And because Jake is apparently the messiah once spoken, we're supposed to be totally fine with all the jungle critters being murdered for it was foretold as such. Look, man, I love animals as much as the next guy, but if you put me in a situation where it's the boar or me, I'm choosing me every time. Besides, Natiri did a little prayer for them, so we thank them for their sacrifice on Easter, or whatever the Book of Revelation said. Acting like an ungrateful moron when a sacred tree seeds all over you. That was Harvey Weinstein's legal defense. We have tried to teach all the sky people. It is hard to fill a cup which is already full. A full cup suggests that humans already know everything and humans do not need another ego boost right now. Use a better metaphor, like it's hard to fill a lidded cup or teaching a rock to be water is as fruitless as a dead tree. Better idea, just use plain words. You are an ass and move on. No, it does not suggest they know everything. The metaphor means they think there is nothing else to learn. What you are saying is that this cup contains all liquid there is in the world and that's not how cups work. Get it? What's hilarious is you're demonstrating her metaphor right now. Their damn village happens to be resting on the richest unobtainium deposit within 200 clicks in any direction. I'm assuming that the planet is larger than 200 clicks in any direction, so why the f*** don't they go somewhere else to find the unobtainium? Forget the moral issues, isn't the trade-off of not having to commit a ton of time and resources to relocate an entire village worth going after a yield that's farther away? Considering the dollar amount of this stuff, it's literally not worth more. Let's use a California redwood tree for reference. An average redwood weighs about 635,000 kilograms. As we can see, the deposit is roughly equivalent to the tree's size, so that would be around 600,000 thousand kilos of unobtainium. As we were told earlier, unobtainium is $20 million a kilo, so they're staring down $12 trillion. That's six apples. Even if it cost them $100 billion to relocate the natives, that would pale in comparison to the amount they'd make from mining this single spot. Find me a carrot that'll get them to move. Otherwise, it's gonna have to be all stick, okay? You got three months. 
But we're wasting time. Jake has just listened to a speech about how profits are valued more than the killing of indigenous people, and he is still on board with this plan? I think you need to look up the definitions of the words marine, war, and capitalism. This man really thinks people won't displace or kill hordes of people in the pursuit of monetary gain. It's like, you're an American. Notice how the word native is not in front of that descriptor? So where are we going? Getting out of Dodge. And let me tell you the exact location of our mobile link-up site so that you may continue to f*** our scientific mission when we know you are a mole for the muscle upstairs. I mean, you said that like they have a f***ing choice. I don't see a triplet here, so the twin is the best they got. Look at my instruments. Yep, we're in the flux vortex. Okay, the movie gets some credit for not using the word quantum, but the flux vortex is gibberish. It definitely pushes this movie several conveniences past its accepted MacGuffin quotient. That is actually not gibberish. You're just a scientific illiterate, so you didn't understand. Interestingly, the word you would have been angrier at is exactly what flux vortex means. One thing this movie absolutely nails is creating the world of Pandora, and the floating mountains are a great example of that. Here's a set-off for the movie and for Disney World. But also, how do they work? Yes, I know, something, something, superconductors, but I shouldn't have to read an entire reference book just because I want to understand how the anti-grav mountains work. But that's just it. You don't have to understand how they work. The film does not hinge on you knowing the physics of these floating mountains. There's a difference between exposition and spectacle. If you do want to know how they work, then those reference books are there for you. But what I find interesting here is in the previous sin, you claimed flux vortex is gibberish, but here you mentioned superconductors, which is what causes the vortex. But I had what she needed, a way back in with the clan. Grace is a dick. She knows that Jake is being used by the Colonel and Selfridge to undermine the Navi, but allows him to continue because she's also using him to get to the Navi to continue her research. Meaning that she's okay with them being exploited one way or the other as long as she gets her data, and yet again this is someone we're supposed to be rooting for by the end of the movie. You're presenting this information to us as if using Jake for a greater good is a bad thing. I'd argue that we are all using someone in some capacity. What you are using them for is what matters. Perhaps I'm not in a place to criticize evolution on an alien planet, but how does spinning around and drawing maximum attention to yourself serve as a f***ing defense mechanism? Instead of just getting eaten, this poor bastard gets dizzy and then gets eaten. Well, if we are using Earth evolution as a basis, and it's clear you are, there are plenty of animals that use a dazzling display to get away from predators. You have to understand that the vast majority of animals are dumb. When you accept this fact, you then realize that something as shocking as this causes confusion and allows the creature to escape. Besides, like creationists, you seem to be under the impression that evolution is finished. No. Every creature is constantly undergoing evolution, and if this creature's adaptation proves insufficient to survive its environment in the future, it will die out. Bank left! So does all the Banshee's will and self-determination just evaporate upon being enslaved for life by the Navi? Or just when it's required to be cinematic and you are currently being presented the rules of this science fantasy universe. All creatures on this moon have connections that can intertwine with other creatures. The Navi, being one of the most advanced, have exploited this connection and Vulcan mind-melded with various creatures on this planet. You are witnessing what we have done to wolves for centuries, just in a fantasy setting. Also, I once rode this ride at Disney and I was with a very tall friend who- Skip! Are they, are they saying that the Banshee has bone in its eye? You mean like current birds here on Earth? This is what I'm talking about. When faced with something they've never seen before, scientific illiterates always default to, this can't be real. This is why we have so many flat earthers and conspiracy theorists in the US. Lack of science education. You would never see this many idiots in Japan. Navia. I love how much care and attention went into the creation of the Navi and Pandora. Cameron even hired someone to create their f***ing language. My frustration is that this is balanced against the shallowest, wafer-thin caricatures of humanity, which are represented by greedy capitalism, a single-minded military, and a white savior. If this movie gave Pandora a Cimmerillion, it left humanity with a paint-by-numbers book that doesn't use numbers above two. I'm at a loss as to how that fits in with what you're trying to say here. Earlier, you were upset that Jake was going along with the plan, despite knowing they'd be harming sentient beings. Now you're calling Jake's characterization a caricature for... Doing what you've been arguing he should have done. Seriously, a movie can never win with you, and frankly, this is the type of mindset that harms film discourse and devalues the art over time. Ugh! Okay, take a sin off, you stunningly beautiful bastard of a movie. You are a Motikaya now. I'm sorry, but I'm gonna have to sin Natiri and the uh, Omitikaya here for straight naivete. They've had years and years of bad experiences with humans, and yet they're still happy to introduce a marine to the most sacred and sensitive parts of their society. I know Awa gave Natiri that sign with the magic dandelions and sh And let me stop you right there, because you are answering yourself. 
I suppose this is as good a time as any to send the convenience of every strand of hair or leaf that covers the nipple, serving to indicate that the Navi are just as nippless as we are. That's not even the real sin. The real sin is that they have nipples in the first place. The structure of the breast is called a mammary gland, which is the namesake of mammals. Given that this moon has had an entirely separate evolutionary history than Earth, it makes no sense for non-mammals to have mammary glands. This is the one issue I personally have with many science fiction stories, because they depict aliens as humanoid apes. Real aliens would look nothing like anything here on Earth, and we already have some banger creatures on this planet. I mean, look at this shit. So we're at the end of the three months, which is when Jake was told the bulldozers were going to arrive, and yet he hasn't even begun the relocation negotiations with the Umbidikaya. What did he think was going to happen? That as soon as he was inducted, he'd be able to say, hey, my people are coming to steal the rocks under your tree to fuel their spaceship, so you better get moving. We cool? He was falling in love with a girl and her people. Typically, when people are conflicted, they have issues making decisions. It's called analysis paralysis. Those trees were sacred to the Omotakaya. Yep, super sacred. So sacred that after years of research, you would think it would have been documented and available for review in a dossier. Not that they would have looked at it, but at the very least, this conversation wouldn't be a scientist trying to explain something important after the fact, which Dr. Grace is clearly doing in this scene. I just don't understand how an operation this big with all the investors trying to avoid a war, if possible, would only just now be talking about how to avoid a war. Dude, they know. They simply do not care. What part of this being a reference to Native Americans do you not understand? The Savages Are on a Land the Pillagers Want is a story as old as Britain. Since a deal can't be made, I guess things get real simple. The amount of leaps to war this movie makes is about as vast as the network Dr. Grace is attempting to describe to the people with guns. Fine, whatever. We need our third act conflict to drive us toward the movie's big set piece climax. But, but, actually there's no but. We don't have to end every movie this way. I agree, but we are talking about the general audience here. If a science fiction story doesn't end with shooty shooty bang bang, they call it boring or worse. Don't turn up for it. I'll never forgive them for letting Blade Runner 2049 hang out to dry. That movie is one of the few sequels that lives up to the original. It was just orders, and then it, everything changed. I fell in love with the, with the forest and with the, and with the Kaya people. I'm glad that Jake eventually does the right thing, but what if Pandora was a miserable desert and everyone looked like f***ing Jawas? Would he still be saving them? The point is, it doesn't matter. It shouldn't come down to, well, they're quite nice and I like their trees when it comes to relocating an entire society so you can dig up their land. I just want to know how far down this rabbit hole you're willing to go. I mean, we've already established you have a problem with the Navi being displaced, but does this goodwill extend to non-humanoid creatures too? Do you eat chicken? Beef? What about ants? Do ants deserve this same generosity? Why or why not? I mean, they form incredibly complex social structures and can be said to be nearly as advanced as we are at building a society. Probably more advanced, considering they actually work together for the greater good, even to the detriment of their own well-being. But I'm sure you spray raid on them the moment they invade your home, right? Just saying, existing as a human in modern society, you've already displaced many societies. You only care about this one because they look like humans. Get away! Get away from here! Don't worry, Jake, you've got an entire third act to resolve this conflict, and I'm sure all will be forgiven despite your complicit consent to all these heinous crimes, because... Boner? You know what these sins are for. I was a warrior who dreamed he could bring peace. No, you f***ing were not, you goddamn dirty ape! That's literally the character of Jake in this movie. You know, the one you called a wafer-thin caricature that you apparently can't even understand. I guess their attempt at murdering everyone on board the ship ends with gunfire from the ground to the sky. Because somehow, no one on the base is interested enough to follow the defectors with any of the plethora of pursuit vehicles currently available and within eyesight. I mean, they could try that, but by the time anyone got into one of these air vehicles, Trudy would have been long gone. I'm assuming that's why she planned this during eating or sleeping hours, when the relevant people would be preoccupied. The people can help you. I know it. They cannot. Are uh, you sure about that? because I'm almost certain they have a way with water. I think it's safe to assume the Avatar body continues to breathe and pump blood while they mindlessly sleep. So why isn't Jake waking by sputtering out all the ash he's been inhaling? I don't think it's safe to assume that at all. In fact, I'd say you only assume that so you can come up with a sin to pad the runtime of this video. Sometimes your whole life boils down to one insane move. Well, yeah, you live in a f***ing movie, it does. So do you live in a movie, Jeremy? Because I'm sure the creation of CinemaSins was your insane move, and it turned out great. You became a millionaire and an overnight sensation. And if we follow the film analogy to its conclusion, my appearance is the second act conflict. I wonder what happens in the third act. Something we gotta do. You're not gonna like it. No sh Banshee's bond for life, and you're about to replace the only living thing that showed up for you with a newer model? 
No, he's just about to bond with another temporarily. Only the Banshee bonds for life, not the Navi. It's closed on their end, open on the Navi's end. You know, like a Muslim and their 167 virgins are fresh and fit. The way I had it figured, Taruk is the baddest cat in the sky. Nothing attacks him, so why would he ever look up? So what we're saying is that only five people in the history of the Navi have figured out that flying slightly higher was the perfect tactic to catch one of these bad boys? No, what we are saying is this is the technique Jake utilized to capture a Toruk. Your ability to infer things that were never said would win you bronze in the Special Olympics. I was afraid, Jake. I mean, this kind of sounds like she's apologizing to him and she has no f***ing reason to be apologizing to the dude that infiltrated her people, seduced her, and gave her enemies the knowledge to destroy her home just because he's turned up with a tangerine-colored pterodactyl falcon. Okay, I'm totally not justifying this sin just so I can use this incredibly beautiful shot of Natiri's face, but we've already been shown how the Navi react to events on their world. Natiri explicitly changed her opinion on Jake the moment the seeds landed on him, so we already know she's open to changing her mind. And that Jake has become Toruk Makto signifies that he is one of them, and the protector of these people, which is what she told us her legend states. What I'm saying is, this CGI is f***ing amazing, y'all. I will fly with you. But has anything really changed here? I can maybe buy that Natiri is willing to forgive her boyfriend, but why is capturing the Toruk enough to sway Sute too? He wanted to kill Jake even before he knew about all the betrayals. For all he cares, this alien possessing a body is trying to steal another one of their most sacred animals. Again, Natiri already told us why. My grandfather's grandfather was Toruk Makto, writer of Last Shadow. Toruk chose him. It has only happened five times since the time of the first songs. Taruk Makto was mighty. He brought the clans together in a time of great sorrow. We rode out to the four winds. Well, now that Jake is narrating from a future perspective, I guess the mystery of whether or not he survives is no longer in question. And that is the point of this, right? It's all about Jake. What? You said narration 20 minutes ago. Did you think his narration perspective stopped at the middle of the movie? To the Ikran people of the Eastern Sea. Wait, there's an entire clan that specializes in the Banshees and they haven't figured out how to catch a Turuk either? What's going on here? Again, Natiri already told us how this works. The Turuk has to choose you. It's different from the Banshees. The point is Jake is special and the Turuk is incredibly dangerous. Our great mother does not take sides, Jake. She protects only the balance of life. Natiri is acting like Awa won't intervene, which suggests that Natiri thinks a bunch of humans destroying their home tree and stealing Pandora's resources somehow qualifies as balanced. Do you notice how you said all of that and somehow completely missed her point, even though she was very specific with her words? She said Awa protects the balance of life. Unobtainium is a non-living mineral that has nothing to do with that equation. Sure, you could count the tree, but it's just a tree, and I'm sure this moon that is filled with trees can lose a tree or two and not upset the balance. When the humans start killing the natives, that's when Awa intervenes. Rogue One is hit. I'm going in. Sorry, Jake. And we're not out of pointless sacrifices yet. Apparently these scorpions don't have parachutes or ejection systems in case of malfunction or failure, and she's just going to allow herself to get blown up. But hey, you look pretty cool. I'm pretty sure aircraft with rotors that sit above the cockpit don't have ejection seats for obvious reasons. I don't care if it comes down to his marine experience, the guidance of Awa, or fucking blind luck. It is military grade levels of bullshit that Jake could predict that taking out this engine would cause the bombs to slide back inside the shuttle. All right, that was a Barami level sin. Who the heck is bear me? Take a guess. Why are there so many of us? Brother, you have no idea. Back in my universe, we had Sith bird men. There's even a female one now. Oh great, now we're gonna piss off all the conservatives. Dude, you mentioned critical race theory earlier. They already clicked out of this video. Jake survives this. Due to the training he did earlier in the movie specifically to survive this. Nothing's over while I'm breathing. Dialogue. Well, technically that's monologue. Actually, Miles was speaking to Jake saying it's all over, so technically it is dialogue. Oh my god, this nigga's here too. Actually, Jeremy didn't show Jake speaking, so it's monologue in the context of this video. If he wanted his dialogue saying, he should have included Jake's line too. The time of great sorrow was ending. Taruk Makto was no longer needed. There are more humans, right? Like lots and lots of greedy humans. What makes Jake think that they'll so easily give up on unobtainium? Well, you see, there are these whales with brain goo that's worth more than unobtainium, so... 37 seconds of logos! Is less than 50 seconds of logos. So how much do you have to hate yourself to become the best assassin in the world? Sinning Pi Mei's techniques. 
We once again have to worry about whether or not a dog is going to die in one of these movies, and I'm f***ing tired of all these movies giving me this much anxiety. You mean the same dog that's now been in three movies at this point? I'm fairly certain the films have no intention of killing any more dogs, my dude. But what I find interesting is the fact you care more about the dog dying than the hundreds of people that die in this film. People that care more about dogs than their fellow human actively disgust me. So Wick is riding after three people here who seem very afraid of him. And that's fair. I would be afraid of him too. But he's going after the elder. That's the only guy above the high table. Why doesn't his security and he himself even keep an Uzi on hand at all times? We are shown in these movies that there are times people aren't allowed to have guns on them. Given that we aren't shown the beginning of this chase, I think it's safe to assume these people were in a situation where they either weren't allowed to keep weapons or were simply caught off guard. As for the Elder, that's just a stupid question. John Wick is the only person to ever threaten an Elder. There's no need for him to keep a weapon. And the only way John Wick will ever have freedom or peace now or ever is in death. High table shadowing. I mean, check off peace and freedom. Wait, I mean, this guy. Like they would ever kill John Wick. <laughs> Unless you think he means in a metaphorical way, this ain't foreshadowing because John is still alive after the events of this movie. Lionsgate just confirmed John Wick 5 is being developed and I don't think the movie would be named that if he were dead, just saying. How do you travel with an hourglass and a briefcase and pull it out with all the sand on one side? That defies physics. We aren't actually shown if every single grain of sand is on one side, Jeremy. But if you've ever actually seen a real hourglass sitting on its side, you'd see that the sand sits below the midpoint, meaning it's possible for not much of the sand to travel over to the other bulb. Get a load of this tiny penis office, holy sh**. Have you ever seen an office more interested in convincing you that its occupier has a huge dick? That's a four-story glass window wall right there with motorized shutters. This entire room is easily 5,000 square feet. Shouldn't everyone want to kill this f***er? I'm not even sure this is the Frenchman's office considering he's based out of France. You know, because he's French? Seems more like a building the high table does business in, no? Also, Jeremy plays the woman game of criticizing someone's dick size. Unless you're the G or B in LGB, that is of no concern to you, my G. Also, also, Jeremy says boner. My father used to say, how you do anything is how you do everything. Pennywise's morphing abilities made so much more sense than what Barbarian just said. In fact, the plot of Barbarian made more sense. You really don't understand that saying? How you do anything is how you do everything. It means if you half-ass one aspect of your life, you're probably half-assing everything. The point is that you should build the habit of giving everything you do 100%. Second chances are the refuge of men who fail. Sure, but don't all men fail? Everyone fails, but not everyone who fails is a failure. Having two receptionists with no way to tell which one is the boss of the other one. Exactly. Why did they print John Wick's name in braille on a card and make him read it instead of just using words to say John Wick out loud? They're not trying to keep the name hidden from all the hench people in this room. They go on to talk about him openly the rest of the movie. Because his personal system is predicated on having these cards? Because this is a common trope in assassin fiction, one that you literally saw in the bullet train video? Because this was cooler? She stays in your room. However, I'm just going to hand you a room key and not tell you what room you're in and hope you can figure it out yourself. All the high-profile hotels do this, I promise. Have you ever been to a hotel? The room key usually comes in a little envelope with the room number and Wi-Fi password on it. This is the Birdman chiming in with an editor's note. Most hotels do give you the envelope in Japan, but this is footage of me in Kyoto, which is, generally speaking, the same area as Osaka, otherwise known as the Kansai region. This particular room card didn't come in anything, but then again, it was dispensed by a robot. If there's an open contract on Wick, then why did Kane have to be pulled out of retirement and hired specifically to kill John Wick? Technically, Wick's contract was never closed since Winston didn't really kill him. Even if that weren't the case, this is just covering your ass. This is the Baba Yaga we're talking about. He's quite literally taken out a small army of assassins by himself, so the more people you get in on this, the more people he's gonna kill. <laughs> I thought this guy knew John Wick really well. Yeah, which is why he says... Apparently not. Friendship means little when it's convenient. Hmm. 
That sounds deep, but I'm not sure it is. Plenty of friendships are formed out of sheer convenience, like with coworkers and neighbors. Those aren't really friendships. You literally described entirely different forms of relationships. You can be friendly with your coworkers and neighbors, but that doesn't mean you are friends. You have to actually be friends with those people, and then they'd cease being coworkers and neighbors and just become friends. I almost made a crack earlier about how huge the kitchen is, but now I see that it is both a kitchen and a weapons depot. Continuing the tradition of not understanding the criminal underworld of John Wick, Episode 4. Even with the higher ground advantage, this is still a bad case of bringing bows and arrows to a gunfight. The Japanese do things their own way. If you've ever been to Japan, that sentence hits different. Trust me. Get out. I love that Koji thinks this will work, but also, Koji thinks this will work. Jeremy sends something he loves, cliche. Oh no, it's the grabber! They don't even look remotely the same, so Jeremy makes a pop culture ref- Why does everyone in this movie have bulletproof clothing, but the SWAT type guys wear Halloween masks that are incredibly un-bulletproof and un-arrowproof? The helmets and masks are bulletproof. You are showing evidence of that. In order to kill them, they've been going for neck and eye shots. They still react to being shot in the head because... Well, they're being shot in the head. Bullets travel at around the speed of sound. Anything coming at you at that speed definitely hurts. The doorbell devices Kane uses are a fun gimmick, but A, he didn't need them when he fought everyone prior to this moment, and B, he never uses them again. Because A, this was the perfect situation for them, being an area he was unfamiliar with, and B, maybe he ran out? Do you really think he thought he wouldn't kill John in this outing? Why would he have more? Only Donnie N could make a live action version of the Popeye punch work. Even the movie Popeye couldn't pull this off. And now you've made me. Jeremy sends like this that. scene and something he likes. Does she really need to stab him this many? Why did you take up 50% of your staircase with fucking pulsing neon light fixtures? It's actually about 40% since we're nitpicking it all. I appreciate the aesthetic beauty of this fight scene, but why does this room exist? Why are there dozens of partial boxes of glass extraordinarily lit by inlaid neon bulbs? Some of the room has museum shit in it, but most of it is this empty shit. Like, do you think you're gonna grow into this space over time? And even if you do, why are you only building half the cubes needed to house your future museum shit? So this fool recognizes that this place is housing art, yet fails to recognize that the light squares are art themselves? I mean, he said he appreciates the beauty of it and doesn't understand the irony of the statement. Those are called f*** you bullets. No, those are called double tapping. This is a really well done action sequence, but it's also a lot of wash, rinse, repeat. This movie has no business being almost three hours. You could have cut this scene in half and it still would have been the same amount of awesome. No the f*** it wouldn't. Cinemasins, ladies and gentlemen. Proof that the motherfuckers that think they can make movies better than filmmakers should have a seat. Them and whoever made Spider-Man Lotus. Kind of a bitch move for Kane to wait until Wick is already battle depleted to attack him. I mean, the dude is blind. He was probably in a small square room thinking he was in the elevator. I don't know. John. Kane. Abel. Rufus. All the glass in here is bulletproof, like they expected gunfights. But it's not? Those rounds are clearly traveling through the glass. You're just upset the glass doesn't completely shatter, but that doesn't mean they're bulletproof. John. Kane. Abel. Rufus. I don't really understand what they are basing the monetary value of each bounty on, but I find it hard to believe that if they have any get up to 20 million, that they would ever have a bounty set as low as 15K. Did that guy just jaywalk? I swear you don't even think normal thoughts. You just let the intrusive thoughts run wild, don't you? Why wouldn't they have a variety of bounties, dude? You know the FBI had a bounty on Bin Laden worth $50 million, right? The bounty on this dude is so low they don't even advertise it. I'd give all the sins back right now if the gator from X and Pearl swam up and chomped these motherfuckers like they were breakfast tacos. No, you wouldn't. I'll be waiting for you. I appreciate how many of this movie's characters know exactly what their fates will be. I'm envious, actually. You sure? Because I can answer that question for you. What are the odds this gal ends up here on this same train car as Wick? I'm being serious. Well, I actually calculated the odds, and it's the square root of 12 multiplied by the hypotenuse of nobody gives a fuck. My mother is dead because of you. Oversimplification. But also, literally the truth. Kane doesn't kill her father if he wasn't given Wick's name. I fail to see how laying waste the Continentals is getting you closer to killing John Wick. This campaign is not to kill John Wick. It is to kill the idea of John Wick. He is doing an odd accent that does not feel natural, and I am scrutinous. I'm just curious, but why did you have to play Mr. Krabs' line there? I feel like you could have saved more time by just playing Bill's line. Oh, that's right. Padding the runtime. Got it. 
Also, how does blowing up hotels kill the idea of John Wick? If anything, it seems like you're just creating more John Wicks, since you're giving a lot more people the same sense of desperation that Wick has. What? That's an incredible misunderstanding of the scene. Killing the idea of John Wick means bringing down consequences so severe that no one will ever think of doing what John has done. I mean, he got not one, but two Continentals destroyed, dude. Come the hell on. Now, were you able to locate him? I don't understand why nobody's ability to locate John Wick matters to Marquis. He already has Kane hired to take John out, and Kane had no issue tracking him down. Kane has history with Wick. He's curious how nobody found him without that prior knowledge. Winston. Jonathan. Abel. Rufus, is it? Yes, Rufus, it is. Uh, it's usually long, Rufus, but it's a little cold out here. You understand. Challenge him to single combat. That's a thing he can do? Do you realize how many times prior to now he could have used that f***ing advice? God, you are a dick! Yeah, that's one of those things I didn't like about this movie. They basically invented a way for John to get out of his predicament after they painted themselves into a corner based on the prior rules that were established. I love this movie. In fact, I gave it an A+, but this is an obvious ass pull. I don't like these folks here. They have an entire room just for judging and slowly hanging people. The Ukrainians don't like them either. And the crest. Hargan first, then we talk. Awesome, another side quest. F the length of this movie. I want a John Wick movie to be shorter is worth these many sins. Movies have a long, sad history of giving villains disabilities, and the John Wick franchise continues that tradition with asthma jokes. The reason Jeremy created disabled superheroes makes it into the script. Four nines and a four. I know Kane is an amazing individual, but the cards aren't braille, and he's blind, so there is no way he would know what he had. These are the cards used in this scene. For the sake of this video, I bought these cards. My original assumption was that these cards might have a slight embossing on the face side, but it turns out that they don't. That may or may not be the case in the universe the film is set in. However, I'd be willing to bet his sense of touch is far more advanced than mine, so maybe there is an embossing that I just can't feel. Now, that's just my explanation, and I'm sure the movie is simply saying he's the blind weapon master trope, or he may only have partial blindness. Who cares? The point of this is that he's a badass. Oh, you're a flash. What the f***? I have poker friends that will come burn my house down if I don't stop here and thrash this sh**. The odds of a royal flush are 649,739 to 1. Great. You spent nine seconds telling us that it's not impossible. Slicing someone's neck open with a playing card. Jeremy points out things on the screen cliché because it's definitely possible to cut someone with a card even though he thinks John sliced his neck completely open, which he didn't. Kill! He yells kill, and the dog beelines directly to one specific hench person. Not the club owner, not John Wick, not Kane, just a random dude. Jeremy points out things on the screen cliche, because nobody wasn't specific who the dog should kill. So what voice command would he have to give the dog to get it to attack a specific person? Or does he just always let the dog decide its own victims? I'd assume that usually when he gives this order, it's for the person directly in front of nobody or the dog, probably because often there aren't that many people in a room when he gives the order. John Wick, and more importantly his back, survives this. The suit stops bullets, but I don't think it has any built-in spinal fracture repair capabilities. Well, the reason he does survive this is because he landed on that pillar. If anything, his back broke the worst fall and potentially saved his life. Also, imagine having your nuts gnawed on right before you got shot in the head. Jeremy sends something he likes, cliche? I'm not sure I understand how a gold tooth would prove that John killed Harkin. So you don't understand how collecting one of Harkin's most prominent features proves he killed him? Do you think they think John freaking Wick would pretend to kill someone? Dude, get a CAT scan ASAP. Why do so many groups and societies require pain as part of entry? I think that says a ton about our nature, and also the reason we want to belong to groups, and what our base self-esteem says about us. Discounting the fact that a burn scar is a permanent marking on the body that can't be easily removed, thereby signaling his allegiance, pain signifies true belief. If you're willing to suffer pain to get something, it means you really believed in it. This is why we respect natural athletes that are in shape and shame Lizzo. These guys play the most confusing game of dominoes I've ever seen in my life. That's because you have the attention span of a grain of rice. They're flipping over tablets with numbers on them. Whoever flips the higher number gets to determine one aspect of the duel, and they flip multiple times until all the rules are decided. You are a killer. Aren't they all, though? That's kind of what this whole f***ing organization is about. This is not nearly as profound a statement as the Marquis thinks it is. I'm having a really hard time understanding why he was sent by the table to fix anything. He eats cake and sips coffee really well, though. Is something someone would say when they remove the scene from its context. His point is that John thinks he can live a peaceful life, as we saw him try to do that in the first movie. But because he is a killer, he will never be out, so the Marquis wins either way. 
That's the point. A nomination. If this is right. The f you say? The old rule allows the duel, but also allows the challenge to substitute someone for himself or herself? I can understand if said party was injured or seriously ill, but there's nothing wrong with the marquee. Why does he get this kind of out? Again, you are not paying attention. John's purpose for this duel is to end the contract on his head, not necessarily to kill the Marquis. That he got to kill the Marquis is an added bonus, but ultimately, John is seeking his freedom, which is the purpose of the duel. Trusting your fate to a blind man? Tell me you've never seen Kane fight without telling me you've never seen Kane fight. Dude, you made me buy playing cards just to shut you up. You shouldn't be talking. I have a feeling Mr. Wick will never make it to the duel. By sunrise. Cheating! Not really. John still has a contract on his head. These are the rules the high table has set forth, and we saw exactly the same thing in the previous movie. It's not cheating if it's in the rules. Also, if Wick has requested the duel and the duel has been accepted, how can the Marquis still raise the marker for Wick and send more hitmen after him? That doesn't seem like it would be fair or go along with the old law. This is literally the same sin as the previous one. This is what I mean by padding the sin count, bro. Loving the husband. Hmm? That's what I want on my. John tells Winston what he wants on his tombstone, even though if John loses the duel or gets killed before, Winston will be in a grave right beside him and unable to follow through on John's request. That being the case, he's clearly saying in the context of him having won the duel but dying at a later date. John is able to hit all these men even though half of them are actually behind car doors and or in their cars, but John doesn't get hit by one of them even though they all have clear shots at him since he's missing the driver's door on his car. One or both of these things is happening here. One, John is a much better shot than these guys, which is very likely, or two, they are hitting him and John is wearing a bulletproof suit. Now, who's gonna be our big winner? I would give all the sins back if someone answered this with Mikey. Mikey's the big winner. No, you wouldn't. Sure, there are cuts in this fight scene, but not three per second. The film lingers on shots for several seconds before cutting. Why can't Marvel do this? This sin is for Marvel. But, but you gave it to John Wick 4. I'm ready to call it. John Wick's bulletproof suit is an unfair advantage. John fights no less than 10,000 humans in this movie. There's no way giving him a suit that helps him against overwhelming odds is unfair. You can't shoot me. Why can't he? What are the fucking rules? Do you see what I mean about how the movie gives CinemaSins the rules and they still complain about not having the rules? And if this movie took the approach of actually explaining said rules, he'd whine about exposition. 30 paces. Considering they don't get the bullet until they've walked 30 paces and are in the right spot, why not just start in that spot and save the 30 paces bullshit? What even is this question? Start in what spot? The spot that is 30 paces away? Wouldn't they still have to walk the 30 paces to get there anyway? And if you meant the spot where they were closest, um, have you ever seen a duel? Like, ever? And if you meant cut the scene of them walking, wouldn't you send the film for not showing the 30 paces? I'm giving you a sin for all these potential meanings to your dumb question. Yeah, Abel. Kane. And I'm being introduced to people and standing, getting a drink and all that. And the hostess is standing over there and she's looking at me rather nastily. And she went... So I went over her and she said, are you a drug dealer? <laughs> I said, no, why do you ask? She said, why is everybody calling you my cocaine? <laughs> it makes for a better shot for all the grass to be green, but this means that these two planned to meet here months after John was buried, which seems odd. Or that's clear evidence that John isn't dead and that this tombstone is likely metaphorical. Wink, wink. The MCU. Wait, are we to the point where that's a sin now? Has the universe shifted on its axis and Marvel has lost the goodwill earned by a decade of hits? Ooh, I love this question. Leo, play me in. Absolutely fucking not. There is no objective measure showing that the MCU has lost its goodwill with the general audience. In fact, everywhere you look, the MCU is still loved, still doing numbers at the box office, and still being rated very highly by the critics and audiences on sites that can't be manipulated by trolls. In fact, I did an entire video on this very subject, where I demonstrated that Phase 4 has been rated very highly by the fans, even through a few misses like Love and Thunder, which was also rated very highly by fans. Black Panther, Wakanda Forever. More Woke garbage from Disney, a very racist move, boring and uneventful, don't give Disney to more of your money, the MCU at its finest, go woke, go broke. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I just had to read that one aloud. Comments like those are precisely the reason this video is being made. This type of sentiment is fostered here on this platform from those grifters that I was talking about, and then these people go around spreading the virus.
No, not that one. Obviously, Wakanda Forever is not any of those things, nor would I call it a comedy film in the vein of Thor 4. Are you starting to get why I called Love and Thunder an aberration yet? Clearly, these films are all distinct tonally while all fitting in the same universe. You know, like the comics. But Birdman, what about the TV shows? I was told by Big Papa 47 on Rumble that the TV shows in Phase 4 were trash too. I'm so glad you asked, Sock Account. Let's talk about the TV shows really quick, shall we? I ask this sincerely. What is the problem with Phase 4? The vast majority of people like the vast majority of the Phase, and although there are some properties that aren't all that spectacular, isn't that par for the course for the MCU? When people point to this Phase 5 film's box office numbers, I point to the fact that Guardians 3 is also Phase 5, did gangbusters at the theaters, and was rated very highly. I'd also point out that the Ant-Man films as a whole have done poorly at the box office in comparison to other films in their phase, with each Ant-Man film only making around five to six hundred million dollars. So no, the only people talking shit online is the very loud minority on Twitter and a few other places. And it'll be a cold day in hell before I call Twitter X and hell doesn't exist. Oh sure, this creature evolved the sturdy, strong body of a horse, but kept the soft, vulnerable head of a snail so that when it runs, anything that hits its face kills it instantly. I am highly doubtful that even space evolution would give us horse cargo. I'm only curious, but do you have many examples of horses running headfirst into things that could potentially kill it? If not, why is this sin? My life doesn't really make sense. Hard agree. So I guess we're done here? We can add a few hundred sins and head home? No? Well, I'm adding 10 anyway, just for making me do the work the movie already admits is done. You patting the sin count, bro? I think you're patting the sin count. It's been a crazy hey few years hey, hi, for everyone. You? I believe you mean half of everyone. For the other half, it's been less crazy and more, wait a second, you married my brother while I was gone? Well, considering this is set two years after Endgame, half the population is two years into dealing with losing five years of their lives, so I'd say his statement is fairly accurate. I mean, imagine instantly transporting seven years into the future, and a loved one that wasn't snapped died and people have moved on, but you haven't, or a business you started is completely gone. Bank accounts poofed, properties lost. I mean, you think the homeless situation is bad now. Reforestation, affordable housing, food production. She's not wasting a second. Wait, she solved all those problems? Scott doesn't say she's already solved all those problems, only that she's doing it. Besides, your incredulity doesn't work here. In context, Scott said she's using the pimp article to help fix these issues. Now, I know you're a little slow, but the pimp article can make things grow. So if you use it on a food source, you can literally solve food production and potentially end world hunger. Then when you apply this concept to model toy houses that can be built by hand, it starts to make sense. Honestly, using pin particles to get up to the top of the Golden Gate Bridge with your Chinese takeout is the epitome of entitlement. This is worse than Iron Man chilling and eating inside the famous donut from Randy's Donuts. Be f***ing entitled pricks. Well, they are from San Francisco. Does any of this track? Has the Scott Lang we've ever been shown displayed any kind of the self-love it takes to write a f***ing memoir? Dude, Superhead has a f***ing memoir. Let's move on. Hi, Hope. Hey, Dad. I would have a lot more respect for this Scott's daughter is also a criminal storyline if... You know, the movie was actually about that. But instead, it's all about setting up the Kang dude, which, like, how many nights did poor Peyton Reed go home to his family sobbing about having to make the third Ant-Man movie a Kang movie? While I agree that Kang probably should have gotten a standalone film and that it's weird he gets into it with Scott Lang of all people, I'm going to take issue with your understanding of Cassie's character. She's not being portrayed as a criminal, she's being shown as an activist. Sometimes being an activist will get you arrested, just ask Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King. Her being an activist is important to her characterization and the conflict she has with her father in this film. You shrank a cop car? I know, right? Seems like the danger and extreme nature of that action might result in something more than a have your parents come pick you up consequence. It's almost like she didn't get arrested for shrinking the car, but for protesting, which is what the scene actually said. The shrinking of the cop car was a different issue that she wasn't charged for because it was still in her confiscated items. Dang. Where are they expecting to go? It's not their fault that they lost their homes in the blip. Movie raises really interesting question about the blip and its impact on housing that neither this movie nor any after has any interest in exploring. It literally started out stating Hope is working on affordable housing, numbnuts. You specifically addressed that very thing when you asked if she solved it. Dad, 
A guy dressed like a bee tried to kill me in my room when I was six. That is true, but it's weird you'd use that as evidence that you should be free from all monitoring. A hilariously blatant scene manipulation. Look, I know this movie didn't do so hot at the box office, but some of us saw this f***ing thing, okay? She is not saying that line in reference to not being monitored. She said that in response to Scott saying he wants her to have a normal life. I get it. I just think you should get to have a normal life. Dad, a guy dressed like a bee tried to kill me in my room when I was six. I've never had a normal life. I have so many questions about this dumb pizza. Where did you get the tiny toppings? It's possible they cut smaller vegetables, considering vegetables come in a variety of sizes. Why are there more zucchini on the big pizza than the small one? There are absolutely not. Literally count them, dude. Why didn't you cut it before making it bigger? Because cutting it would prevent all the pieces from growing at the same time. And mostly, if this is possible, why aren't you using this technology to feed the homeless? Jesus did the same shit with bread and fish, and people still won't shut up about it 2,000 years later. A, we don't know if Jesus did a damn thing, considering he's a legend that is most likely a composite of other magicians and faith healers of that time period. And B, they are using it for the homeless. They explicitly state they're using the pimp particle for food production. Are you doing this? Actually, no. They built their own tech. Allowing insects to develop super intelligence. Do you want to be ruled by ants? Because this is how you get ruled by ants. And this is why I did the Avatar video first. In that video, I asked, would you kill ants even though they're nearly as social as humans are? The answer is clearly yes, making you a hypocrite on your position about displacing a society. You know, if I had something like this when you were gone, then I could have found you. Rubbing it in that you didn't care enough about your dad to show your genius when he really needed you. That's... That's not what the scene is saying at all. How does it work? It's kind of like that two-way radio we used to have. You send a signal down from here, and then it collects the data and it sends it back. That's not at all how a two-way radio works. It's two distinct... And let me stop you right there. She didn't say this is how a two-way radio works. She said it's kind of like how a two-way radio works, as in an approximation for her average intelligence father. We should be dead. Fair point. Jeremy sends something he agrees with cliche. Remember how the Ant-Man movies were fun because you got to see humans at gigantic and tiny proportions as relative to recognizable objects? This movie was like, how about we put our heroes in an environment for the entire movie with only things that the audience will have no relative size understanding of, so their powers are completely indistinguishable as interesting or entertaining. I don't know, man. I kind of think Ant-Man fighting germs in the quantum realm to be on brand. But then again, I've actually read the comics. Look, I'm just gonna be honest. When you put characters in an environment where literally anything can happen, like angry sun monsters and underground purple whale moles, the stakes of the whole thing go right out the window. Honestly, you could fucking kill Ant-Man in this movie, and as long as it happens here in the quantum realm, I will probably laugh if I have any emotions at all. It just doesn't matter. It's never been less real in the MCU. As I have demonstrated many times, you believe there is only one kind of stake, and that isn't true. But your entire point is nullified considering the major stake in this movie is unleashing Kang from this realm, which is so serious, they named an entire Avengers movie after him. I told you to stay away from here! But you never told him why, and that's crucial. People will always be curious about the things they were warned against without explanation. That's how I got into porn, drugs, and Barry Manilow. Did we just forget that Janet got trapped down here for 30 years? Isn't that scary enough to stay away? No? What about the time vortexes that Scott got trapped in that sent him five years into the future? Not ringing a bell? Seriously, who the hell needs to be told the quantum realm is dangerous at this point? Drink the ooze! I'm not gonna tell you why for some reason, so guzzle guzzle pops. But why explain something for which a demonstration will do? That's why they show her looking like a vampire that just bit a human for the first time. To demonstrate it's safe. You don't understand movies at all. If this movie had been a standalone Disney film named something bland, like, say, John Carter, it would have made way less money and faced way more criticism. But because of the MCU machine, this is still a profitable film that made half a billion dollars. Actually, the film wasn't profitable and was considered a box office bomb. It needed 600 million to be successful, which it never reached, and it got hammered by critics. It's almost like nearly everything you say is wrong. Where exactly are we going on this? We're not too far from an old friend of mine. Will someone in this movie just answer a direct question with a direct answer? Was that not a direct answer to the question? She said they're going to a friend of hers. Did you need his name too? His name is Scott Lang. He has seven holes. First, the f do you know how many holes he has by reading his mind? And second, seven? I assume you mean ears, nostrils, mouth, butt, and f 
But what about the eyes? If you don't count the eye cavities, are you also not counting the tear ducts? Those seem at least close to the same size as the urethra, right? Also, isn't the nose really one hole with a skin flap dividing the entry? And doesn't your mouth have two holes, one for breathing and one for eating? Not to mention on a smaller level, every pore is a hole. Well, the answer is probably between five and five million, depending on your definition of the word hole. The lack of due diligence here is honestly infuriating. Cool, cool. But did you just say that tear ducts are close to the size of a urethra? Bro, seek a doctor right now. Either your willy or your eyes are in serious trouble. Okay, they're telling the truth. Thinking that reading minds is the same thing as being a lie detector. Thinking that it's not. Holy sh**. That guy looks like broccoli. Appearance shaming. Dude, I was there when you said the Indoraptor looks like a bitch. You have no room to talk. Human. Like us. Human. That's the word. You forgot a word that you never had to learn because the ooze just translated it directly to your brain? I feel like this movie stopped caring about 15 minutes before the Marvel logo appeared. Nah, that was you. If they don't have humans, they wouldn't have a translation for that word. It's like loan words from other languages. We got tsunami from the Japanese and herb from the French. Isn't that right, British people that pronounce the H in our? Oh right, you guys don't do that. So what is it that brings you to us, Janet. She just said, she literally just said, We're looking for friends of ours, two of them, human, like us. Wait, I know goddamn well you didn't just criticize Bill Murray for doing the same thing you did twice in this video. Let them go, he just wants me. If Janet really cared about Hope and Hank, why are they even here for this meeting? You could have come along, you know. How does that make any sense? She was under the impression Krylar was her friend. Why would she think to go alone to this meeting with an ally? A mechanized organism designed only for killing? He said that like I'm supposed to orgasm now. Should I orgasm now? Nah, that line was for those of us that know shit about comics. Or those that played that terrible Avengers game. The Hulk? He's not the Hulk. He's not. He's not. He's boring to play. He's awful. Like, if I punch you as the Hulk, either my fist is going through you, or if you're durable enough, you're flying the fuck back. You're not about to sit there and just tank hits from the Hulk, yo. It's the Hulk. That's his entire power. His power is strength. How the fuck are you making robots that can tank his powers? Did I mention how much I hated Marvel's Avengers? Did I mention how much I hated Marvel's Avengers? Did I Avengers? mention how much I hated Marvel's how Avengers? How much I hated Marvel's Avengers? Did I mention how much I hated Marvel's Avengers? shot but why didn't it big in the glass or the liquid molecules does it have a come up and setting we don't know about discounting the odds of the shot which probably were high anyway given hank has been throwing these things almost his entire life the particle most likely landed on the creature directly it's similar to when cap threw the water truck at war machine a direct hit that guy i was down here for 30 years henry excusing infidelity due to extenuating circumstances at least helen hunt thought tom hanks was long dead before she started doing the horizontal tender dude 30 years is an incredibly long time to be trapped somewhere it's only infidelity if you know your spouse is still alive and that you will see them again she probably thought she'd die down there or that her husband was dead up here if he has that weapon why does he do so much punching well, it appears to be an energy-based weapon, and it likely uses a significant amount of energy, so he picks his shots. Our fates have always been forged together. Ever since that day we met. Apparently, MODOK actually stands for Montage of Darren's Positional Origin Story. Um, narration. Spelling narration with a K. Darren is dead! There is only MODOK! This is fun. I'm having fun. I'm a random film goer, and this is very fun. That's what they said. Mechanized organism designed only for killing. Actually, that's Modofk. Scott Lang would be excellent at the acronym Sin School House of Literalistic Explanations. So CinemaSense tried to spell asshole there. The problem is that schoolhouse is one word, so he actually spelled a soul. The multiverse, as in alternate dimensions. No, the multiverse as in why the f should I care about any of this anymore when I now know none of it really matters because I guess Reed Richards can be Jim from The Office and then just get annihilated as if I'm supposed to feel something about that. That multiverse. Just like how you think the only form of stakes is death, you think the only feeling from the MCU showing and killing 838 Mr. Fantastic is happiness. Clearly you do feel something about it because you were upset about it in the Multiverse of Madness video and you're still sore about it now. You obviously feel a negative emotion. We tried everything to reach 
recharge his ship's energy core. Everything? Did you try reading at some withering heights while dancing Michael Flatley's Lord of the Dance? Did you try tickling it with a feather while eating a bowl of Cheerios soaked in orange juice? Did you try reverse psychology? Maybe slow your roll with the absolutes then, Janet. It wasn't an absolute, it was an implication. In text form, an implication looks like this. This mid-movie exposition will go on for a total of almost 10 minutes. This movie is so talking. I'm sick of saying it, so I'll just replay what I said in the John Wick 4 video. Do you see what I mean about how the movie gives CinemaSins the rules and they still complain about not having the rules? And if this movie took the approach of actually explaining said rules, he'd whine about exposition. So Janet is about to turn into Aunt Granny and will ultimately blow up the core of Kang's ship. But she said they tried everything to reignite the ship's core during their years of attempts. And I don't know that I believe she would have kept her ant suit thing a secret when she could maybe have used the tech to fix the core. It's a nice surprise for Kang, but she trusted him pretty fully right up until now. And I think she'd have revealed her pim tech in case it could have helped fix the ship. Yes, let's shrink the core. That'll definitely fix it. Why do you think you could stop me? Because somebody else already did, and she will, and then other people will stop you again later in this movie. For a big bad, you are actually quite stoppable. He's a villain. I'm not sure if you're aware, but comic book villains, no matter how powerful they are, will always be written to be stopped. That's like saying here's a sin because a story will have a conclusion. Kane's a problem because not only is he powerful by himself, there are potentially infinite versions of him. It's kind of like what they did in Endgame. Thor killed Thanos, but another one popped up and was even more deadly. Imagine if Thanos kept coming back. That's Kang. He's after the core. How is that possible? And why? He's all powerful, and you said you blew up the core. Suddenly the core still exists, and he can't get to it unless he gets tiny? Are you fucking serious? Blew up is being used in the same context as, honey, I blew up the kid. So yes, that means utilizing the pim particle is exactly what he needs to restore the core. Because I know how it ends. He does not. Jeremy didn't watch Loki. I'll do it, just let her go. Why does Kang need Scott to go get the engine core? Or are the pim particles in the suits themselves and he can't extract them for his own use? Yes, moving on. Once you're inside, find the core and size it back down. Again, I thought the core had been exploded. Is he supposed to take 10,000 pieces of exploded core and put them all back together? And you thought that because you weren't paying attention to the exposition you always ask for but disregard. Janet used the pim particle to blow up the core and made it unusable for Kang's machine. So it stands to reason that he simply needs the reverse to happen. Every choice you could make existing all at once. If that were really the case, then there would be so many Scots appearing instantly here that they would all fuse into some monstrous Franken-Scott with millions of eyes and mouths, and this movie should really read its own screenplay. Well, that was a stupid assumption. I really would like to know how your brain works, because I'm assuming you got worse CTE than Antonio Brown. Whoa, what guys, hey, relax. How the f*** is one of the probabilities wearing Baskin-Robbins stuff? How is that even a possibility of this branching decision tree? Is this movie even trying anymore? Jeremy heard every choice you could make and still thought this was impossible. Sure, it's stupid, but are we forgetting that Scott is, well, idiot adjacent? This motherfucker mastering the flying of this ship to do this is too big an ask! Sure, if you're not paying attention to literally anything in the film. First, Hank Pym is not only a genius, he's one of Marvel's most intelligent beings in existence. Then, Janet literally told us flying this vehicle is as easy as riding a bike. I mean, put two and two together, man. And no, I don't mean 22. I saw the multiverse. And it was dying. From your lips to Feige's ears, Kang. I really enjoy these minority opinions of the MCU. I really do, because they're going to make some of the finest crow when the next Avengers film does a billion dollars. Apparently they pass through some sort of time dilation. They live thousands of years in a single day. Apparently? Apparently? How do you gloss over all the explanation with the word apparently? Dude, we literally had a film where the entire concept was using the quantum realm, the Avengers were able to manipulate and navigate time to reverse the damage Thanos caused. This means it's already established that the quantum realm has time vortexes. Hank, who can communicate with ants, learned from them that they had become advanced to the point they'd created this technology. So knowing all of that, Hank's usage of the term apparently is him making a correct inference based on available information. It's not glossing over an explanation, it's the MCU assuming you understand the mechanics of time in the quantum realm. Who the hell is watching this movie that hasn't seen Endgame? 
We've got some ideas. Did the ooze wear off? Why can't they hear the ants in English like every other creature? Because the ooze was specifically for the inhabitants of the quantum realm and not the inhabitants of Earth? Unless you want to suggest the ooze could make you understand Italian, too. Your dad's not here, Cass. Well, I guess that's not a big surprise. How the f*** does freaking Modoc know how much Scott has been around? He's been trapped down here, right? I guess Jeremy forgot the first Ant-Man film, a movie he sinned, where they showed that Scott was in and out of prison, something Darren literally found out. Hey, little guy. <laughs> I always suspected you had a suit stored away somewhere, which begs the question, who is the new Ant-Man? Scott Lang, the martyr who took on the system and paid the price, losing his family and his only daughter in the process. Exactly your kind of guy, Hank. What is the bridge code? I'll die first. 18147. The bridge code is five f***ing numbers. Are you kidding me? Well, this is technology devised by a human being. What else would it be? It's a bridge code, not a vault with secrets and shit. If he can be this big and this powerful for this long, why is he just doing this now? Because this takes way more energy than just being big enough to take out that sun germ. Besides, what other instance could Scott have used this ability? I mean, think about what you're asking for. You're huge! I'm we have literally zero visual context to know that this is true. They might as well just be running towards each other on a normal platform. Everything interesting about this franchise has been removed from this entry. Did Bob Barker direct this? Because they absolutely neutered this puppy. Fortunately, they had audio context, which consists of their talking speed being slightly slowed and the echo of their giant footsteps. Plus, literally zero is literally untrue, as you see these spaceships on the ground that we saw were larger than everyone else earlier. So, he's supposed to be all powerful, and maybe he is, but he only ever mostly uses this blue laser thing from his hands, and while that looks deadly, it gets a bit boring after a while. What does something being boring have to do with it portraying power? You just conflated two different concepts like we wouldn't notice. Superman gets called boring all the time, but that does not negate the idea of him being extremely powerful. <laughs> Oh no, not Plasma Cannon, head guy, please not him. How will I ever recover? It hurts so much. And when presented with evidence that Kang's abilities are not limited to his own energy beams, Jeremy just ignores it like we wouldn't notice. There is nothing in the entirety of this film that tells me why these super smart ants would be any more effective against Kang than the other waves of faceless enemies he has already mowed down with ease. It's called numbers, Jeremy. They show you that Kang can hold them off for a while, but they simply overwhelm him with their superior population. No, not that population. What did I do? You know what? It's probably fine. Being honest about how little any of this actually matters. And just like Ant-Man 2, people continue to underestimate how much of an effect the Ant-Man films have on the franchise as a whole. Only this time it's really f***ing stupid because it's about Kang. You know, the literal antagonist of Phase 5 that has an upcoming Avengers movie named after him? The guy that's going to be a prominent figure in Loki Season 2? The beacon they saw in Shang-Chi? Alright, I made that last part up, but considering they still haven't told us what that was, I could totally be right, right? Right? Fifty-two seconds of logos! I've never really liked the logo sin. It just screams, I don't know how to open a video, so let's talk about an industry standard practice that literally no moviegoer actually cares about. But the Atomic Monster Studio logo is pretty freaking sweet. I mean, they at least tried to make it interesting for the viewer, and when I first saw it, it tricked me into thinking it was a part of a movie I was watching. So the sin here is for complaining about effort. The lyric here is, I had a dog, she was my only friend, but she got old, died, and now I'm alone again. And there's no way in hell that gets past a PR department, marketing team, or even a one-person focus group that doesn't particularly like kids. In reality. But as oft repeated here, we are talking about a movie universe, specifically a science fiction horror universe where pretty much anything goes. I mean, this film is about a sentient doll that goes on a murder spree. How many times has that happened in reality, I wonder? Forcing your religious beliefs onto a being that can't object. I'm going to refrain from making the obvious religious dogma joke that I would have made here prior to all the people complaining in my comment section about me making jokes about their religion. Psych! <laughs> Forcing your religious beliefs onto a being that can't object. You mean like children? Calm down, I'm talking about the dog, not the child. Or am I? Based. You would rather she sat there feeding a toy virtual food until it shits itself? Says the person who chose to create a similar creature that spends its first few years eating food and shitting itself. You mean like children? Not based. 
What was Gemma thinking? She was thinking it's my niece's birthday. I'm gonna get her a present. <laughs> she works for the company that makes them. This is a really shitty way to talk about your sister in front of her niece. Was this purely for exposition or to make me feel better about them dying tragically because they're terrible people? <laughs> As if it matters. You know, the more time I spend around people like these two yuppies in the front seat, the more I've come to the realization that people actually talk like this. You know the type. Humble braggers that in a conversation have to throw in all the people they know or are related to that have done things with their lives. So I said all that to say, this sin is for that fucking laugh. Honestly, what is the purpose of a toy if you have to play with it on an iPad? How can a parent in 2022, a time when the iPad and similar such devices have been around for over a decade, say this with a straight face? How can you say this with a straight face? Seriously, what popular mainstream toy entirely requires an iPad to interface with it as of 2023? Fam, the iPad is the toy. That's what makes this movie unrealistic, that they suggest kids would use an iPad to play with a physical toy when the kid would just use the iPad itself to make racist comments in my comments section. Katie, what are you doing? Using this seatbelt unbuckling to goose the tension. What even was the sin here? That a horror film creates tension for the audience? The context you cut out was that the snow caused the car to slide, which made Katie's toy fall to the floor. That's why she unbuckled her seatbelt so that she could retrieve it. Why the hell is this a sin in this video? Shit like this is why these videos are bloated and overlong. Nobody needed that information. This buffering circle was clever in the theater, but at home, it immediately caused me to pause the movie and scream in frustration, how can this be buffering? It's on a goddamn Blu-ray disc. By the time I realized what was happening, the TV had already been redecorated with a pizza and I refused to take sole blame for my short temper. This reminds me of an incredibly insane person that recently entered my comment section. Just like in the Glass Onion video, Jeremy is sending a film for something that worked in the context it was supposed to be viewed in, which in this case is theaters and home streaming but because he's watching it on Blu-ray, the trick doesn't work for him. In the Glass Onion video, Jeremy did something similar, wherein he sinned the movie because one of the misdirections in that film's mystery could be mitigated by simply rewinding the movie. Of course, that's a cheat that wouldn't be possible when watching the film in theaters, but somehow, because he has it on home video, a movie's mystery doesn't work because he can rewind it. This fucking lunatic thought that Jeremy was right in suggesting that because he can rewind a movie, the mystery doesn't work, which is a level of stupidity that almost beggars belief. You might as well tell me that Voldemort being on the back of Quirrell's head is a sin because you can fast forward Sorcerer's Stone. Remember, the key to fun is funky. Not following this up with Brass Monkey Junkie, that funky monkey. Sinning a movie for not making a bad joke. Are you f***ing kidding me with this sh A brightly lit ball and a tennis racket are not going to keep kids this age amused when TikTok, YouTube, and stickball are things that exist. Which of course is why they're doing research. I mean, did you notice the guy standing there with the clipboard? There are plenty of children that will play with a toy for a specific amount of time. My guess is they're researching how long. If we could at least show him what we have, no. he would- mm -mm. You said so yourself, not until she's ready. And why would we talk to our boss when there is so much pronoun gaming to be had first? But this is a stupid usage of the pronoun game sin, isn't it? Why would two people who both know who they're talking about say the name of their boss in this kind of conversation? The pronoun game sin is for when one person doesn't know who the other is talking about. You can't even keep up with your own tropes. Megan is hanging here like some creepy robot Jesus, and I'm struggling to make sense of the symbolism. Probably because there isn't any. It's just a humanoid being suspended in a way that allows easy access to its components. Due to the American bias you hold, you associate this pose with Christianity's central figure, unaware that death by crucifixion predates Jesus, and the cross itself is a symbol that predates Christianity. Like all things in Christian myth, they borrowed the concept of the Egyptian Ankh and pretended it was something they came up with. So back to your sin. Why don't you think this pose represents Abdallah ibn Abd al-Malik? He was crucified by Muslims in Egypt. David, the only way to stay ahead of the competition is to come up with toys that are too advanced to replicate. No, the key is to accept that there will always be rip-offs and variations on your theme, and the trick is to build brand loyalty and release content, sorry, products, on a consistent schedule. Or at least that's the hope of um, the tech company I was totally referring to. Yeah, I agree with this sentiment. Her line doesn't make any sense here. The moment you release that advanced technology to the public, you are putting it in the hands of your competitors who will eventually be able to reverse engineer that product. The only way for her reasoning to make sense is for them to never release that product and to hope there isn't a leak. She's talking about a f***ing toy meant for mass production. One sin removed. 
and pet seems more complex than it needs to be, but that's only because I was using it as a launch pad for something bigger. If that's the case, would it be so hard to remove a bunch of features, giving David his cheaper product while continuing to develop Skynet? Uh, yes. Do you think programming a quasi-sentient AI system is easy or not time-consuming? And for that matter, Megan is clearly a passion project for her, and typically those require most of someone's attention and energy. She also states that she doesn't want to dumb down her toy, given that she just explained her goal is to create text so advanced as to not be replicable. Should I give back that sin I just removed since you didn't seem to understand what she's trying to say? Because I think I should. In each pet, we installed a listening model that targets conversational patterns among kids. You did not just tell me that. I don't think any of us believe that this kind of is too far removed from reality. And thanks for dooming us all to a week's worth of ads about how our technology isn't spying on us. Okay, but you're giving the movie a sin for something you just agreed with. If you believe this is like reality, with the context being that the majority of your sins hinge on things happening in movies being unlike reality, shouldn't you have removed a sin here? Model 3 generative Android. Megan, for short. Actually, I think you came up with Megan first and then came up with what the letters mean. So it's not Megan for short. It's that first thing you said for long. And here is where Jeremy can't seem to separate Doylist and Watsonian. He seems to be speaking to Gemma, which would be a Watsonian or in-universe criticism. However, since we have evidence that she's created other toys with names that do not follow this logic, it's clear that the filmmakers were the ones to come up with the name. So he should be directing his critique towards the filmmakers themselves, which would be a Doylist or out-of-universe criticism. This is why I give him five cents for speaking to the in-universe characters as if they can hear him. Those characters are simply following a script made by the writers and cannot deviate no matter what Jeremy yells at them. Also, the troll in me wants to call her Mithrigan for the rest of this movie, but saying it just once annoyed me so much that I can't commit. Though here are 20 sins for using numbers in your branding as a substitute for imagination. Besides the fact that technically it is due to imagination the name exists, this seems like a thinly veiled shot at the person who voices me, the current present Birdman, and edits these videos. What? Dude, I voice me. You sound crazy right now. Silence, peon. Anyway, alphanumeric naming conventions have existed for a long, long time. You sound like an old guy experiencing the internet for the first time back in the 90s. Well, you and everyone that pronounces the Birdman as Three Birdman. Like, shouldn't it be the Three Birdman? You fucking idiots. I might have forgotten to put in the polypropylene barrier. <laughs> Okay, this looks pretty dramatic, but this really shouldn't be game over. Megan malfunctioned because of a dumbass, not because she has a fundamental flaw, other than the obvious avoid the robot dominated end times thing. Whoa, 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 whoa. You can't possibly be serious here. They just demonstrated that if a relatively small piece of equipment isn't installed, the doll can literally explode with the power to send concrete flying. At minimum, this means it can kill a child playing with it or blow up a plane. There is no way a competent CEO witnesses that and okays production. But then again, I can see why you, the CEO of CinemaSins, would okay putting out an obviously bad product. Welcome home, Gemma. You have six unanswered voice messages and five Tinder notifications. Elsie, turn off. Hilarious, but why would anyone have their Tinder notifications broadcasted like this under any circumstances? I'm assuming she brings friends over at some point, so is she just bragging? Those of us that don't just have space between our ears would understand that this means she usually doesn't bring anyone over. Everything they've shown so far suggests that Gemma is consumed by her work and that she doesn't have much time for or experience with social interactions. I mean, hell, she's an attractive woman with only five Tinder swipes in a sexual marketplace where men swipe right on everybody. If anything, that's the sin. Oh, those aren't toys, Katie. Movie will make a big thing about Katie not being able to play with these toys now, so Gemma can look like an ass when she has to open one later. But it's all under the guise of there being no toys in the house, which there absolutely are. They're just packed in boxes. Boxes you could go through right now to grab a few toys and books for Katie. Holy gish gallop, Batman. What the hell was the sin here? That she doesn't allow Katie to play with what are supposed to be decorative commemorations and invaluable collector's items? That she has unfinished products that she doesn't allow her traumatized young niece to be a guinea pig for? That she later breaks her rule and allows Katie to play with her collection? What the fuck are you trying to say? This coaster scene is to establish how out of touch Jim is with kids, when the real issue is how out of touch kids are with coasters. So you're agreeing with Gemma here. Again, what's the sin? To waste our time with jokes nobody laughed at? Because I agree. Yeah, they called and offered to help, but like, they live in Florida, they're kind of weird. Redundant sentences. That's Floridianist. What about these ones up here? Those aren't toys. They aren't Gemma's collectibles. You're not supposed to play with them. Gemma is a terrible parent, no doubt, but it's wild how much Katie seems to want to go into foster care. What? She's telling the truth. 
And here I thought lying was a sin. At least that's what God told me that one time I ate those weird-looking mushrooms my roommate put on my pizza back in college. And no, I wasn't hallucinating. I really saw God. God's the goat-looking one, right? What's that? Oh, that's Bruce. It's Australian for Chekhov. Demonstrating you have the ability to notice film tropes. Fantastic. My problem is that you don't recognize that Bruce's name isn't the same naming convention as Megan, demonstrating your earlier point about names was misplaced. If I had a toy like Bruce, I don't think I'd ever need another toy again. The same lie I told my parents about the Fushigi Magic Gravity Ball is the catalyst that inspires Gemma to build her murder bot. Okay, now you're just narrating the movie, though. Gemma is an inventor that relies on market research to develop toys for a company she works at. Like, dude, that's the f***ing synopsis of the movie. The entire point is that she makes things that entertain children. But seriously, is this the inspiration that Gemma needed? What <laughs> light bulb did this switch on that wasn't already lit? What was Megan's purpose if it wasn't to be a kid's best friend? Of course, one could only come to this conclusion if they were sleepwalking through the movie up to this point. So far, we are shown that Gemma can't connect to her grieving niece, but all of a sudden, Katie lights up and expresses genuine interest in something Gemma has been working on. That's the light bulb. Her idea could cheer up even the most dour and depressed child, and her niece is living proof. Also, isn't this the worst idea for a toy company? If this actually becomes the last toy you ever need, I don't care how expensive it is, you will be screwed in the long term. Repeatedly buying shit that we don't need to replace shit we also didn't need but is now broken or older than the new shit we don't need is the backbone of our economy. Hey, capitalism! Yes, but technology always improves. Back in the 90s, I'm sure people thought the Diablo was the pinnacle of Lamborghini supercars, but here in 2023, the Revuelto makes it look like a piece of shit. Hell, you could say the same thing about the iPhone. Compare the original iPhone with the 15 Pro Max. They're not even in the same solar system in terms of functionality. You're looking at the incremental improvements instead of how technology progresses over time. The Megan dolls could even become a service, where features are added to the existing platform through updates, which is the model of gaming consoles today, which themselves see revisions. We will now expedite the creation of life by montaging its way through all the typing, rendering, and soldering required to make a scientific breakthrough. Didn't the movie already do that? I mean, we were shown Megan was already functional and that the reason it exploded was because of a missing component. And we all know you don't want to see the things you are saying you want to see. Stop the cap. Uh, David, I just want to be ex exceedingly clear that this was not my idea. How do these people still have a job? Not only have they ignored David's arbitrary deadline, but they must have somehow spent even more of the company's money getting the Megan prototype to work. How are they allowed access to anything after squandering $100,000? What you are describing is an inflection point. You are asking why they would be allowed access to anything, but there is a point where they'd be discovered as having squandered the company's resources. This is that point. You are working under the assumption that they have already been discovered, and this scene refutes that explicitly by showing you this is where the company is being made aware. It's nice to meet you, Katie. Ah, kill it now! Literally yelling at the screen cliche. There's nothing there. Oh. I'm sorry. Spilling this glass of water was actually deliberate, but of course it's played as a f up so that we'll all be more impressed by the inkjet printer in a skin suit. Again, simply narrating what is on the screen. Get me a list of things I can say in a presentation that makes it sound like I know what I'm talking about. The writing prompt from the CinemaSins narrator to every CinemaSins writer somehow makes its way into the script. Wait a minute. Yeah, yeah, cute reminder that there are multiple writers that write CinemaSins videos and that Jeremy isn't the only person writing the Sins. Except when you look at their IMDB, Jeremy takes most of the credit. Funny how the ego works, isn't it? Reveals the truth every single time. Sculpted from a titanium core. You know, for kids. Well, spla. Titanium is incredibly resilient, and we all know that the one thing you want your product meant for kids to be is durable. And can be fully customized through six different silicone skin pigmentations. Thinking that six different color pigments qualify as fully customizable. Which six colors, Funky? Hmm? Which six? Well, they show you three, which can be best described as Kardashian, vaguely black, and Jenna Ortega with blonde hair. Do you really need to see the olive, Native American, and Asian ones, the latter of which you definitely label racist? Through our own unique approach to probabilistic inference, Megan is on a constant quest for self-improvement. Through the writer's own unique approach to writing obvious hubris, the audience has no doubt that this will end poorly. You say that as if this film wasn't marketed as a horror film. Seriously, who went to this thinking it was the prequel to Barbie? Crazy. It's insane, right? This reaction to any conversation about coasters. Except the reaction wasn't about coasters. It was due to Megan's explanation about condensation. Katie James. 
daughter of Nicole and Ryan James, killed in a collision on Interstate 84 outside of Oregon. Interstate 84 outside of Oregon could be Idaho, Utah, Pennsylvania, New York, Connecticut, and Massachusetts. Most likely means Idaho, but I-84 exists on the East Coast, too. The interstate roads are almost incomprehensible, and Eisenhower doesn't get nearly enough flack for that. There are two sins here, one for misunderstanding that when someone says outside, they mean close to but not quite there, and two for giving a sin to Megan for something Eisenhower did. Your goal is to protect Katie from harm, both physical and emotional. Look, you don't need to be a parent to know that pain in all of its forms is an unavoidable part of growing up. How does no one, apart from Tess, realize that this shouldn't be Megan's function? Or do we just use this to set up the Megan takes this as permission to kill with extreme prejudice thing? I think this film touches on an important part of the discussion behind AI, and that is in their haste to create the most powerful AI they can, companies behind these technologies don't consider the risks. Sure, they say they do, but we are currently embroiled in a situation where AI is rapidly replacing cornerstones of many industries, such as music production and even acting. A lot of people think these are good things until AI gets advanced enough where it replaces their job flipping burgers, and then it becomes a problem. I see the rapid evolution of AI as an existential risk to humanity, whereas these tech companies see it as a way to increase profits, but they don't realize they are the architects of their own demise. What good will money be when AI makes the concept of money irrelevant? The next few years are going to be incredibly interesting, and by interesting, I mean we will see the technological singularity. Megan. Yes, Gemma. You are now my second primary user. I'm gonna sound like a dick here, but f*** it. You can't have two primary users. By definition, Gemma is now the secondary user. Let's at least make sure our new AI overlords know that words are important. Yes, words are important. That's why it's important to debunk the shit you say, like the idea that there cannot be multiple primaries. I mean, hell, the fact that that word has a plural form should be your first clue, but if that's not good enough, what's another name for these three colors? Exactly. Also, what was the point of showing a locked file if Kirk can still access it with just a double click? I think the funniest thing about this entire video is that Jeremy is not the administrator on his own PC. So there's this new game called Tic-Tac-Toe. This new game called Tic-Tac-Toe. While I agree with the sentiment of tic-tac-toe not being new, the sin here is for assuming the tic-tac-toe Katie is referring to is the one played on a piece of paper. I mean, you literally cut off her saying you use your hands for this game. And the one she's talking about is this. Two different versions of the super fun clapping game called tic-tac-toe. Let us know which version you like better. Tic-tac-toe. Give me a high, give me a low, give me a three in a row. Don't get shot by a UFO. Did Gemma and crew not know that they've built in the capability for Megan to move silently like a ninja assassin? I think the CinemaSins writing team, that's mostly Jeremy, didn't realize the person in this scene was the therapist and wrote Gemma, but were too lazy to change it when editing this video and left it in thinking we wouldn't notice. I mean, otherwise, this scene makes zero sense given what we are seeing on screen. If you make a toy that's impossible to let go of, then how do you ever expect a child to grow? You know, I thought the idea of an updated Chucky movie was pretty f***ing cool, especially with the Uncanny Valley preteen Annabelle aesthetic. But so much of this movie is dealing with the moral ambiguity of parents allowing technology to raise their kids. That's great, but it's not what the trailer told me. I'm used to trailers misleading me, but can you at least mislead me into something fun? Well, that's a very subjective sin, wouldn't you say, Cinema Sins? I mean, most people that watched this movie had a great time, and I think this movie's message that you just pointed out is a great one. Letting your kids be raised by cinema, I, I mean, technology is a bad thing. And who's this? Your sister? Oh, Jesus Christ! This is the only believable response to Megan in the whole movie. Jeremy sends something he likes cliche? Because this looks like Jeremy sends something he likes cliche. We do have a toy table where the kids leave their dolls and things like that. She's actually a working prototype, so I shouldn't even have her out in public. And yet out in public, Megan shall sit as if she wasn't the single most valuable piece of technology to ever wear a bow, wig, and eyes too big for her head. This would be like Steve Jobs leaving the first iPhone at the Microsoft HQ break room and hoping the honor system will hold true. I was with you up to the last bit. This is not like that at all. Unless, of course, you think kids on a picnic could reverse engineer what is clearly a titanium sex doll. Did Gemma pre-program Megan to get up in the creepiest way possible, or did Megan watch the ring on the way over here? Well, they did say that Megan can handle whatever is thrown at her, with the implication being physical obstacles. 
being that she is a robot, she doesn't need to get up like I do when my back is in tatters. And trust me, if she did, this movie would be at least 15 minutes longer. I get that you can tell a lot from the facial expressions, but Megan is pinning down very specific emotional states to the percentage, or at least on a scale of 1 to 100. Are we saying that at any one point we can feel anything from 1% guilt to 100% guilt? How the f*** do you work that out? And why is this technology in a kid's toy? While I can't speak to the specifics as to how, and being that this is a science fiction film, I don't have to, that's what fiction means, they specifically stated the doll is meant to learn and adjust to a child's mental state in order to best accommodate and help them. Like, that's the whole point behind Megan, to be the friend a child needs when they need it. The only thing I want to know is what happens when Andy gets too old for the cowboy and astronaut, if you know what I mean. Nail guns don't work like this, and if this woman had one, why didn't she fix the hole in the fence? See, you thought this movie was about only one bloodthirsty android, but this here is the Karen. Every homeowners association has one, so really, Megan is actually Terminator 2. Then I found the kid's ear up this bank like 200 yards from where he was killed. Point is, we're also treating that as a potential homicide. I know Gemma has a lot riding on this, but Megan has raised enough red flags at this point that Gemma should absolutely be worried that she killed this kid, and probably the neighbor, and certainly that dog. Call me a prude, but I feel that triple homicide trumps a telling off from your boss. But of course, Chumbo won't act on it yet because we still have half an hour of this sh left to go. But Jeremy, you are showing and talking over footage of Gemma literally looking at Megan and beginning to suspect her. There's a music stinger and everything. And the literal next scene is of this thought keeping Gemma up at night to the point where she goes to check on the doll. Holy sh his malice was at 79? I think Megan did the world a favor. Is this a quiet Robocop reboot? Yeah, cool joke, bro. What I have a problem with is this is the scene I was talking about where Gemma goes through Megan's files because she suspects her and Jeremy just ignores it like he didn't just ask for this. Do you see this pen? Gemma shuts Megan down because she suspects she has killed multiple people and then she wraps her in bubble wrap instead of immediately dismantling her. Again, this is Gemma doing something about the doll because she suspects her. Dude, why are you not acknowledging that your previous sin was wrong? Oh, you f***ing dick. Could have unplugged this last cable from behind her like the rest, but you just had to put yourself in prime position for this f***ing jump scare, didn't you, you dick? Textbook example of Jeremy yelling at the screen, instead of, you know, the screen writers. Call! I don't believe there is a company around that would make a toy this durable. And even if that was the goal, I don't think you had to give her the strength of a Terminator. Well, that's nearly impossible, isn't it? I mean, if you're building a humanoid out of metal, by definition, it'll be super strong. I mean, that's just how structural metal works, especially if you want her to be able to lift anything heavier than a cup of orange Julius. <laughs> Cool visual, but Megan could have turned these off immediately or prevented them from going off in the first place. But no, she's got to be all cinematographic and cool and sh Yeah, that's right. But what's the problem? This dancing scene is terrifying and stylistic, but it occurs without any explanation beyond Megan enjoying her work. Sinning this scene, that's worth these many sins. <laughs> Why in the name of f***ity f***ery does the blade from that paper cutter look like a machete? Is this a novelty paper cutter? That would be a f***ing weird find in a machete manufacturer's office, let alone a toy company. I know, it's ridiculous, right? But not quite as ridiculous as that laugh. SECURITY! HELP! But why does she want to kill David? That shitty kid and the shitty neighbor die because they fell into the loophole of threatening Katie's happiness. I know David is a dick, but what did he do to Katie? Here's a bit of conjecture that's based on evidence. We saw that Megan has control over the systems of the building when they showed her able to wirelessly interface with the security system. This means it's not a stretch to suggest that she can see and control the elevators of the building as well. She then saw Kurt coming up the elevator through these same means, and since Kurt was her target, David was collateral damage. She explicitly explains Kurt's motive as she frames Kurt for David's murder. So Megan can connect to anything electronic? Because earlier Tess and Cole unplugged her because they seemed to think it would stop her from being able to mess with the lights and sh**. But she has no connection to this car at all. So how is she getting it to work? This is the danger of AI, something they taught you in the Age of Ultron. Once she starts self-improving, there is nothing her creators can do to stop her evolution. That's the technological singularity, folks, and we are literally barreling into this same future in real life. Also, if this is a feature she has, why aren't Cole and Tess aware of it? I get that Megan can learn and adapt, but can she grow new f***ing hardware that allows her to wirelessly control sh But do you really get that Megan can learn and adapt, though? Because it doesn't sound like you do. I mean, RF signals and key fobs can control vehicles today. Why would you think she'd be unable to replicate this signal? Do you think she's less advanced than the Birdman's car keys? I'm just like Megan. No, seriously. I'm just like Megan. 
If you don't know what kind of movie you got your five-year-old into after the first minute of this thing, you should have your parent card revoked. I'm not saying some little kids wouldn't be into this, but I am saying those little kids would either grow up to be psychopaths and or Apple Store employees. I am aware that this story is based on a book, and that book was more or less marketed to children, but just because this film is in stop motion doesn't mean it's made for kids. I am also aware that you are saying the onus is on the parents here, but you are inherently implying that this movie is for and marketed towards kids, which is my problem. The film was rated PG in America, which stands for Parental Guidance, and had a heavy emphasis on semi-nude tits. In other words, you likely couldn't leave your kids alone in the theater. You know what else was PG? Remember the Titans. I'm sure all the racism in that movie is just for kids, too. In Alabama, anyway. This is an impressive button collection to be sure, but if you're the type of Edward Needlefingers to keep them this impressively displayed, wouldn't you also sort them by color or size? Obviously not, as you can see here. I seriously don't understand these types of questions. The movie presents an event, and you question that event, asking wouldn't they do something differently. It's like, if they would, that's what would have been shown, no? I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but I think your new house may have a squatter. It's good to see Madame de la Grande Bouche is still getting work these days, but this bit part is a waste of her immense talents. She doesn't even get to sing. Jeremy makes a Beauty and the Beast pop culture reference. Why does this cat have no butthole? Everything else about this part of the movie is pretty realistically animated, so the lack of a butthole is tripping me out almost as much as it did in the Cats movie. Everything wrong with Coraline, ladies and gentlemen. I want to see a cat's butthole, but I can't. Damn, look at this landscape. It's got this f I'm just waiting for Coraline to start busting out. This is Halloween. This is Halloween. 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 Well, it was made by the same guy. I would expect a little of the design language to transfer over. I mean, look at Martin Scorsese's films. Also, Jeremy sings in a video cliche. Uh, let me guess. You're from Texas or Utah. Someplace dried out and barren, right? That's Texas. You toxic? It's also true. Texas is dried out, and the wombs of the Mormons in Utah are barren. But I don't like being stopped. Not by psycho nerds or their cat! I want a nice, polite stalker that alerts me to his whereabouts via note every morning. Stationary selection is key here. It must contain a raised texture and a frilly exterior. Anyway, as for you, get the fuck out. Yeah, no. You specifically showed the subtitles, and when you see this pointy thing called an exclamation point, you know that was the end of the sentence. The rest of the dialogue was to clarify that she doesn't like being stalked by animals either. So the implication you're making here, that she's okay with stalkers as long as it's not Wyborn, was not only overlong, it was stupid. I'm from Pontiac. Huh? Michigan? If this were true, she would immediately show the relative location of Pontiac on her hand, which looks like the state. Wait, what was that? If this were true, she would immediately show the relative location of Pontiac. One more time. Show the relative location of Pontiac. Relative look, relative look, relative look. Okay, here we go. Kinda like name an NFL equivalent for each NBA player. NFL equivalent for each. Name an NFL equivalent for NFL equivalent for each. Oh, I definitely heard someone. Why were you born? Damn, Coraline just met this dude. He's been informative about the new house, the location of the well, and generally gracious after accidentally freaking her out at first. So what gives with this insta-kill attitude mode for our supposed protagonist? Coraline is what we in the anime fandom like to call Tsundere, which is a very typical archetype for female characters, even in Western animation, as exemplified here. Besides, as you said, he literally scared her half to death for no reason other than to be a dick. I almost fell down a well yesterday, Mom. Uh-huh. I would have died. That's nice. Looks like we're getting straight to the disconnected and aloof parent cliche. But here's the thing. 95% of the things kids say are either unimportant or exaggerated. Coraline didn't really almost fall down a well. You can blame the parents if you want, but when you really think about it, are kids really actually worth listening to? So, Jeremy sends something he agrees with cliche? I know they just got here and that this is supposed to be a grungy, gothy movie, but what's up with this kitchen? Could they not have wiped down the cabinets? Or at least the sink? It looks like this apartment was previously used as a meth lab. I'm not saying this family is, but it's apparent you've never been poor before. As a person that grew up that way, I can tell you there are plenty of old apartments that look just like this, or worse. And it doesn't matter how much you clean, the grunge never really goes away. Coraline's dad is a hunt and pecker. And a Spartan fan, and honestly, I'm not sure which is the more egregious sin. Don't really care about the collegiate sports quip as only professional sports matter, since you aren't paying those kids anyway, but it's actually a nice movie detail that he's a hunt and pecker. Mel edits Charlie's work, and when you see her typing, you see that she isn't a hunt and pecker. Get it? 
What the hell, Cora? You know you have poison oak all over your hands, and you're spreading its contagion all over your dad's office doorknob. I know he's being a little dismissive, but you still like him, right? That isn't how poison oak works, though. Poison oak causes dermatitis in those who are allergic to the plant, not just everyone that comes in contact with the oil. Granted, a lot of people are allergic to it, but the point I'm making is that you are clearly unaware it's an allergic reaction and believe everyone has the same reaction to it. It's the same chemical present in mango trees and not everyone is allergic to mangoes, right? Left-handers. Hey, I may be ambidextrous now, but I'm taking this in personally. We already have to exist in a world where people create things exclusively for right-handers, like computer mice. We don't need any flack from dudes that can't pronounce relative. Coraline has written down that she saw 12 bugs, but I counted at least 16. Well then, you can't count, because there are 20 in the scene you're actually showing. Also, triple exclamation pointing a word before the end of a sentence. Wait, what was that? Triple exclamation pointing a word before the end of a sentence. One more time. Triple exclamation pointing a word. Exclamation point? Exclamation, exclamation, exclamation. Well, a very, very heavy, uh, heavy divertation tonight. We had a very Daris, Darison bite. Let's go to Terrace Terrace and those for the bit. They had the pet. I don't know who covered up this tiny magic door, but if all they used was a layer of wallpaper and a f***ing cardboard box, they weren't trying too hard. I'm surprised they tried at all. Most people that come across this door would see a brick wall behind it, so they could have left the door alone and no one would have cared. Or you can look at this from the perspective of other Mel, that she's not trying hard on purpose to get the attention of unsuspecting children. Will you stop pestering me if I do this for you? Thing my college girlfriend said to me when I brought home a watermelon, a paper shredder, and a pool noodle. I'm just going to use a soundbite from the previous sin. I mean, seriously. Have you stopped laughing yet? Yes, I know Coraline is peculiar, but any tween that's awoken from a deep sleep by a rogue rodent would be screaming at the top of her lungs right now. I mean, her parents are into gardening and mulch for frick's sake. You think she's afraid of a mouse? Exploring a strange and possibly dangerous hole. This has never worked out well for me. That's a true statement only for the fact that you've never actually been near a strange hole. Hello, Coraline. Does other father really need the reading glasses if he's got the buttons for eyes? Maybe the buttons also have astigmatism. Other father is actually performing a They Might Be Giants song here that was written specifically for the movie. It's awesome. And while that might usually be a sin-off, it turns out They Might Be Giants was originally going to do the entire soundtrack for the movie, but everything else was eliminated because of creative differences. So creative people and the differences they wrote in on. This still counts as sinning something you like, considering the sin counter went up. If you believe this was worthy of a sin off, but something caused you to want to give them a sin, that literally balances out, meaning the sin counter should have remained the same. Any requests? Mango milkshake? Mango milkshake? Mango milkshake? What kind of an abomination is a mango fucking milkshake? And why would a kid with very simplistic tastes even think to request this wretched beverage? Mango milkshakes are fairly common. I'm pretty sure I've gotten one at an Indian restaurant before. But the real sin is that she's able to consume mangoes. As mentioned earlier, mangoes contain the same chemical present in poison oak, and since we already know Coraline has an allergy to poison oak, this milkshake should have killed her. Also, you're getting your every desire here. I wouldn't blame Coraline if she actually decided to stay. Not like she even has to pull a cipher and sell anyone out. I do enjoy the feigning of ignorance here. You mentioned that YB would explain why his grandmother normally doesn't rent to people with kids 30 minutes from that point in time, which means you've already seen this movie. I'm not supposed to talk about it. At least until the plot deems it necessary about 30 minutes from now. But here you are, pretending you don't know why Coraline would decide to not stay in the other world, even though she's having her wishes granted. Her choice would be worse than Cypher's, considering she would literally die, and Cypher's deal was to be rich and famous in the Matrix. It's like, have you seen your favorite film of all time? But I'm your other mother. I mean my other other mother. Rhetoric. Ooh, the word we were looking for was semantics. We're already here, Coraline. Gone to Oregon? So the adults are creepy and secretive, the food appears out of nowhere, and the photos talk to you. Did Coraline just apparate into Hogwarts? Well, Neil finished writing Coraline in 2002, but he began writing it in 1990, which was about the same time Rowling began writing her book. All she did was beat him to the punch, but the convergent evolution here is simply a matter of coincidence. Not for nothing, but earlier yesterday, Coraline's mom told her that she had a lot to unpack. Her emphasis, not mine. But look at this room. Whatever she did have, which isn't much, is already on the shelves, and there's not a box to be found. Your point is well taken, but do you not see that fucking box right there? Miss Spink and Forcible? But you said they're dingbats! How the f*** long have they been in this apartment? It really looks like they just moved in a day or so ago. So how have they had time to form opinions of any of the neighbors? Especially when they're this focused on their catalog. Do you think people just move into apartments without actually visiting the site first? Because I'm pretty sure that's how you get realty scammed. 
I can buy that Coraline has blue hair because she's a tween that would totally do that, and her real parents look pretty normal. As does Wybie, but nobody bats an eye that this mother is blue. He looks like he's been dipped into a bad batch of Easter egg dye. Well, he is Russian. You know they do things a little differently over there. Wait, whose suitcase is this? And why didn't they take it inside last night before it started pouring rain? How are it and its contents not ruined? Well, judging from its texture, it appears to be the kind of suitcase that might be waterproof or resistant. I only figured that out by using my common sense. You should buy some. I heard they had it in stock at the 99 cents store. Oh, Caroline. Caroline, Caroline, Caroline. Ba -ba -bum. Jeremy harmonizes in a video cliche. Oh man, with this much mist, I'm afraid how this f***ing movie's gonna end. I've been down this road before and that's traumatic. Jeremy makes a The Mist pop culture reference that isn't a It's it's dangerous or something. Dangerous? Jesus Christ, how many people need to tell you that this place is f***ed up, Coraline? Any kid would be dragging her family out of here by this point, like that on fire. But this is the first time someone has told her this place is actually dangerous. Sure, the mice told her not to go through the little door, but they don't count, considering they actually led her through it themselves twice, and when she went through it, she had a positive experience. The big titty old lady told her that she wasn't in danger when she misread the tea leaves. So it's not as simple as you're making it out to be, and her parents don't listen to her anyway. You know, just last night, Coraline was super suspicious of the other parents and didn't even want to eat or play games. So why is she all jazzed up to go back into the hobbit hole? Probably because she wasn't sure if it was a dream. You know, the thing she says aloud in the film? <laughs> Aw, those man-eating tulips are just totes and orbs. Totes and adorbs. That's worth these many sins. Oh, sure. Just chat on this magical chicken poop corn without any permission or inkling about how the Chloe corn is made. But the chicken is clearly fake and has a window on it that allows you to see how the popcorn is popped. Let's be honest, you just wanted to say Cloaca. Mice, even button world fantasy ones, can't play trumpets. Oh my have the god, skip! The whole school's gonna wear boring gray clothes. No one will have these. Where the hell is Coraline going to school? Juvie? What grade school's colors are gray on gray? Coraline's. Next question. Your school might be fun. With those stupid uniforms? Yeah, if there's one thing that grinds my gears about school, it's when I don't like the uniforms. I tell you, they could have a bunch of Dolores Umbridge teachers as long as they let us wear attractive jumpsuits. But aren't you contradicting your previous sin, though? I mean, her point is that her school will probably be boring considering the boring uniforms they have to wear. Your point was, what school has gray uniforms, which is you also calling the school boring, which means you are sending something you like. Cliché. How do you feel about a mustard ketchup salsa wrap for lunch? Movie pretends like the condimentorito isn't a perfectly valid meal. I eat what I want. Body positivity. If you're the same cat, how can you talk? I just can. Oh. But you just accepted Charlie could see better with those buttons for eyes. I'm not sure a talking cat is more unrealistic than that. Oh, no, 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 no. And you thought you only had to explain the creepy parts to your kids after watching this movie, huh? Try and rationalize why there's a big old pair of barely covered hooters showing up in a performance of which these two ladies specifically invited Coraline. It's almost like this isn't for kids, huh? I'm not saying Mrs. Jones wasn't animated in proper proportions to a regular mom, but I am saying the animators may have gotten some <clears throat> inspiration from the dimensions of Elastigirl from The Incredibles. Or this character is based on a spider. Besides, nobody is as thick as Elastigirl. Huh. <laughs> You've got that right. No way! You're not sewing buttons in my eyes! Sure, this is where Cora draws the line in this weirdo fantasy world full of creepy critters and soulless sycophants. Well, let's consider the things she experienced so far. She got to eat delicious food, cured her rash, went on a whimsical flight with other dad, saw a spectacular mouse circus, and got YB to shut up. Hell, she even got to see some hooters the size of basketballs, and no, I'm not saying that because that's why I watched this movie. I'm just saying she had a pretty good time up to this point. So did I. How can you walk away from something and still come back to it? Neil Gaiman's The Matrix. You mean The Matrix Revolutions. Jesus, dude, did you even watch that series? Don't remember our names, but I remember my true mommy. This movie is a straight up nightmare factory, and I don't think there should be factories for nightmares. So we're sending horror films for being horrifying now. That's what's wrong with the genre today. She locked us here and ate up our lives. Holy f man, and I thought our tax biting it in the never-ending story was harsh on a young audience. This is scaring the hell out of me. Again, a horror film is too scary. Oh, 
The why be the talks? Jesus, this dude's doppelganger literally just saved your life in the other world, and this is your immediate reaction. What part of the other world is better than this one are you not getting? Let's not forget that up to this point, this YB hasn't really been helpful or particularly useful. Caroline says her parents have vanished. And rather than call 911 or anything from her mom's perfectly functional cell phone, Coraline decided to confide in these two wackos. That's tits. Uh, I mean, at this point in the film, her parents are missing, but she doesn't yet know they've been captured by the beldam. Hell, even if she knew, what would the cops do here exactly? File a missing persons report and go back to pulling over nice cars for no reason? How is 100-year-old candy going to help? First of all, this candy was labeled as 1921, so at the time of the movie, it's not even 90 yet, and rounding numbers up is for the weak-minded Coraline. My mom must have told me that a thousand times. If the movie is set in the year it came out in the real world, the candy would be 88 years old, which most people would round to 100. And considering the advice your mother gave you, I can see why you turned out the way you did. She's also stupid. You know, it might be demonic animated bacon, but it still looks goddamn delicious. Jeremy sends something he likes, cliche. Bless you, miss. You found me. Why isn't the Beldum stepping in to make this at least a little more difficult? That bitch is evil, but she's all about fair play when it comes to games. Yes, that's what the cat told you. It's like the Gnome King in Return to Oz. He's a piece of shit, but he's a fair piece of shit. Kind of. This may be a stupid question, but why does everything in this other world turn into a nightmarish version of itself the longer Coraline is here? The Beldum is shown to be able to make and appear like anything she wants, so why would they change at all? You're missing the blatantly obvious symbolism. This illustrates that the illusion is breaking down. The more Coraline sees this place for what it is, the uglier it becomes. You think winning game is good thing? The Detroit Lions. God damn it. <laughs> that was hilarious. You won't have this. How did that sh burn so quickly? Seemed like it was made out of solid quartz, right? And how do they destroy sh from the real world and the fake world anyway? It's not even a real sh fire. First of all, nothing about this movie suggests this world is fake. Based on all available evidence, this is a real place where real things happen. Second, that thing was literally made out of 100-year-old taffy. Figures that the Beldum banishes the Joneses to a fate worse than death, Detroit. I gotta tell you, I'd rather live in Detroit than anywhere in Appalachia. Sure, it's beautiful, but them hillbillies ain't. This is Resident Evil Extinction, which, as you don't recall, is the third Resident Evil movie. Well, I don't know about that. This was the film that broke most of the hardcore fans away from the film series, as it was clear they were doing whatever Paul Anderson wanted to do and not following the games. So we were quite aware this was the third one, as we were stupidly actually excited for this thing. Also, this is supposed to fool you into thinking it's the first movie's first scene all over again. And I must admit, the doctors who created this reality did a good job, from putting the shower curtain in the exact same position to getting Alice to react the exact same way she did the first movie. Remarkable! It is the exact same footage from the original. They just removed that stupid-ass green filter and cut off some parts of the frame. But the scenes do differ, as in the original, they show Alice being knocked out from the gas, and in this one, they just show her tit- I, I mean, her reaching for her robe. You know how we know we're deep into a franchise at this point? They start playing the greatest hits record. Let's not begin the video being dishonest. They're showing clone Alice having a flashback because she's in the laser murder hallway. If they were playing the hits, they'd have at least shown something from the second. Alice jumps over the thing that can easily be ducked under. Or Alice jumps over the thing that can be easily jumped over. Arbitrarily placed Indiana Jones booby trap. Arbitrarily using the word arbitrary after being shown multiple traps at this point. Cool, secret door. My question is, where is the moving floor going in this enclosed space? A a question Jeremy also asks whenever he stands in front of elevators. Also, 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 this place takes great pains in having a secret facility deep underground, complete with a secret elevator. But they leave clone corpses in a ditch a mere 20 feet away. Nobody will ask any questions if they see that. At this point in the series, most of the world is overrun by zombies. The underground facility is a safe haven for Umbrella survivors. It has nothing to do with being clandestine and all to do with keeping the infected out. The virus didn't just wipe out human life. Lakes and rivers dried up. Forests became deserts. Yeah, but why? Why does the virus have the power to do that? This sounds a lot like Scar taking over the Pride Lands. I see you're strangely new to the Resident Evil series, so I'll explain. The T-Virus, in the games as well as these movies, has the power to affect plants. In the games, this resulted in the ivies in plants 42 and 43. In the movies, it made them wither and die. Do you think plants can't get sick? This is KLKB. We have seven I guess the T-Virus wiped out all of humanity and dried out rivers and made forests into deserts, but somehow there are still people living, despite the catastrophic change to the ecosystem. Well, yeah, I'd expect some people to survive an extinction-level event. 
Not you, of course, but some people. Hell, there are people living in places like Phoenix and Pahrump today, and both those places could be confused for the set for The Hills Have Eyes. We will only reveal ourselves once you find out the baby is fake. It makes for a more satisfying robbery. But you're cutting out the context of the scene, though. The reason they waited for her to hold the doll was so that she could put away the weapon she was holding. It's easier to hold someone up if they're unarmed. Just ask the LAPD. What you got down there, Fizzy? All bad guys are rapists. Not all bad guys are rapists, but all rapists are bad guys. Or cats. The bones down here suggest these bandits have thrown people down this pit before, but who's responsible for getting the demon dogs back in their cages? Considering those bones were in and near the cage, it's clear they lured the zombie dogs with human victims. Hey Carlos, this is Claire. LJ? Claire Redfield. Well, how can I help you? Adam? Sorry, campers. Character introduction through radio conversation. All right, I tried to let the last couple sins slide, but this was like 10 straight Jeremy points out things on the screen cliches. Fuck's sake, we have eyes, man. We can also see the things you see. Using antibodies from her blood, I will develop a serum that will not just combat the effects of the T-virus, but potentially reverse it. And that's why I've been cloning Alice and sending her into death mazes to reverse the effects of the T-Virus, somehow. It's amazing you can't keep up with this movie. You send the two previous films, so you should know Alice is infected with the T-Virus, but her body adapted to it and turned her into Wonder Woman. So, if he's able to reverse engineer what happened with Alice, he'd be able to turn everyone into Wonder Woman. Without the original project, Alice, progress has been difficult. As I recall, you let her go at the end of the last movie, when you could have simply recaptured her after her escape. We will never get an explanation as to why you did that either. The explanation was revealed in the last scene of that movie, where they showed they had control over Alice, a major plot point in this film. As is the case with Umbrella in the games, they were looking for a way to create a controllable superhuman to sell as a bioweapon. The only reason they lost control is because Alice has been avoiding their network. This meeting is adjourned. So why would you call a meeting in a boardroom if you're just going to be there in hologram form? Is this the only place equipped for hologram meetings? None of these movies ever bother to explain the hologram dynamic. I want to know how these guys, sitting in completely different places in the world, manage to angle themselves perfectly for a boardroom meeting like this. If I'm sitting one way at home, how does that translate to me sitting at a different angle in hologram form? How do I track someone like Dr. Isaacs as he walks around the room? And how does this simulation thing we saw before the scene began detect hologram figures? This seems like an obvious answer, but they are all at identical tables wherever they are in the world. And the simulation thing is a scene transition only for the benefit of the audience. It has no in-universe function or analog and is a play on the first movie's simulation thing. Seems quiet. Yeah, don't they always? I feel like both of these characters who were in the last movie probably already know that quiet doesn't equal safe. But the dialogue is for you, dumbass audience. Don't you mean LJ would be excellent at CinemaSins? Because the only one you should be directing this sin at is Carlos. <laughs> Man, if zombies could just learn not to growl their presence during an otherwise quiet approach, they'd have a better success rate. Considering they already took over the world, I'm pretty sure this is well within variance. Are you telling me this mirror is so clean that he didn't realize it was a reflection? I think they're trying to tell you that his anxiety is through the roof, given he lives in a world where zombies can pop out of nowhere and that he was just attacked by one. I don't think he was paying attention to how clean the mirror was, Jer. Also, why are there zombies just walking around in the dark hoping humans will one day show up? They apparently crave human flesh, but decide to hang out in these places just to be scary dicks. Why are you acting like this is your first zombie film ever? Since when do zombies actively hunt for people to eat instead of shamble around their general area until they are attracted by a stimulus? Zombie somehow bit through LJ's shirt, but did not tear it, and it didn't bleed through. I like how you're saying this over footage of the big asshole in LJ's shirt. This is incredible. The serum works. You've domesticated them. I can say this with confidence after seeing the zombie perform three successful tasks in one sitting. Well, technically, he's right. He did domesticate them, at least for a small period of time. I'm just saying this was proof of concept. Soup, cream of mushroom, and pork and beans. Be Asparagus. How do you do that? Just one of my skills. It's a dying art, unfortunately. Shaking cans with no labels on them and figuring out what they contain is a dying art? Was it ever an art? Is this something the cavemen were able to do? Maybe he's joking, but it doesn't look like he's joking. Are you fucking serious? I want my perimeter up. And be sure to use a gas-powered vehicle when you do it. We have unlimited fuel around here. You said that like they have much of a choice. She ordered him to get it done quickly since a storm was coming and they are surrounded by zombies. Did you want him to walk? Still don't know how they're able to run high-tech sh** like this without the world's infrastructure and very little fuel. And I'm very certain they aren't running this stuff on batteries. These are closed-circuit cameras. They don't need 
the world's infrastructure to run a CCTV system. Also, it's entirely possible they're solar powered, which is a clean and renewable source of energy that will last for billions of years, Exxon Mobil. My senses have detected a peak in psionic activity. Because when Umbrella built me, they made sure that I could detect psychic powers, those being so common and all. He says in a movie about zombies based on a game series where psionic abilities are extremely normal. What the hell about any of this is realistic again? This entire swarm of bloodthirsty birds are all flying around the camp, but they don't swoop down in masses until these guys safely board the bus. I have a feeling Jeremy's going to gloss over Nurse Betty. I'd say the effects are almost on par with Birdemic as well. Maybe the moral is, don't do a movie with killer birds. I guess telekinesis allows you to turn a flamethrower, which has absolute limits on the amount of flame it can expel, and turn it into a giant flaming cloud of death. And I was right. They made such a big deal about number 87, and now she's dead. Glad we took the time to trump up her qualifications. Look, man, I know this movie is booty juice, but at least try to keep up. Umbrella is trying to replicate the process by which Alice bonded with the T-Virus. The reason this clone was a big deal was because they are getting closer to figuring out this process, as shown by her making it the furthest so far. What's your name? Kmart. That's where they found me. Do you have another name? Never liked it. Seemed like time for a change. Yeah, to Kmart. I'm sure that's much better than whatever name you had before. It sure beats where they found you. I mean, imagine being named Waste Management. I've got half a tank of gas. That's it. Chase? Ah, uh, shit, I don't even have empty. I got enough for 100 miles. Tops. So, less than empty and can still drive 100 miles. That's pretty awesome, actually. Chase is driving a tanker. He's referring to the tank's payload as being empty, but the truck itself has enough for 100 miles. Unless, of course, you think tankers utilize the fuel supply they're hauling. She's right. Vegas, it's her only bet. Is that a Vegas joke? Like, if it were Seattle, it'd be Seattle sounds good to me? Or if it were Nashville, it'd be Nashville is music to my ears? Or if it were Vancouver, it'd be Vancouver will be a riot? This is one of those examples of thinking about something too deeply, which is rare enough to be amazing for you, actually. Luckily, there is not only a Vegas sign right here telling them it's only 89 miles away, but that's the maximum amount of miles any of these vehicles can drive. And here is why I did the Coraline video first, folks. I know y'all remember that Jeremy said rounding up from 88 to 100 is a sin. Well... Also, this seems like an opportune time for Alice to use her psychic power to close the crate again, or throw the crate into the sun, or make the zombies spontaneously combust. But who needs psychic powers when you can just turn the movie into a shooting gallery? But the movie shows you there is a physical cost to Alice whenever she uses this ability, and it immediately places her on Umbrella's radar, something she's been avoiding for years. An Umbrella-controlled Alice is a far more dangerous opponent than the zombies, and since she's also a badass with guns, fists, and other weapons, this seems a more feasible option. Movie suddenly turns into the House of the Dead video game, and I guess a little bit of the movie too. He went with House of the Dead when Gun Survivor and Dead Aim were right there. Then shut her down. See, this is what I'm talking about. This is what happened at the end of Apocalypse. So how did she wrest control away from Dr. Isaacs in the first place? Later, the movie will show Alice resisting the control, but that's never explained as the reason why she was able to break it the first time. And nobody in Umbrella seems to have a clue about what happened before, either. Actually, this is not what happened at the end of Apocalypse. They allowed her to escape purposefully. And on that note, this film showing you that she can break free of the control is the answer you are looking for, numbnuts. They also show, in this scene, that a satellite is required to be in position for her to be controlled, and they'd have to know her position, something they'd only know if she used her powers. Jesus, this movie is not this hard to understand. It was written by Paul Anderson. Please don't go to space and show us the... God damn it. But that's the answer. You know what? Never mind. Why didn't you shoot? Not driving to Alaska. Luckily, nearly the entire convoy died so that a helicopter is now practical. Also, the plan is to steal the helicopter, which is flying to the Umbrella compound, which is surrounded by zombies. Rather than make the drive, which seems way safer, Alice would rather risk everyone's lives trying to get the remaining crew on the helicopter. When you think about it, this is actually the better option. Sure, you'd have to muscle through a horde of zombies, but driving to Alaska from Vegas requires you to potentially hazard bandits, dwindling resources that require dangerous stops, and vehicle maintenance, all of which can get you hemmed up in this universe. This only requires one dangerous mission, and then you're literally flying peacefully in the air and getting to your destination in hours, not weeks. Good thing we like a challenge. Or you can just use your psychic powers. That seems like something I'm thinking a lot. No, you're not thinking at all. She struggled killing birds. Now you're talking about a more numerous and larger enemy type. You're literally asking her to kill herself to save herself. While this explosion is impressive and everything, it doesn't blow up nearly the amount of zombies this movie wants you to believe, even in this shot. But when Alice is ready to hit the gas, the zombies are cleared out completely. But see, you manipulated this scene to make it look like there were no zombies as they drove in. The tail end of the scene shows there were still zombies near the explosion. I don't doubt Claire can fly a helicopter. It's just that the movie has never made that skill explicit. How is this not them making that skill explicit right now? 
Do you always need two scenes, one saying I can do a thing and then another showing them doing that thing? Doesn't simply showing they can kill two birds with one stone? Hell, what about this version of Claire Redfield suggests she can't fly a helicopter? I mean, her commanding a convoy, especially one that included Carlos, suggests military training at minimum. Alice steps on the floorboard and the secret elevator shaft magically opens four. Feels like if you were creating a secret elevator, it wouldn't be this easy to expose. And how did she make the elevator come up to her so that she could go back down? There wasn't a control panel in sight. It's very obvious that opening the floor summons the elevator. Otherwise, what would be the point of the doors opening besides being an easily avoidable hazard? I knew your sister. She was a homicidal bitch. Why does the artificial intelligence even need a sister? Is it because the first actress grew up and they still needed a little British girl to give exposition? Jeremy, I don't think the movie is actually saying the White Queen is the Red Queen's sister. Alice, good luck. Send help. They trap me inside this computer and make me pretend to be artificial intelligence. I need you to find a hacker named Wah! Whatever the hell that was. Crazy that this floor has such shoddy workmanship that Alice can stomp the floorboard and catapult this knife into the air. I guess you just forgot this woman has super strength. Oh yeah, my psychic powers that I will only use in the final battle. Which is the perfect place to use them. Seriously, have you ever played a video game? You save the high risk, high reward stuff for bosses. You would definitely be the guy that uses a master ball on an oddish. Sure, you've sliced him. You've psychic powered him through a wall. But let's see if kicking and punching works. Super strength. <laughs> Alice clone next machina. Also, how did clone Alice even know to get up, go to the computer, and stop the killer laser in the first place? How does she know what keys to press? Oh my god, Alice is a Mary Sue. How are you only now questioning this stuff after two movies of her demonstrating she has intimate knowledge of Umbrella's technology and facilities? I swear, when it comes to sequels, you take stupid pills and just forget all the shit you saw previous. The research will continue under my personal supervision. Oh, you won't have to wait that long, boys. Go to the conference room to have an extra chair ready for any asshole who might want to tap into this hologram meeting. You mean like Isaac's chair? You know, because this is his facility, something you saw earlier? Scratch what I said in the last sin. This dude takes stupid pills while watching a single movie. Forty seconds of two logos. It's actually 38 seconds of logos. I thought rounding up was a sin. Tara tells Amber her f***ing landline won't stop ringing, and Amber asks, is Wes still bugging you? And I'm like, why would a guy who has a crush on you call the f***ing landline? Is he a robocaller? Yep, you're showing your age. Wes clearly got blocked on the smartphone, so they're assuming he's using the landline instead. The real sin is using a landline in 2022. What's your favorite scary movie? Uh, The Babadook. It's an amazing meditation on motherhood and grief. <laughs> okay, what? I mean, the analysis is spot on, but who the f*** talks this way? Especially to a stranger. I know, it's ridiculous, right? But not quite as ridiculous as that laugh. Would you like to play a game, Tara? It's hard to understand why the killers in these movies are so beholden to the classic Scream structure. It has never worked out for anybody in these movies. But these killers keep reading about the Woodsboro murders and watching stab movies, and they think this is the best course of action every single time. They keep telling themselves, maybe this time it'll be different. If you subscribe to the notion that the phone calls unsettle the victim to the point they make silly mistakes and that it gives Ghostface time to get into position, it totally works. Ask me about It Follows, ask me about Hereditary, ask me about The Witch. Trying to dictate the questions a murderer asks and finding any reason to slip in your horror snobbery. Sure, it does sound like snobbery when you remove the scene from its context. Earlier we were made aware that Tara is a fan of actually good horror movies. This means she doesn't watch schlock horror films that come out in January. Which is... Which is a little awkward when talking about this film, but stick with me here. Her point was that she doesn't watch bad movies, and Ghostface was asking her questions about movies she hadn't seen. A non-answer counts as a wrong answer, Tara. Cheating! Wouldn't considering a non-answer as a correct answer be considered cheating, though? This is a clever and suspenseful tactic, but it's also a computers can be f***ed with and conveniently circumvented whenever it's needed for the plot cliche, my hands are tied. But you can always just ding the ding and not raise the sin counter, though. Calling the fifth movie in your franchise Scream when Five Green was on the table. But seriously, quit calling sequels the same goddamn thing as the first film in your franchise. Do you want another confusing franchise like Halloween? Because this is how you get ants. I mean another confusing franchise like Halloween. So I'm writing this video after, but releasing it before the next video in this series. And in that video, I agree with Jeremy on this concept. So the sin here isn't for my own anachronisms. It's for suggesting Five Cream would be a good title for this film when Scream 5 was right there. Wait, wait, hey, hey, hey. 
I'm going with you. It is of extreme importance that Richie goes with Sam for the rest of the movie for everything to go according to plan. What if Sam refuses to let him come with her? In fact, since Sam and Tara aren't on the best of terms, what if Sam just said f*** it and didn't go herself? There are easier ways to set all this up without relying on all this coincidence, but Scream 5 said f*** it, we're doing it live! Bill O'Reilly. Is that... Vince. Vince is Liv's stalker who just so happens to make his first public stalking appearance the day after Tara's almost murdered, so that we, the audience, can have a suspect that will almost certainly cancel out immediately. I think the filmmakers are smart enough to know that no one who is watching the fifth film in this franchise will think the stalker is the killer. It's always someone in the friend group, and in the case of Scream 3, the film group. Probably time to introduce him to Hobbs and Shaw. Naming your arms after a weak spin-off of a tired franchise. Jeremy inadvertently sends TV sins. And every decade or so, some idiot gets the bright idea to put on the mask, kill his friends, and get famous too. Every decade? The first three Scream films take place in a window of like four years. And Scream 4 happened roughly a decade after the last movie, but it was the only time a full decade had passed until now. I know that's a huge nitpick, but try to get it right, assholes. I'm pretty sure Sam is referring to the murders that happened in Woodsboro, which were from 1996 to 2011, and then from 2011 to 2021. Scream 2 takes place in Ohio, and Scream 3 takes place in Los Angeles. Look, guys, it's one thing for a demonic spirit in a horror movie to run past the camera so the audience will be disturbed of their presence. They're evil spirits. They don't know any better. It's completely another when a totally human killer does it for absolutely no goddamn reason. But in the diegetic perspective, there is no camera, and Ghostface is just running behind this dude to get into position for a kill. That's you, pretty boy! This f***ing guy. I like Kyle Gallner, but why is this character? Yeah, he ends up being related to Stu Mocker, but they could have just as easily had one of the friend group be related to Stu. You'll never convince me this character wasn't thrown in for any other reason other than an extra kill to add to the count. This is the most pointless killing in a slasher film since Johnny Galecki, and I know you did last summer. Isn't that, like, par for the course in these movies? I mean, why the heck did Tatum have to die in the original? She had the best breasts in the franchise. What are you watching? Oh, uh... Stabs on Netflix. Watching a movie on your phone. Which is an incredibly valid thing to do. I mean, what do you watch on the treadmill? Oh. Ah, sudden skeet. Also fine, she's Billy Loomis's daughter, I don't care. But what I do care about is that anyone thought having this Billy ghost around was a good idea. I don't know, man. It worked out pretty well for the next two movies. My only problem is that they didn't use good de-aging technology on skeet. Man looks his age. Your mom was dating dad, but... She was in love with this other guy, and he got her pregnant. That other guy is Billy Loomis, who, come on. Billy died in 1996, even if he impregnated his side piece in late 1996 while planning the Woodsboro murders, and Sam was born in 1997, this doesn't work. Sam left five years ago at the age of 18 on her birthday, according to the obvious killer, Amber. It's currently September of 2021, since we saw the date on the portable phone earlier, and it's been a decade since 2011. So she's 23 in late 2021, that means the earliest she could have been born was 1998. I love the math you did there. I really do. Because you're right. However, the sin here is for suggesting Amber is the obvious killer. I know you like to pretend you're more observant than you are, but I don't think there is anyone that pegged Amber at this point in the film. I mean, I hate the fact that Amber even is the killer. Mikey Madsen is 5 f***ing 3. In what universe is this chick not visibly short enough that she's immediately outed as Ghostface? And the fact that she's like 115 pounds tops but goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with a trained male police officer. Frankly, Chucky is more believable. It doesn't freak you out that my real father was a serial killer? Not when you're hot. Jeremy yells at the screen cliche. Also, no woman is hot enough when her dad is a serial killer. Imagine bringing her home too late. Something about this one just feels different. It's not. He says, even though Dewey dies in this one. You go on 4chan and dread it. All they're talking about is how Stab 8 pissed on their childhoods. In this world, Ryan Johnson directs Stab 8, the same chapter of Star Wars he did. Any toxic fan base in this universe trashed it as it did in ours. It's a whole scene dedicated to explaining why this movie is pretty much the same as the previous chapters, while adding things that appear new to make it seem fresh. But in the process of doing the same old you just end up disappointing the fan base anyway, who endlessly compare the new movie to the ones they cherish. Why not do some holdo maneuvers? Do some real damage! I get the connections you just tried to make, but unlike The Last Jedi, this movie was very well received by critics and the audience. So it appears you were just trying to let us know about the Ryan Johnson connection, I guess. What I'm saying is, this was a waste of our time. You can't just reboot a franchise from scratch anymore. The fans won't stand for it. Black Christmas, Child's Play, Flatliners... Calling Black Christmas or Flatliners a franchise. Even if I granted you the ridiculousness that two Flatliner movies don't make up a franchise, there are three Black Christmas films. How the hell can you justify three movies not being a franchise? 
Dewey is giving Sam this look implying she could be the killer, but she has already established herself to Dewey as the Sydney character in this story. Anyway, I don't believe for a second he would suspect her, so why is this look? After five of these damn incidents, you would think you'd grant Dewey some leeway. He's gotten fooled, maimed, or hospitalized by every single one of the killers up to that point. If I were Dewey, I wouldn't trust my reflection. I like daylight horror as much as anyone, but the idea that no one sees this happening is ludicrous. The loud police sirens on the drive up to the house would have gotten at least a few of the neighbors' attention. But what indication does the film give you that no one sees this? Isn't that an assumption? Is the killer going to be behind the door when Wes closes it? No. Is the killer going to be behind the refrigerator door when he closes it? No. You see, you new and fun stuff like that is how you make your mark on the Scream franchise, giving nothing to the people who are expecting something. Wait, aren't you the same guy that got upset that Halloween 2018 wasn't as suspenseful as you wanted it to be? Trust me, this, this end will make sense when you guys see the next video. The organization of this freezer is a nightmare. There's a Choco Taco box. Skip. And don't even get me started on Ghostface's signature new weapon. People who make a living tearing movies apart on YouTube. Sinning yourself. Which is my job. Also, did the real-life Stu Mocker survive? It's just an innocuous conspiracy theory YouTube video, right? Couldn't possibly be a hint at a future screen plot line, right? Since I'm making this video in 2023, I have the knowledge of the future, and no, that didn't happen. Unless, of course, they do that for Scream 7, in which case I'd much prefer if they actually bring back Angelina than Stu. Also, Tara is watching an episode of Dawson's Creek called The Scare, and it's an episode that directly references the 1996 Scream, along with I Know What You Did Last Summer, and many other horror films. But Scream would not exist within this universe, since these are the Scream films we're watching. So how in the f*** would this episode of Dawson's Creek exist within this universe? This is like that Time Cop moment where both of the Ron Silvers meet and start melting into each other. And this scene does not contain a Ron Silver melting. Do you honestly believe this wasn't done on purpose? Movies do this all the time. It's called a nod. This same thing happened in Into the Spider-Verse, where they acknowledged Donald Glover's scene as Spider-Man in Community, which wouldn't make sense considering Peter Parker was a real person in that universe, and in the Community episode, Peter was a comic book character. Then on top of that, Donald Glover appeared as the Prowler in the sequel. It's incredible how many times Tara's been scared by a phone ringing. In this franchise, I don't think that's incredible at all. For anyone that was wondering how Ghostface activated a voice box while in costume, and to be clear, no one was f***ing wondering this. Why would the killer ever turn it off while in costume? Also, this is one of those annoying details added in a movie that some people actually blame us for. So here's a sin to thinking a silly comedic YouTube channel could affect the way a script is written for a valuable franchise property. Is that another humble brag? I mean, come on, CinemaSins is a huge YouTube channel, and it's not like big YouTube channels are unknown in the film space. Speaking of JLC, did you see that video where she and the Daniels were talking about us? Play that, Ian. Play that yeah. Sometimes we like to leave mistakes for the fans. So okay, well, I was just wondering. Yeah, in. yeah exactly. I will be quiet. We kept telling Oh, is that why a movie looks like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> mistakes for the fans. For the fans. I love, I love when, know. You, you know that YouTube channel, like, uh, what is it? Movie Sins or whatever? Cinema, Cinema Sins? Oh, I love yeah. Cinema Sins. I hate it. <laughs> we, we like to leave things in for them, you know, just oh, to make yeah. sure. It, our, right. We want our Cinema Sins to be very long. Yeah. Lots of things for them to call so out. Some smug yeah. guy can be like, the clock is different. But didn't you guys literally get into a spat with the director for Kong Skull Island? Why do you pretend you have no effect when you clearly do? Sure, sure, when I'm about to murder someone, I always get distracted by my phone. Distracted murdering accounted for a whopping 175% loss in productivity last year, and it's getting worse. Looking at the graph... All this goofy shit over this iconic scene. Also, part of me wants to remove a sin for these directors having the balls to kill a character that has survived seven of these goddamn killers already. But then to realize that of all the killers, f***ing Amber is the one that gets him really kind of ruins the moment. Yeah, I agree. I just can't see a chick that isn't even tall enough to buy drinks at 7-Eleven overpowering a 5-Eleven man that was formerly a police officer. Like, is no one else bothered by these height differences? The other killer is 6'1". He's almost literally a foot taller than his accomplice. How is no one noticing this shit in-universe? An hour and eight minutes to bring Sidney Prescott back into a Scream film. Wait until you see Scream 6. That one takes a whole contract dispute. I tried running too. It doesn't work. It always follows. So wait, is Sidney saying this is a low-key sequel to It Follows? No, she's not. Moving on. Since we know that Amber was the one in the ghost face outfit when Dewey shot her, how did she make a recovery so quick that she's hosting a party, walking around like she doesn't have any bullet wounds? Did that just not happen because she survived? Granted, we don't know how much time has passed since the hospital incident, but it can't be a recover from bullet wounds length of time. I guess she could have been wearing a bulletproof vest, but we never see one, and Scream movies love showing off those bulletproof vests when they're in play. We never saw she had on a bulletproof vest? Well then what the hell was this? You know what else you shouldn't do when there's a masked killer around? What? Follow someone into a dark, creepy basement alone. 
But the basement wasn't dark and creepy anymore when Misty came down. It was light and creepy. You turned the light on when you got to the fridge. This isn't the admonishment you think it is. Cool, cool. Uh, who the hell is Misty? How do you know I'm not the killer? How does anyone not know she's the killer? She has, from the second time her phone was used slash cloned, been the most likely suspect. These new characters might be fun, but they're also very stupid. Again, she is 5'3". Even if I granted her a few inches in boots, she was standing eye to eye with Dewey in their fight scene. Anyone watching this movie that suspected Amber was just throwing names out there and got lucky. Wanna go upstairs? Don't take this the wrong way. But I, I think I have to pass on that. Dude, Ghostface kills when wearing the suit, not when naked and having sex. At least, not that we've ever seen. But we did see Stu barge in on Billy and Sydney after doing the deed. So, still counts. Don't, don't never do it. Don't go outside after her. Considering Chad turned down sex with Liv because he felt the safest option was to be downstairs around all the people, why would he go outside, where f***ing no one is, to look for Liv? If you were going to do this, you should have just had the sex, Chad. I'm almost willing to send the fact that you don't end up dying in this installment. Wait until you see the next film. F***ing nobody dies. We're just going to sit here and watch a movie about our uncle getting stabbed. For the record, Randy was shot in the first Scream film, which is what the first Stab film is based on. He was stabbed and killed in Scream 2. So this sin is either for the first Stab film not being accurate, or it's a sin for Chad not knowing what really happened to his uncle, or Mindy not correcting him. Let's just give two and move on. There's another or here. Or they're marathoning the Stab films, and he's referring to when they get to the second movie. I'll go in quickly and get it. I'll be back in five. So nobody called Amber on the way here to make sure Tara's inhaler was ready? I know she's a murdering psychopath, but they don't know that. I mean, Richie literally does know that. You're in Stu Mocker's house where your dad and Stu killed everyone. Someone planned to get you there. You need to get the f*** out, Sam. This is a perfectly fine idea for a setting at the end of a Scream sequel, but it's a ridiculous reveal. There's no way none of the non-killers weren't aware of this until now. Mindy would 100% know that Amber lives in this infamous house. I'm almost positive Sam would not know this, considering she's not related to Stu and she left Woodsboro a long time ago specifically to forget the fact that she was related to Billy. Tara literally told us in the beginning that she had never seen the stab films to the point Point that she was unaware there were two killers, so how would she know? What did you do to her? What the f Someone in a ghost face outfit just left this room, somehow found a private area, pulled the costume off, and came back to make it appear they weren't the killer. And I can't prove that you can't do that, but that constant putting on and pulling off of the outfit has to be goddamn exhausting, right? So the sin is for tiredness? There are always two killers. Well, only four fifths of the time. I mean, that's probably close enough, but close enough isn't good enough for the Sins brand, Richie. Thanks for trying. Maybe next time. Damn that. Angelina was the accomplice in Scream 3. That's my sin and I'm sticking to it. Sydney has no idea if someone innocent is hiding in this closet, but shoots a bullet into it anyway. Well, it is Sydney freaking Prescott. She's been screwed over so many times, I don't blame her for shooting into the blind. If I were her, I wouldn't trust the closet either. Or people that draft contracts. Oh, this isn't Amber. I'm the other one. This seems like a weird thing for Richie to say, since Sydney would have zero clue who Amber is. Did you forget that Amber just put a bullet in Gale? Now, I know we live in a time where just having the name Amber doesn't mean you're a 5'3 girl, but I think in this instance, it's safe to say it was the chick shooting at her. I mean, what the f***, Sydney? Yelling at the screen cliche. I can't believe this worked. Serial killer would be amazing at cinema sits. Wait. Ah, that's why your fans are raving lunatics. That really was the best choice for the movie. Let's talk about how impossible it is that Richie and Amber are the killers by taking it back to the first scene where Tara was on the phone with Richie, who was showing live video of Amber on the phone call. Richie was with Sam that night. He told Dewey this in front of her and she didn't object. I do enjoy the acceptance of he was with Sam that night as if this franchise hadn't already pulled this stunt before. Remember Casey Becker? When Stu and Billy killed her, Tatum backed up the claim that Stu was with her at the time of the murder, which we know was impossible. So my point is it's possible Richie linked up with Sam later as an alibi, the same thing Stu did in the original. The daughter of Billy Loomis who sees f***ed up visions of her dead dad? Did Sam tell Richie about her visions? I'm pretty sure she told everyone about Billy being her dad, but nothing about Skeet Ulrich in a rearview mirror. Since Richie was the ghost face that attacked her at the hospital, he clearly overheard her talking to her dad in the scene she was hallucinating. He also knows she takes antipsychotics. Wasn't that hard for me to find you in Modesto? And apparently it wasn't that hard to get her to like you either. This whole plan relies on Richie being so irresistible that Sam starts dating him. What was the plan if she didn't? I mean, he's six foot one, handsome, and white. Right. And if dating apps are anything to go by, the real question you should be asking is why doesn't he have all the hoes? Tara's plan is to hit Amber over the head with a crutch. And then what? You're putting everyone in the kitchen in danger by doing this, and you've already seen how Amber took several bullets and survived earlier. Frankly, I don't even think you saw that scene, considering you think she actually got shot there. <laughs> 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 
Seriously, nobody laughs like this. Luffy took out Jasmine Savoy Brown for the whole climax when they should have let her stay conscious that whole time and be awesome and do Jasmine Savoy Brown stuff. What the hell was this? I mean, she's incredibly hot and should probably DM me on Instagram, but you talk like she's some extremely accomplished actor that's too good for this movie or something. The reveal that Chad is alive shows how terrible Amber and Richie were at killing people. I almost hit you with a, wait, what was that? At the hilarious attempt at pronouncing the word were, but I'm far more distracted by the fact you think Amber was terrible at killing people. I remind you, she went toe to toe with Dewey and won. This role should have been played by Emily Mortimer. Gotcha. <laughs> gotcha. 55 seconds of logos. Also Comcast and Miramax. All right, that's just padding the send count, bro. I mean, the Comcast and Miramax logos were included in the 50 seconds of logos gag that literally nobody except you cares about. Well, they didn't give Aaron Corey an apple, that scarf might as well be one because it makes him look straight up like an asshole. Sending someone for trying to keep warm in Midwest fall. For years he's been kept here to be studied. I suppose the state has lost interest in discovering anything further. I get this is supposed to be a direct sequel to the original 1978 film, but Michael Myers disappeared at the end of that film after Dr. Loomis SHUT HIM SIX TIMES! So how did Michael get back to the hospital? And yeah, yeah, they try to retcon it a bit with the Hawkins character, but f*** you, movie! And you better f***ing believe this will not be the only time I bring up why this being a direct sequel to the original doesn't f***ing work at all. I'm very heavily inclined to agree with you here. I absolutely detest the bullshit they tried to pull with this series, which culminated in Halloween Ends, which doesn't actually end the series because they're producing yet another unrelated Halloween. However, I do have a problem with you skipping over that they did try to explain some things. So I'll ding the ding, but won't raise the sin counter. Oh, make no mistake, he's aware. He was watching you as you arrived. How? Maybe one thing they discovered about Michael Myers was that he literally has eyes in the back of his head? Or eyes connected to the security cameras when they drove up? Considering the film didn't show the shape until now, the doctor could be speaking literally and Michael simply turned around, which makes movie sense since they don't show his face. Or you could take this as the shape is just cosmically aware, being that he's almost certainly supernatural. Right? When I said this a few years ago, people lost their marbles. But there's no way you watch these movies and come to the conclusion that Michael Myers isn't a low-level superhuman. That's entirely why we call him The Shape. He isn't a person, he's the personification, or the shape, of evil. And this was said by John Carpenter himself. So eat a dick, audience. I've been following your case for years and still know very little about you. Probably because all he did was kill his sister and then years later showed back up and killed a trucker, a couple of teenage girls, and some horny dude named Bob who may or may not have been a pedophile. I mean, his murder spree story wouldn't even get a whiff from my favorite murder. So why is this podcast bothering with it? Now, if you had nine more movies worth of murders... I see where you're going with this, but actually I disagree. Michael was already a patient since he was a child for killing his sister. That in and of itself was worthy of dissecting, but then he escapes, goes on another unexplained killing spree, gets shot multiple times, and doesn't die? I'm sorry, but 50 Cent got famous for less. You feel it, don't you, Michael? You feel the mask. No, no, he sees it, remember? Yet again, more evidence that Michael is supernatural. Also, we're really going to say Michael has this big connection to a mask he stole from a hardware store back in 1978? Yes. Next question. Also times three. This might make for great television, but it would make for a terrible f***ing podcast. You'd just hear some guy saying bullsh** like this, and he could be in his mom's basement reciting this as far as you know. He is standing with and talking to one of the world's most notorious serial killers. I gotta say, I'd thoroughly enjoy listening to this over men versus women rants or a Joe podcast. Button or Rogan, you choose. Also, out of 11 films, we have three named simply Halloween? This seems, well, this seems f stupid. Should have just bit the bullet and called it Halloween H40, because it's one Josh Hartnett and a girl from the creek away from being just that. No, I agree. I hate this naming convention, and it's so prevalent in media. You know, like Doom, Scream, and Shaft. The only positive thing I can say is that at least it's not DMC Devil May Cry. That game is literally named Devil May Cry, Devil May Cry. $3,000 sound. Whoa, whoa, why start at $3,000? Why not try like a thousand first and see if that does the trick? Movie doesn't know how to lowball. Probably because they're not pieces of shit that are trying to get over on someone? Imagine thinking not lowballing someone is sinful. I think even the devil is shaking his head at you. I believe in Michael Myers, a deranged serial killer, but the boogeyman. 
he's not a serial killer, right? Especially if we're, let's all say it together now, making this a direct sequel to the original film. Maybe a spree killer or simply a mass murderer, but not a serial killer, since he killed just about everyone in the same goddamn place and with one exception on the same goddamn day. According to the definition provided by the FBI and the fact that Mike killed his sister years before the second event, he is by definition a serial killer. I showed him the mask. It was nothing. No response. Nothing. With the exception of a random gust of wind, a bunch of other inmates cackling at a dog barking. But yeah, nothing out of the ordinary. But that's moving the goalposts. He didn't say any of those events you mentioned didn't happen. He said he got no reaction out of Michael. Wasn't it her brother who, like, cold-blooded murdered all those teenagers? Murdered. What? I kind of like that portmanteau. He murdered someone and mutilated others. Kind of like what I do with your videos. No, that's just a bit that some people made up to make him feel better, I think. Why would Michael being Lori's brother make people feel better? Of all the reasons people would make up about a story, why would making them feel better be the first thing you think of? This is the I did it to protect you of urban legend coping. Well, that line does make sense when you think about it for more than a few seconds. The shape goes around killing people seemingly for no reason at all after returning from a mental institute that he was placed for killing his sister. So the fact he does kill his sister makes people think the reason he went after Lori is that he was the sister killer. This makes people feel better in the sense of them being able to make sense of what happened. It's similar to the way people treat your videos and the way they react to mine. You've never claimed you were satirical, but somehow it makes people feel better about making a channel as silly as yours so big if they but believe that you are kidding about everything you say. We consider ourselves a comedy channel, uh, first and foremost. Uh, and, you know, there was a famous director who didn't like us and then people defended us by telling me we were satire and then he went off on the word satire and the definition of that word and i have never publicly claimed that we are satire i have never publicly claimed that we are satire you are living proof of a coping mechanism spread through false information Ah, Jamie Lee Curtis. Let us not forget the everything everywhere all at once video where Jeremy started dick riding Jamie after she said she loved cinema sins. I just think it's funny how fake people change up, that's all. I guess it's a heavy night for Haddonfield hospital transfers, huh? Weird they decided that Michael Myers and a whole bunch of his fellow patients needed to get moved on the same night. I don't think that's weird at all, and I'd go as far as to suggest it's efficient. Besides, we all saw the opening of this movie where they show they treat Michael the same as everyone else. You only think he's special because he's the antagonist of a film you're watching. Yeah. Judy Greer looks as f***ing irritated as I am that she's being wasted in yet another terrible movie. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I have my gripes with the direction they took the Laurie Myers connection, but who said anything about this movie being terrible? That is not an opinion held by the majority of fans, and this is quite literally the best of the new trilogy. I mean, I get that they didn't think the bus was going to crash and Myers would escape, but... And let me stop you right there, because that is pretty damn good reasoning. Michael hadn't tried to escape in over 40 Halloweens. They had no reason to believe he would try this particular one. He continued stabbing. And as we sinned before and will sin again, he curiously looked up at the knife instead of the person he was stabbing. Actually, what you said was that he was stabbing the air, not that he looked at the knife. You know since we're nitpicking. Let's face it, the only reason the podcasters existed in this movie was for exposition and to be murder fodder for Michael Myers so he could get his mask back. And you're saying this is a bad thing? I see why you think this movie sucks. You don't know how to Halloween. You have no security system, Karen. Sure, Lori broke into their house to prove a point. I just don't know why she didn't just make a phone call and explain that Michael is on the loose first. And I'm not sure why she thought this would win Karen over. Well, the reason she didn't do that is because the family treats her as if she's crazy. Every time she brings up Myers, everyone tries to make her look unhinged. You would have seen that had you paid attention to the dinner scene. I saw him. The shape. Mom. I wanted to kill him. Okay, that's enough, Lori. That's enough, Lori. Okay, I think maybe this is a little bit too much for you, huh? Why don't we go for a walk, all right? I can't. Mom, look at me. Look at me. I... Should we, uh... I really hate to say I told you so, but... Now you tell me. Does this look like a couple of people that would take a phone call from Lori seriously? Hey man, you were just at a gas station in an auto mechanic shop. You couldn't have picked up a weapon there? Or do you have rules about carrying weapons with you to your killing site? Just think, if this tool shed isn't left comically open during Halloween, then what? Oh, come on. This movie showed you the shape has preferences. It's entirely why he hawked down the podcasters to retrieve his mask. He prefers to kill with a chef's knife. 
don't have my stethoscope. Oh, I need it. I'm going to get it. I'll be right back. You're not going to believe that they were in my pocket the whole time. They meaning your stethoscope? You went back in to get a stethoscope and they were in your pocket the whole time? I get the they part of your criticism, but you're clearly unaware that a stethoscope can fit in a doctor's coat pocket. I am not for one minute going to believe that a woman that is this into Halloween isn't dressed up and doesn't have any decorations inside the place. She just carved 67 pumpkins and put them on the front porch, but otherwise she's not obsessed or anything. Who the heck decorates the inside of their house for Halloween? Isn't the whole purpose to decorate the outside to attract trick-or-treaters? And no, the people on Instagram that begin shopping for Halloween stuff during the 4th of July don't count. Also, while it's disturbing that Michael is killing a bunch of randos in this neighborhood, it's done with the least amount of suspense possible. It's a fun one-shot and everything, but in the original Halloween, Michael seemed almost curious about who he was killing. Creeping around in the shadows and the edges of the frame, his presence always felt even when he wasn't there. This is just murder porn. But isn't that the point? In the original Halloween, we were completely unfamiliar with the character, and that added to the mystery and mythology of that character. This is after 40 years of Halloween films where we all know everything there is to know about the character. So the reason people went to the theaters was specifically to watch the shape put these mofos in a blender. Oh no, the closet door won't close. That's a closet's main function. It's right there, right in the word. Anyway, I'm sending this because does anybody remember what Hitchcock said about suspense? Something to the effect of if you're having a conversation and a bomb blows up, that's a surprise. But if the audience knows there's a bomb while they're having a conversation, that's suspense. Somehow this scene invokes neither surprise nor suspense. <laughs> So let's go back to this scene for a second. Dave starts up the motorbike creating a loud noise, which would make anyone who's ever seen a horror movie realize when Vicky calls for Dave, he won't hear her. However, he's already tipped the bike over and can hear her perfectly fine. So why'd the movie even bother with that if the noise wasn't ever going to be a factor? It would have been classic horror movie trope nonsense, but goddammit, it's our kind of horror movie trope nonsense. But I have you over numerous videos sending the character can't hear anything because of headphones slash loud noise trope. So forgive me if I don't believe you would have actually liked that. Movie wants us to believe that Michael recognizes Lori, a random babysitter he stalked one night 40 f***ing years ago. Halloween purists can call the plot twist dumb all they want, but do you know the only way this scene works? He's her f***ing brother and Halloween 2 actually f***ing happened! I agree, and simultaneously dislike that you're padding the sin count because it's something we already knew would happen from the beginning. I guess you know what that means. I'm Michael's doctor, Ranbir Sartain. You're the new Loomis. I love how this movie just throws Sam Loomis' name around like everyone knows who that is. Like there are people out there that would use that name for a f***ing Twitter handle or something. It's called fan service, Jer. And considering I already mentioned there had been 11 movies over 40 years at this point, there are people that caught on to this. Not everyone is CinemaSins, and thank Zeus for that. Do you know that I pray? every night that he would escape. That sounds insane. Sounds like you have a reason for that. Why would you just stop before giving the reason? Well, for all intents and purposes, the shape has driven Lori up a wall. She's clearly not a well-adjusted individual and is completely different to how she was in 1978. And nobody listens to her anyway, so I would also dramatically pause if I were her. You see, this is what has intrigued me through my studies. How does a crime like Michael's affect him? That is really interesting. Is this not almost the same point you were making about the suspense behind the shape's killings? I'm confused. Do you want the mystery or the murder porn? I'm a doctor. Lock your doors. <laughs> that would make about as much sense as me saying, I'm a dick on YouTube. Make sure you eat a sandwich. Ridiculous, right? But not as ridiculous as that laugh. All right, pick your poison. I like a revolver. They never jam. That's 100% not true. The cylinder gaps can get blocked and prevent the cylinder from rotating and or the axle can begin to unthread as you shoot, just to name a couple things. Nice copy pasta. Your wife's boyfriend write that for you? While it's true that revolvers can theoretically jam, in practice, it's an incredibly rare event that usually results from not properly caring for the firearm. When something is exceedingly rare, it's okay in common parlance to say never. Get away from the body! Stand back! I'm not gonna say it again. Step away from the suspect. Step away. Yes! Man, just f the stupid f twist so hard. And yet again, we're killing off the most interesting characters in the movie. Since f***ing when are the cops the most interesting characters in a Halloween film? Look, I love Remember the Titans, I do, what with all the racism and such, but just because you like the actor doesn't mean their character was at all interesting. I mean, didn't Guy Pearce in Iron Man 3 teach you anything? Okay, supposedly Michael drives a cop car to Lori's place, and in the time it takes Ray to walk outside, he manages to get out of the car without being seen and stage a murder scene, where he's turned one of the cop's heads into a jack-o'-lantern. And I'm saying that the speed at which he did this, plus the know-how, is more terrifying than the act itself. Do you know how long it takes to hollow out a human head for this purpose? Like, a super long time. I could barely get through half of the job, or, I mean, I've never done anything like that before in my life, so what do I know? Uh, hello, FBI? Yeah, we found him. 
How? This movie seems to forget the podcasters were here and that we saw a giant cage door in front of the main door. We should be seeing some part of that cage coming through the glass at the very least. How did he punch through that and the glass? If he's that strong, he should have just battle ran the door down. And you seem to have forgotten Ray just opened that door to go outside to check on the dead cops and that all Lori did was close the wooden door from the inside upon seeing the shape in this scene. Yep, it's your grandmother's shooting range. It's not all that scary. Maybe just to you, but the audience saw this in the daylight, and it simply does not matter. Jeremy clearly has not played Resident Evil 7. I'm not saying a woman in her late 50s fighting a man in his early 60s can't be exciting, but I am saying this scene of a woman in her late 50s fighting a man in his early 60s is not exciting. Sinning this scene, that's worth these many sins. See, this is cool because she was looking down on him in the first- Skip! Imagine thinking this movie has sins, other than being incomplete. One minute and eleven seconds of logos! One minute and eleven seconds of logos! Do you know how long that is? It's one minute and eleven seconds! Still shorter than the intro to your Guardians of the Galaxy 3 video. Let's do things differently this time. Can we not? That last movie f ruled, so can't we just keep all the good stuff, like the music and the funky animation, and maybe just do less of the expositional character bot? His name is Miles Morales. Or maybe I could just go f myself. Yeah, you should, considering you're the guy that begins almost every video complaining about studio logos. You have no right to complain about someone playing the hits. You think you know the rest. You don't. Well, of course we f***ing don't. And I never said I did. You said I did. That's like me saying, You think you like rocks in your washing machine, but you don't. Fam, her line was literally a rebuttal to your previous sin, where you thought you knew what she was going to say. The rocks aren't in your washing machine, they're filling the void in your head. In this line of work, you always wind up a solo act. Don't hate on solo acts so quickly, Gwen. You can make more money, all the pretzels in the green room are for you, and... Um, did I mention the pretzels already? That sentence was a grammatical nightmare. And who cares that much about pretzels? I literally removed them from every bag of munchies because they ruin the flow. So I guess you chose violence today, huh, dumbass bird man? Touch him again, Ned. Ned? F***ing Ned. You assholes expect me to believe there's a universe where Ned, I'm looking at porn leads, is a bully? Shame on you. You're aware Ned Leeds was the original Hobgoblin, right? You're mistaking this character for the version in the MCU. It's almost like you don't get the concept of the multiverse and that variants of the same character can have different lives or something. Yeah, you're telling me. Who the f*** doesn't like pretzels? Naturally, Gwen's father just happens to be the first cop on the scene for maximum I hate Spider-Woman for killing my daughter's best friend drama potential. Cinema sins sure does sound new to movies, don't he? Suspect hey, this could be it. Tombs, also known so, as I, uh... This dispatcher mentions the vulture, but fails to mention the most striking update that he also appears to be origami-based. Think of it in terms of someone that isn't aware they're living in one universe out of many. They would simply assume it's another crazy scheme thought up by a Spider-Man woman villain. This is a terrible place to hide your super suit. I know parents aren't supposed to snoop, but surprise kids, they totally do. And pro tip, the drum kit is the first place they will look for drugs after... No, it's literally the first place they'll look. Considering most people don't own drums and therefore wouldn't even be aware that you could open them, I very highly doubt this. I mean, what the hell does the average person know about instruments? I played saxophone. You probably didn't know there's a spit valve to blow out the spit that accumulates in the horn, did you? Did you? Vulture! Screaming their name usually works. Ah! Worked. This works. She said it usually does, though. Oh, no. What was Gwen's plan if Oscar Spidey Zack didn't show up? Either she's just resigned herself to a new face, or she knew a Spidey ex machina was on the way. I'm going to go with the first, and then ask, what's the problem? If the first one were true, then she would have lost the fight, and that would be something that happens to spider people quite often in the comics. She has a healing factor. She'll be aight. We saved the multiverse! You left a hole wide enough for guys like him to randomly get shot into the wrong dimension! But if dealing with multiversal shenanigans is your strike team's M.O., why didn't your guys deal with Kingpin's Collider instead of leaving it to Gwen and Miles? Hmm? Was it because that movie didn't want to introduce you yet? Hmm? But they did. The first film showed Miguel at the very end. He literally just said the problem was they left a hole, so he only learned about it after the shenanigans in the first film. 
dude, you send that movie. Don't even get me started on Doctor Strange and a little nerd back on Earth 1999.99. Turns out that if you add 1999.99 to 616, you completely break the internet's understanding of something I don't care about. Damn all that. I'm giving you a sin for not acknowledging this movie correctly and rightfully shitting on the MCU for their stupid insistence on calling the MCU Earth 616. That completely contradicts the concept of Earth 199999 because that designation made it that completely contradicts the concept of Earth 199999 because that <laughs> I hate having to say Earth 199999. It's it's such a mouthful. That completely contradicts the concept of Earth. Oh, I, I should have. I shouldn't even wrote this. I should have said uh, something else. Damn all that. I'm giving you a sin for not acknowledging this movie correctly and rightfully shitting on the MCU for their stupid insistence on calling the MCU Earth 616. That completely contradicts the concept of Earth 199999 because that designation made it a part of the larger Marvel multiverse in our reality and confuses casuals for no reason. Oh, Dios, he's got hammer space. Beating. I was told there would be no math. This is why this movie is so baller. These little pop-ups are straight out of the comic books, where the writers and artists give context to a panel, or even a definition, such as this one for Hammerspace. These are things that should garner sin removals, but CinemaSins mistakenly believes they're funny, so we got stupidity instead. Also, an infinite pocket dimension where you can store gadgets and weapons seems super f***ing useful, and I look forward to seeing how our heroes utilize this technology to save the day. There's no way this is Jeremy's first time coming across Hammerspace. He's most definitely watched a Looney Tunes or Tom and Jerry cartoons, so he's feigning ignorance here. On top of that, he's assuming the heroes would have access to this ability, even though the scene just showed Miguel's surprise reaction to Vulture having this ability, meaning he doesn't himself. Don't let him out! He'll disrupt the cannon! Well, that's rich coming from a Sony movie. While I agree, I don't count the animated films. They actually include Spider-Man, and the genius behind the live-action Sony movies thinks we want to see Spider-Man-less Spider-Man movies. Seriously, who the f*** asked for Madam Web? Definitely the idiots that think the first Venom movie was good. I heard they also like corn on pizza. Suspect is armed. With what? I'm I'm out of webs. Get Gwen suffers from a case of the sudden inconveniences as she runs out of webs at the worst time possible, even though this won't happen at any other point in the movie. Uh, Jer? The worst time possible was when she was fighting a villain trying to kill her. This is her dad with a gun. I guess you forgot, but she's a Spider-Man. A guy with a gun is about as threatening as you are in the hood. Which is it? Hands in the air or get down on the You're ground? Up. Believing that it's impossible to get down on the ground and have your hands in the air. When a cop tells you to get on the ground, they're telling you to lie face down. So Gwen is right. These are contradictory commands. You have the right Dad, to return. Stop! Don't get any closer. He pulls his gun on his daughter. Arresting her is one thing, but he pulls a f***ing weapon on her. How do you come back from that, Dad? From his perspective, she's a fugitive wanted for the murder of Peter Parker. I don't care if she is his daughter. He's a man of the law, and she broke it. You are arguing for him to not do his job simply because they're related, and I don't like the idea of cops letting their relatives get away with crimes. 20 minutes in, and you're giving us more f***ing logos? Actually, it's worse than that, because these are the same logos we've already seen. Can I please glitch across the universe where this isn't a thing? Gonna cry? I'm sure he's gonna be here any minute spider-man movie has a spider-man that can never be on time for anything because they are always spider-manning around the city cliche but that's a part of being a superhero is that when you try to do the dual life thing one side suffers usually the real identity side this is why bruce wayne dates only fans models he doesn't have to commit okay if discount glados was really thinking with portals he'd realize that once he knows the location of the atm he can create the entry portal wherever he wants as long as it exits inside the atm he could make the portal outside, have it appear inside the machine, and then help himself. Or, you know, do this to a f***ing bank. But that's what the scene is trying to show you, that the spot is figuring out how his powers work and is currently testing them on an ATM. Dude, how the hell have you gotten away with pretending you know anything about film for this long? Why do people say ATM machine? Miles would be the MVP player at Acronym since... I hate to rag on my guy, Miles, but nobody says ATM machine. That's a boomer colloquialism. We currently call them simps. Okay, let's do this one last time. My name is Miles Morales. Don't make promises you can't keep, movie. I think it's silly to criticize a film for its running gag, especially considering it's a multiverse gag. I mean, how would you feel if I send you for the silly Prometheus school of running away from things gag or the Apple asshole connotation that doesn't make any sense? Probably pretty silly and sad. 
Silly sad. I guess host the Jeopardy. This scene is for our world or any world, no longer having the beautiful presence of one Mr. Alex Trebek. But Miles probably was still better than Ken Jennings. No, oh, that's too easy a task. I'm still sitting this. Wait, am I to understand that when you sin the Harry Potter franchise, you sin Richard Harris's death, but you want me to believe you're this broken up over Alex Trebek? And you're sending this movie because Alex died in real life? What does that have to do with Across the Spider-Verse? How is this not confusing? We love, love you and accept you. I know this is a daydream, but where the f*** did that sofa go? A moment of silence for Jeremy's last brain cell. Having an art book that doubles as a stalker book. It's not stalking if it's mutual. Ah, in a minute. Hey, I wrote it all as one word. That's cute, right? The youth. Well, at least you can make sense of his message. Took your ass three attempts to spell important. So typos and attempting to fix your typos are sins now? Besides, I don't blame him for turning off autocorrect. That ship ducks every being up. I'm not your guy in the chair. Trying to make a popular turn of phrase from another Spider-Man movie work in your Spider-Man movie. There are so many f***ing comics to adapt here. Why are we choosing to make these kind of callbacks instead of adapting some fresh material? Because the books don't matter. When Miles and his dad were texting earlier, it was 8.16, but the clock in this office now says 10.15, and I'm not buying that these three were willing to sit here for two hours. No one loves a kid that much. But you don't have to buy it. That's what they're showing. I don't get sins like these. A film shows you something happening and you go, this would never happen. It's like, but it did. Are you referring to reality? Do you think you're watching a movie about how things would happen in real life? Ah! Under control. Soon to be Captain Morales survives this. What was effectively a supernatural water slide? Yeah, I'm kinda in the middle of something. Then why did you pick up your phone? Because his wife called him? Listen, man, I know your eggplant is dry, but not answering a call from your wife is how it stays dry. You really don't remember what you did to me? Spot's mad at Miles for getting something that he couldn't possibly have known in the first place, and that is a thin premise for your multi-movie spanning Big Bad. Aw, look, baby's first Spider-Man story. You might as well complain about Spider-Sense not always working. I ran a test on this collider that brought a spider here from another dimension. My spider made you Spider-Man. Spot continues to be mad at Miles for sh** that he had little to no control over. It's not like the spider introduced itself and said, Oh, hey, Miles, some nerd brought me here from another dimension. Do you mind if I bite you instead of him? No, 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 no. This is exposition and an instance of when exposition is important to a film. You only included this in the video because this is important to the plot, not because you have an actual gripe with what is being depicted. So we have to sit here listening to a wafer thin double sin. I just don't want to lose him, you know? My mom lost me in a Best Buy once. Naturally, I found my way to all the TV. Skip. And she should have left your ass there, but still. Skip. And catch that holes guy. Asking someone else to do your job for you. I don't know if a being capable of dimensional travel is a job for the NYPD. I mean, they're tough, but they ain't built for tough. I think I kicked myself into myself. Just gonna ding this on behalf of all the scientists and philosophers who are spinning so hard in their graves that they could become particle accelerators themselves at any minute. We are doing that thing where the fiction part of science fiction seems to escape you again. Not a single bit of the past eight minutes has been realistic, but this is what sent you over the edge? Remind me what part of gaining spider abilities involves going invisible again. Wait, why is everyone in this universe tiny? I get that Lego pieces are tiny compared to us, but why wouldn't they just be regular sized in their own universe? Why wouldn't they be tiny? It's the multiverse, isn't it? Meaning that this particular Lego world is just as likely as a human sized Lego world, right? Even though we've had our ups and downs. Does he have to do this as Spider-Man? Okay, there's nothing explicitly saying who this cake is for, but there are only so many congrats on your promotion parties happening in Brooklyn. And I think he's leaving enough clues that this cake lady could have a convincing origin story right here. Bakers are like prostitutes. No matter how specific you are, they're very likely going to forget you because business is a booming. When is bold to drop in unannounced on a 15 year old in his bedroom? Or maybe it was deliberate and she's a much bigger creep than we realized. It's not stalking if it's mutual. Okay, so there's this lady, Jess Drew. Uh -huh. The idea that they could hear each other enough to have a casual conversation while swinging high above a busy and loud city is all the bullshit. Spider-Men have enhanced senses. This is why when Peter got his powers, he no longer needed glasses. Do you think that was limited to sight specifically? A vampire gun guy. I'd pay good money to see that. Sony still desperately trying to manufacture some goodwill for Morbius. Morbius is never going to be a thing. Stop trying to make Morbius a thing. What? It was one of the movies of all time. It made over one more billion dollars. Sitting in a position where all the blood flows to your head and you increase the chances of passing out and falling to your death.
Every single Spider-Man prefers to hang upside down. This is due to their physiology mutating to something similar to spiders, who also have no problem being upside down for prolonged periods. This is why you see this in nearly any media featuring the character. In every other universe, Gwen Stacy falls for Spider-Man. And in every other universe, it doesn't end well. Every? Every? This is one thing I wish multiverse movies would stop peddling. It's the, this event happens in every universe, no matter what nonsense. The whole point of multiverses is that every possible thing that could happen does happen somewhere. Did you or did you not question why Lego World wasn't the size of humans? I swear, every time you do a multiverse movie, you get even stupider, which is an accomplishment. Good job. Oh, no, 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 don't do that. Miles. All right. It's, uh, it's really Jeez. delicate. Sorry. No apology needed, Gwen. This asshole just started pressing random buttons on an interdimensional stabilizing bracelet doohickey like it was a f***ing boppet. This is on him. It's kind of also on her for not explaining the dangers of the object she just handed him. I, um, hope I didn't ice your game, man. No one my age says those words in that order, Mom. Yeah, Mom, what the kids really say is, man, I hope I game you, didn't I? Oof, that misunderstanding of Miles' words were almost as bad as Rio's attempt to be hip. He's saying out of the infinite words in the English language, his generation does not put those specific ones together. You have to promise to take care of that little boy for me. Make sure he never forgets where he came from, and he never doubts that he is loved. How could any of us possibly doubt that when the movie has spent the first billion minutes of its trillion minute runtime beating us to death with family woes? All this movie has been about so far is feelings and parents and feelings and parents and feelings and parents and blah! This is a fatal failure to understand this movie's message. The reason they've been beating you over the head with this concept is to hit home the reason Miles goes against his canon event, despite all evidence showing him why he shouldn't. It's almost like movies show you things for a reason and why Chekhov's gun is a thing. Miles just leaves his jacket, shirt, and shoes on these random fire escapes. And how is that practical? I don't know, but at least they got the flag right. This random guy standing in the dark with a dog and a camera ready to snap a picture in case Spider-Man happens to show up. This man thinks anyone after Gen X walks outside without their phones. Gwen's Spidey Sense, or Gwenny Gurgle, doesn't detect Miles sneaking up behind her. I mean, it's hard to send something that hasn't been fully explained, but see if that stops me. This would suggest that Gwen's Spider Sense goes off any time Miles is near her, and as we have evidence it doesn't, why exactly should it go off right now? Also, Gwenny Gurgle. All right, this is gonna work. Or vaporize me and everything in this building. Being okay with these odds. Can't be worse than potentially igniting the atmosphere and look how that turned out. Did you go see your little friend? What? No. Miles? I mean... Are you kidding me right now? Wait, Jess knew this was a possibility? If she knew this was Miles' universe and that Gwen has a history with him and that Miles f***s up the multiverse, why send Gwen and put temptation in her way? We'll find out there are hundreds, if not thousands, of spider people to choose from. There's no way she's the only option here. This is what happens when you don't allow the scene to fully play. You come to the wrong conclusions. A little later in the scene, Jessica implies that Miguel is unaware of Gwen being sent on this particular mission, and the overall implication is that Gwen requested this mission specifically. If Miguel finds out, I'd let you come. Don't tell Miguel. He'll kick me out and... What if he sends me home? And this is where the British stole all of our stuff! The British! Saying what the movie says and still sending the film for it. Really gotta come up with a cliche for that. It's English for we get along great and we're close friends. Saying something is English for, but then the explanation that comes after the for is also in English. You could have just gone with the British again, considering they do this shit all the damn time. They'll say some shit like, and then expect normal people to understand. All right, my name's Obi, Obi Brian. I was bitten by a... What did you like to know? Yeah, man. You sound like you're an amalgamation of every British stereotype ever, as long as that stereotype means you're from London. Sinning Hobarth Brownington the first. That's worth these many sins. I don't believe in teams. Aren't you in a band? I don't believe in consistency. Yeah, but if you consistently don't believe in consistency, then that means you're being consistent about something, right? Considering the fact he's in a band, that means he isn't consistently consistent about not believing in consistency. Besides, I'm pretty sure you can do something and not actually believe in it. Just ask evangelical preachers. Why are they all holding on to the same bit of string? Gwen single-handedly webbed a falling helicopter and you're all about to do the same to an entire building. This is the best plan you had to stop Spotted Dick? A, it was half a building. B, it took two Spider-Men to do it. And C, they failed to hold up that building. Sure, it looks cool, but do you really have time for posing when an entire building is falling on hundreds of people? Isn't it interesting when people forget the purpose of art? I think if you are a person that talks about art professionally, when you reach this level of jaded, you should probably hang it up.
it's not that they're posing, it's simply that they're doing a spider dive and they all have different takes on it. What would you like them to do? All be head first? Well then, you've understood why they're diving this way. Because it looks cool, which is the point of a stylish film. You answer yourself so many times, you make me want to rip my hair out. What the? What the hell was that? Uh, sorry bro, I was messing around with the rock. Don't worry about it, let me take care of that. Bye, three. Ah! Of course, the one bus that's in danger just happens to be carrying Pavitra's girlfriend because the multiverse really does seem to be designed to torture spider people specifically. It's almost like Jeremy completely missed the point about canon events, which is, you know, the entire conflict within the film. How are you even cooler under your mask? I know, right? It's so annoying. You almost want to tell Hobie to get out. Hey. Hey. Movie chooses to go partial Who Frame Roger Rabbit instead of full on Who Frame Roger Rabbit. You never go partial Who Frame Roger Rabbit. Well, you'll end up with Cool World, and no one fing wants that. Sinning Cool World. That's worth these many tits. I mean, uh, these many sins. And you weren't supposed to save him. That's why Gwen tried to stop you. Bullshit. He stopped him as much as I tried to stop myself from eating an entire party sized bag of chips by myself last night. And every night. Alone. You get a divorce or something? That's dark. And we don't do dark here on Everything Wrong with Cinema Sins. We do dark adjacent. We break enough cannon, save enough captains, and we could lose everything. Living in a world where enduring all the trauma is a must for it to survive. This movie f***ing hates Spider-Man. It's not this movie. It's a Spider-Man trope. Spider-Man goes through traumatic events that teach him lessons. It was in his very first book. In this world, with great power, there must also come great responsibility. Spot does it. Having your world-changing death coming at the hands of a villain as lame as Spot. That's the Spot, okay? And I mean, Peter Parker's canon event was a no-name dude killing Uncle Ben. At least Miles has got a name. Also, didn't Miles already have this life-changing event when he lost his uncle in the previous film? Why should Miles have to suffer through more than one heartbreaking relative death? That's f***ed up. Do you only have one relative or something? That's dark, and we don't do dark here on Everything Wrong with Cinema. Drop what you're doing and stop Spider-Man. I own you, Miles, Miles Morales. Yeah, this confusion is on you, asshole. What did you expect saying stop Spider-Man would get you? For them to recognize he was talking about Miles. You know, because Miles Morales is Spider-Man. Also, let's get this out of the way. Miles should not be able to escape. He just shouldn't. I wouldn't like his odds against five spider people, let alone the 500 or possibly even 5,000 that are chasing him here. Well, there were contributing factors that helped out a lot. He had a decent head start, benefited from extreme confusion, is himself just as agile or better than everyone here. It's very similar to how if you give the same exact car you're driving a head start, you won't be able to catch them. And the spider men paused their attack because they underestimated him. There's nowhere to run. My bad, everybody. There was somewhere to run. You'd have to ignore all that to come to the conclusion you came to. I've got you trapped in my well-defined musculature, so don't even- Miles triggers this wrist thing to explode despite it being right next to his head, like he knew for certain it wouldn't kill him and all the spider people on him. Those are the Scarlet Spider's web cartridges. Why would Ben wear something on his wrist that was capable of killing himself if it malfunctioned? And are you forgetting about spider sense? The spider that gave you your powers wasn't from your dimension! Miguel's gadgets can detect and predict canon events, but couldn't warn him about this huge spider in the wrong dimension anomaly? What part of this task force was formed after Miles got his abilities are you not understanding? It's the after part, isn't it? There's a world out there with no Spider-Man to protect them because it bit you instead. No. And this is Miles' fault. How exactly? Furthermore, if that's the case, does that mean if Miles wasn't bit, his father wouldn't become a captain and die? How does Miles change into Spider-Man have anything to do with how successfully his father moves up the corporate ladder? I guess you forgot you sinned the first film, but Miles being bit by that spider is his fault. Remember, he was trying to get kicked out of Visions, and in doing so, he was assigned an essay. He decided to not write that essay and go see his uncle, which led to a series of events that culminated in him being bitten. It's not his fault the spider was there, but his actions caused him to become Spider-Man. That being the case, becoming a Spider-Man means a spider totem is in your universe, and I probably just lost half the audience at this point. Also, if there are all these Spider-Men and women just hanging out here? Aren't there an insane amount of worlds currently without a Spider-Man? How is that helpful? It's a hub, Jeremy. They can freely go back and forth from their world to this location. Jesus, they're not always here, my dude. You talked about this? 
You knew? Yep, Gwen knew, Peter knew, Miguel knew, Jess knew, everyone knows! Which makes it so fucking weird that despite everyone knowing that Maz will f things up, no one prevents him getting bit by the spider, no one stops Gwen visiting him, no one stops him saving Inspector Singh, and you couldn't keep him locked up for a few days. There have been so many opportunities to shut this kid down that maybe the multiverse wants him to succeed. What the fuck are you talking about? How could Gwen or Peter have prevented him getting bit by the spider? This movie clearly shows you Gwen and Peter were brought into the fold after their first encounter with Miles. Do you think they can time travel? Do you think they went the whole first movie knowing this information? Based on a relationship that spans literally seconds, Margot decides to say, F you, multiverse, and sends Miles on his way home. That's one of those cultural things that would of course fly over your head. Rewind back to the first meeting and absorb the context of these two characters in particular having their spider sense activate upon meeting each other. Now back to the scene under contention. That's a black American woman hesitating to imprison a black American man who's fighting for something he believes in. If you know, you know, and if you don't, you'll complain in my comment section. No! Miguel seems pretty pissed here, but can't his wristband thingy just take him to the dimension that Miles is in? I mean, he knows exactly where he's going to go, right? Okay, he ends up in the wrong dimension because of the spider that bit him, but Miguel doesn't know that. And even then, that means there are only two multiverses he could possibly be in. But New York is a huge place. Once he assumed Miles went to Earth 1610B and then followed him there, it would theoretically take some time before realizing Miles was in the wrong universe. So the best option would be to prevent him from even leaving. You're arguing for a more difficult task. I told you, you let him get away, I can't help you. Yeah, but that was about Spot and not Miles. Furthermore, if Miguel needed Spot to get to full power and kill Captain Morales for the universes to stay in order, then why were they trying to stop Spot in the first place? Were they trying to stop the Spot or were they just tracking him? Where's the the bad guy you were supposed to monitor? Um, he just stepped out for a moment. Dude! Look, he's just some villain of the week. I let him have it, Mom. I beat them all. You did not. You ran away like a little spider coward. No, that's not how that works. The game was tag, and he got away. That's winning. And what did Dominic Toretto tell us about that? It don't matter if you win by an inch or a mile. Winning's winning. seconds on one logo. One logo, which is essentially a promo for the movie I've already paid to watch. My brother in Christ, you literally had a promo for some no-name food delivery company that lasted over a minute, then 12 seconds of your own logo. It's like, if you're going to complain about this, you shouldn't do exactly the same thing, only 23 seconds longer. Besides, this isn't a promo for a movie you're watching. You're thinking of the stupid-ass IMAX promos that advertise IMAX in IMAX movies. That's almost as silly as your channel. Almost. Come on, Drax, dance. Only idiots dance. No, only idiots dance to Radiohead's Creep. Shandy, Madvocate, and CinemaSins fans dance to Creep? That's a lot of dancing. This massive one-shot is, I remind you, of a CGI raccoon. The entire sequence is probably 75% or more CGI, which takes away from the awesomeness and the whole point of doing a one-shot. And someone's gonna find a behind-the-scenes clip showing some human actor in a mocap suit doing this whole walk, and that is kind of my point. No, it's literally not your point. You're trying to say that a one-shot is devalued because there is a CGI character in it, but if you admit there is a motion capture actor, you are admitting it's still a one-shot. In fact, I would argue it's more impressive considering the lighting changes that are required in a one-shot which can ruin the color-keyed mocap suit. That is not an easy thing to achieve in a stable scene, let alone one with dynamic camera movements. Again? It's the third movie, Drax, not counting the whole Thanos thing, and you're somehow still able to be disappointed by Peter Quill. I guess you were just forgetting that Peter is one of his best friends, and he's sad that Peter is unable to get over Gamora and is constantly getting passed out drunk. I mean, this is the whole Thanos thing. Why are you trying to divorce this from that? The dog spacesuit is cute, but how do you expect this animal to do its business, you psychopath? You know that Cosmo is super intelligent and can talk, right? Meaning when she needs to go, she can either use her telekinesis to remove the suit or ask someone to do it for her. I mean, even stupid dogs let you know when they need to be taken outside, and this one can literally vocalize. Is this public area really the best place to be practicing with the death stick? Everyone chuckles because he got lucky and hit the robot who could take a spear to the chest, but I'd like to see how much they'd be laughing if it hit a kid or a dog or an eyeball. First of all, Nebula is a cyborg, not a robot. Second, let's stop sending movies for things that could have happened, shall we? 
That's why the scene exists, because it didn't do what you think could have happened. Otherwise, that would have been the scene. Obviously, it hasn't happened before, hence the reaction from the crowd. Nebula, did you hear? He called me a bad dog. Stealing the dogs can talk translator from the movie Up, made by the studio Pick Squirrel. Except Cosmo the Space Dog has existed since 2008, and Up came out a year later, meaning you've got that backwards, you casual. Mantis, why don't you just touch him and, you know, make him happy? I am Groot. Gross. Giving Groot the grossest line possible so you can slip the grossest line possible into your Disney-approved movie. Groot clearly said she should touch his penis. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think women touching someone's penis is gross. In fact, that's how we all got here. Except you, of course, since you were made in that lab in Wuhan. It is wrong to manipulate the feelings of friends. <laughs> that is literally the definition of having friends. That definition you're using is pretty ridiculous, but not quite as ridiculous as that laugh. Character we think is a hard ass takes off their shirt and reveals a bunch of scars, suggesting they're even hard assier than we thought cliche. Actually, this is the opposite of that. We are supposed to feel sympathy for Rocket here. Usually this trope is meant to signify a person being a badass, but here we are shown that Rocket has been abused. <laughs> Rocket's tiny raccoon body survives this in a way that Newton would be personally offended by. I bet he'd hate the MCU. Well, there's a lot of that going around, ain't there? But I wouldn't invoke Newton if I were you, CinemaSins. With the way you proudly stated there is no gravity in space, I'm certain he'd hate you more than the MCU. On the ground! Ah! Great! A fight between a character I've known for a while but whose powers I know nothing about versus a brand new guy whose powers I know nothing about set in a city that is derivative of half a dozen sci-fi movie cities. Forgive me if it takes me a moment or two to find my orgasm. That's the beautiful thing about movies. They show you everything you need to know. Strangely, you seem to fail at the task of understanding what you're seeing, especially when it's being spoon-fed to you. I mean, you literally called her a robot, meaning you have some understanding of her ability to be modular, but for the sake of this sin, you're just pretending you don't know this information? I thought CinemaSins was supposed to be funny. What's funny about contradicting oneself in the span of two minutes? The genetically modified demigod with laser palms and the power of flight choosing to throw hands. See what I mean? I thought you just said you don't know what Warlock's abilities are, but here you are saying he should be using other abilities to fight Nebula, specifically ones that haven't yet been shown. And for the umpteenth time, movies that feature ape-like beings will have them using their hands and feet to fight because that's how apes fight. This is why Superman still punches things. He's a primate-like being, and primates punch and kick. How the f*** are you consistently surprised at this? Warlock tearing Groot tree limb from limb sure feels like it should be a big deal. But since we've literally seen this character die, that orgasm is still eluding me. Considering Groot spends time as a spider with a giant head, I'd say there were consequences. But he's a tree. We've seen him take parts off his own body many times at this point. I mean, a part of him makes up the majority of Stormbreaker for f**k's sake. What is this criticism? We need med packs! Med packs? Is this a video game now? Jeremy thinks video games invented med packs. That's worth these many sins. Stitch him up and transfer him in with the rest of Batch 89. And so begins Rocket's tragic origin story, which he will conveniently play out in his mind, scene by scene, and in chronological order as we go through the rest of the movie, because that is exactly how coma dreaming works. But see, if they showed him hugging an otter with robotic arms that gets shot in the ass, you'd have sinned the scene for not making any sense. <laughs> I'd think twice about touching him with that filthy cage rag unless you want the second word he learns to be infected. Jeremy yells at the screen cliche. Also, f whichever asshole at MCU HQ who thought I needed to see a terrified baby raccoon be provided with the gift of sapience only for his first experience to be lobotomy-induced agony. And it doesn't end there, kids. We're going to see a sh ton more animated animal abuse over the next two and a half hours. I don't care if it's only CG animals. I don't come to my Marvel movies expecting to constantly second screen doesthedogdie.com. So the sin here is that Marvel was successful at their goal of making you feel empathy for the animals being abused? You're sending them for doing their job too well? And it's pretty convenient that you no longer care about the animals being CG when it was sinful earlier. You should open a business selling thong slippers. A kill switch? A device. Set to destruct if anyone goes poking around inside him. My parents gave me a kill switch too. It was called guilt. Why would Rocket have a kill switch? Apparently someone considers some proprietary technology and sent that golden lunatic to get him. What? How did she know Warlock was even after Rocket? And even if she did, why would she assume this highly specific motive? The real kicker is that she ends up being 100% correct. 
despite this being one of the leapiest leaps of logic since Leonard the Leaping Leopard won Best Leaper at the Logical Leap Olympics. Yeah, that weird assumption the movie showed where Adam was chasing rockets specifically and the connection Nebula is literally reading from the computer strapped to her head. He'll know people. Kill one guy, one stupid guy who no one loves. Finding contrived ways to drag Bucky Barnes into every MCU movie. How many times do we have to teach you this lesson, old man? Take back what you said that I'm a bad dog. Nope. This is just a setup so that he can take it back at the end of the movie when the dog does something heroic, because that's just how movies are, and I'm dead inside. Congratulations, you can point things out. Mind telling us why it was a sin? I located the coordinates for Orgo Corp. I think I have a contact near there. Maybe they can help us get in. Space is big. You just won't believe how vastly, hugely, mind-bogglingly big it is. And yet, Blue Gamora here happens to have a contact right where they want to go. Well, wonders never cease. Sure, it sounds unlikely when you say it like that, until I tell you that her contact is a member of the Ravagers, more specifically Gamora, who has been a space pirate since Endgame. As we have been shown, the Ravagers have people everywhere, and it makes sense they would be near places where other beings that are members of the galactic community exist. If you watched the first Guardians movie and thought, hey, that was great, but it could really use more Sid from Toy Story, well, have I got the Disturbing Nightmare Fuel trilogy concluder for you. I'm honestly over casuals and their lack of comic book knowledge complaining about Marvel actually adapting the comics. This is like complaining that Harry Potter has a godfather named Sirius. Who cares what you believe? It's in the source material. That moment when you know the location, text prompts are meaningless due to the infinite nature of space, so you make them full of gibberish. This actually nullifies your nebula sin two sins ago. This points to there being a galactic community that have some form of coordinates for space, and it's why she was able to find a Ravager near Orgo Corp. It's bioformed. Instead of being built, it's grown from living matter. Instead of show, don't tell, this movie is going for the show for a long time and then tell even though no one asked method of exposition. Which could be a sin if it weren't coming from you. Am I tripping or didn't you complain about not knowing Nebula's abilities even though they were showing them on screen? Criticizing tell, don't show when you also criticize show, don't tell is the reason idiots like this exist. And that's sinful. For shield set. So when Nebula said, the structure is surrounded by three impenetrable plasmic security shields. Earlier, she was completely full of shit and meant very penetrable and with extremely little effort needed. You know this movie made nearly a billion dollars, right? Meaning people actually saw it? So we are acutely aware that Star-Lord modified the ship to be able to penetrate the shields, something Nebula was unaware he'd be able to do when she made her statement. In other words, scene manipulation. Ding. You had family on Earth, and you never wanted to go back to see them? Nope, he just wanted to make Jackson Pollock jokes in space and eventually deify and allow the redemption of the entity that took him captive as a small boy. That's a sin for Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, and you're speaking to Mantis as if she can hear you. You can surrender and turn over any stuff worth anything and live, or you can die. Toast up to you. The fact that Totes has left Earth and infected whatever part of the galaxy this is. I mean, I don't disagree here, but you literally use that corny ass word. Did you think we forgot this? Oh, those man-eating tulips are just totes and orbs. Totes and adorbs. That's worth these many sins. You're early. Nice try, but that's basically the same as you're late, so f you. Being early is the same as being late. Be not as you are, but as you should be. It's our sacred mission. Sounds like church. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> We have but a single quest, to create the perfect species and the perfect society. That sounds like two separate quests, actually, not a single one. What? You can have multiple goals on a single quest, dude. Have you never played an Ubisoft game? Based on these colorful suits, it looks like Skittles abandoned Shazam in the DCU quicker than James Gunn abandoned Henry Cavill. Imagine playing to the Snyderverse crowd, a band of lunatics so deranged they make Star Wars fans seem neurotypical. Henry appeared in six DCEU movies. That's literally as many appearances Chris Pratt has in the MCU. It's not Gunn's fault most people didn't like the DCEU. Blame DC and Snyder for not taking their time to build up a universe organically. You may not like hearing it, but a fresh start is exactly what DC needs. We loved each other. I don't think so. I'm with New Gamora. Quill and Gamora never demonstrated love in any previous film. Flirtation, maybe. Lost, maybe. But they never had a love-based relationship. And this is part of why Quill ruining the apprehension of Thanos in Infinity War is so f***ing stupid. Because none of these movies ever earned that anger from Quill. Because they never earned the relationship between he and Gamora. What in the blue hell are you waffling about? 
they never show a love-based relationship between Peter and Gamora. First of all, you're just making up definitions. Lust and flirtation are a part of romantic love. You're asking for C, but you can't get there without A and B. All consensual relationships start out with lust and flirtation. But what are you even asking for with this? All the scenes of them falling in love apparently don't count, so what the hell does? You were everything to me, and I miss you. Maybe if you, if you open yourself up to it. What a fucking dick. You're asking what amounts to someone's clone to fall in love with you because another version of them kind of liked you. You don't know this Gamora and she doesn't know you and I guarantee you she's better off for it. He didn't ask her to fall in love with him. He asked her to open herself up to the idea, to tear down the wall she has up. A wall that I remind you exists exclusively due to Nebula telling her she would fall in love with him so she's actively resisting it. It's like telling someone their future so that person tries to change that future to prove you wrong. Galactic fat jokes. Unless you're the personification of the BMI, this is not a fat joke. It's literally a muscular joke. You threw them in the contamination bin. It expelled stuff into space the moment you shut the door. That would have been helpful information three minutes ago. Mantis would be the wedding singer at CinemaSins. Considering Mantis is an abject moron, I don't disagree. Orgocorp has been producing cybernetic implants and genetic upgrades across the universe. And nobody thought that maybe this is where the genetically upgraded raccoon might have come from? You had to read his internal organs to figure this shit out? You're saying this as if they knew this information already, and the movie explicitly shows you they didn't know what an Orgocorp even was, nor its location, or even cared about Rocket's origins. You're speaking from the perspective of the audience and placing that frame of reference on the characters. We wanted to know where Rocket came from, not the Guardians. That must be the spaceport. A lot of this two and a half hour movie is characters pointing out shit that they see. So they would be excellent at CinemaSins? What does this society have against solid machine interface controls? They already told you, they grew this entire facility. I would wager that it's more cost effective to grow your own equipment than to order or build it. In other words, this is what a theme is. You're a kitty cat. No! thinking that a kitty cat is any less of a danger to your life than a regular ass person. Never forget, we forever live under their gracious permission. Cat owners. Let's kill that one that looks like a carrot to show we mean business. This movie is Ant-Man 3 so far, only instead of the quantum realm, it's the space biome thing. Gooey ship controls, joking about aliens that look like vegetables, a villain in purple that started out with good intentions. Prove me wrong. Jeremy just inadvertently dunked on everyone that likes this movie, but claims Ant-Man 3 is bad. I would give him a sin removal for a base take, but then I remembered he's trying to call this one bad too. And then I lost my temper and nearly destroyed half the universe. Record scratch, motherfucker. You did destroy half the universe. It was just undone later by time travel that was invented in a single evening. But you definitely destroyed half the fucking universe with your lost temper. And since it's back and he helped bring it back, his words are still technically true. You would have a point if this were before Endgame, but it's not, so you don't. Everyone else who died in the past stayed dead, not her. Why? Was it the magic cliff? I don't know. That's some freaking Infinity Stone scientist. Oh, wow. We're just going to use this elevator ride as a way to air out all the nonsense that doesn't make sense in Infinity War and Endgame? Well, sh**. Is this ride really going to take 47 minutes or less? It does make sense. His Gamora can't come back as her sacrifice was an immutable facet of receiving the gem. This Gamora is a time-displaced Gamora from 2014 who exists essentially as a variant in this timeline due to the Pym Particle. This is exactly the argument I was making when I said the Avengers can simply pluck a younger Black Widow out of the past and bring her into the current timeline, but for some reason people think this is impossible. The only people that are confused are the casual audience members. That includes you. Jeremy. Drax is on the ground after two gunshots and Nebula is throwing up and I hope you didn't think any of these characters were going to die. What's the sin here? That they didn't die? The movie is worse because the protagonist survived? Help me, Groody Drax Kenobi. Jeremy makes a pop culture rep. No, but if I was removed today. This bulging Rubik's Cube gizmo is goddamn magic. Laws of science fiction number three. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. What he wants is that gutted badger in the med bay, and you're gonna bring it straight to him? It's almost certainly a trap! That's a concern for certain, but for now I'm more preoccupied with why you know the word badger and know that it's similar enough to a raccoon to be a substitute. In universe, they are all using communication devices that allow them to understand each other's language, so from the perspective of Gamora, she's actually speaking Zen Huberi and is most likely saying the Zen Huberi word that closely translates to badger. It's similar to the Japanese Tanuki. Most non-Japanese speakers would refer to that animal as a badger or a raccoon, even though they are different animals. 
But also, if this is a trap, it's the worst trap ever because it relies on Quill remembering this guy bumped into him and someone on the team knowing who he is. Especially impossible considering Gamora is the one that links him back to the High Evolutionary and there's no way he could have known they'd hire her. I'm sorry, but that sin was one of the largest leaps in logic ever coming from the dude that tried to criticize this movie for a leap in logic. The trap doesn't require any of what you just said. It was simply reliant on them bringing Rocket back to the High Evolutionary so that he could be healed. The High Evolutionary already knew they were headed to Orgo Corp, which would ultimately lead them back to him. Remember Sin 29? I believe I know where they're going. How could you know that? Why would you assume that the Guardians immediately figured out his plan and were setting a course for Orgo Corp HQ? Warlock doesn't even know how badly injured Rocket is, so why would he know they're going there for help? Why is everyone f***ing omniscient in this movie? Outpost? This is Gamora, are you there? Naturally, he was completely disintegrated, but his comm device managed to survive. Naturally, you're lying about him being completely disintegrated, as you can clearly see the lower half of his body wasn't even touched by the warlock. Guess where the communication device was, audience? You need to say to him exactly what I told you to say. Why don't you just say it? No one ever listens to me. You have the ability to touch people and alter the mind's perception of reality. They literally have no choice but to listen to you. No, that's not getting someone to listen to you. That is mind controlling them. You are saying mind controlling someone to fall in love with you is the same as them falling in love with you organically. Did WandaVision teach you nothing? Oh right, you didn't watch that. Y you're simply a medley of mistakes we could learn from and apply to the creatures that truly mattered. Dad? No, that's not the test tube in Wuhan. We're not here to harm you for your knee. But we are here to infect you with our disgusting pocket rags. What is it with this movie and sloppy wound management? Damn it, Jim, he's a pirate, not a doctor. Now what? Open the f***ing door. That is a stupid design. And your instructions were very unclear. I think the instructions were to find the most inane way to drop Marvel's first F-bomb. Seems pretty clear to me. Sinning this scene. That's worth these many sins. Also, why do they think there's going to be a parking lot and ground entrance to this place? Because there is a parking lot? She stays here. Why? Policy against weaponry, and your arm is a gun. Well, then why are you letting Groot in? His entire body is a weapon. They don't even bother to scan it. He's a fucking tree. And more to the point, Flora Colossi are extremely rare, so it makes sense they would be unfamiliar with his capabilities. There's a reason most people can't speak Groot. <laughs> In the space of two minutes, we're treated to the bloody corpses of the adorable otter, walrus, and bunny that we've spent the last hour getting attached to. Pointing out things on the screen, cliche. A lot of this two and a half hour movie is characters pointing out shit that they see. <laughs> Drax the Destroyer, lovable comic relief hero, and innocent civilian rat murderer all in one. I guess you just thought Drax was in prison in the first film for running a lemonade stand without a permit, huh? I don't need another speech by some impotent whack job whose mother didn't love him rationalizing why he needs to conquer the universe. Did you used to work for Tesla? He didn't, but I did. And Elon didn't do speeches. He sends emails. You know, because he can barely talk. I, the, the real, th the real, th if the, uh, if the, well, they, 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 they'll, they'll enter, enter, uh, that alien, I, there's no, a, a, there's no, like, the, like, aliens visitors. Pleated space toilets. That's the problem you have with this scene? I'd be more curious why an alien has a vagina. If Gamora wasn't indestructible, I'm not sure her story would be able to continue. She's indestructible, right? That's her power. Superhuman strength, speed, stamina, agility, reflexes, healing factor, durability. Quite a novel escape plan. Jumping headfirst into an exploding planet. Was this really the plan all along? How did Quill know they'd be taken to a place with an external window? Or that they'd have the opportunity to be this close to the guy with the key code in his head? I don't think this was the plan at all. Congratulations, it wasn't. Guess what you win? Also volume two, we just saw Groot sprout wings and glide them to safety. And the best trick he has to avoid them getting squished is falling down. I failed to see how those two things are at all related. What kind of monster slaughters a civilization? Says the daughter of the guy who slaughtered half the universe. She should be very familiar with this type of person. Jeremy, I think, I think that was the joke. You think I'm stupid? Yes. Forget. Holy sh Mattis, that is lazy, selfish, and I'm pretty sure it's unethical to the nth degree. Didn't you just say she should have done this to Star-Lord to get him to listen to her? So you knew this was unethical, but still said it anyway? Bro, put the meth down. This is not the blue stuff. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. We were right. The sky is beautiful, and it is forever. Either this is truly Lila sending Rocket a message from the great beyond and James Gunn is responsible for inventing an MCU afterlife, or this apology means Jack 
because Rocket is imagining all of it and none of this matters. One, we know there is an afterlife in the MCU as we were shown Valhalla in Love and Thunder, and two, even if he is imagining this, it doesn't mean it doesn't matter. Self-soothing and self-motivation are real things in psychology and they are entirely how guys like Kobe Bryant and Michael Jordan became as great as they were. Pick up a book, George Bush. There are the hands that made us, and then there are the hands that guide the hands. Everyone is made by someone. Cool. But that doesn't stop this from being the most well-crafted, yet nothing-meaning sentiment I think I've ever heard. There is the sea that sees us, and the sea that sees that sea S as it sees upon- Skip! Rocket. We love you very much and we're happy you're alive. Mantis has time for this. She almost didn't, and that's the point. Give people their flowers while they can still smell them. They will die unless you bring me what is mine! Screw you, you stretch-faced Robocop-looking Skeletor wannabe! Purple nurple, peace up! Quill really didn't learn a single lesson from the whole losing my temper got half the universe dusted experience, did he? Does he not like Nebula, Mantis, and the funny one? You are saying what the movie is saying and sending the film for it. Play the rest of the scene. He hung up. You think? Nothing else matters. Never care for what they do. Oh no, wait. Is it happening? Mantis's neck survives this. Empathy control, superhuman durability, regenerate. Why didn't you tell us you knew their language this whole time? Why didn't you ask? This is dumb. Not Drax is dumb, but dumb because Drax would have already spoken this language at some point in the last however long they've been encountering orb people. As soon as they landed on that fake Earth, there was a language barrier everyone was struggling with. Drax is stupid, to be sure, but he's also impulsive and oddly honest. So the only reason he didn't speak the orb language before now was so that this joke could exist. You're half right. This was set up for the joke. But the problem is, if you rewatch any of the scenes of people speaking Orbos, no one is directing their speech at him. And as we all know, Drax is literal. In fact, I'd argue that attention to detail should be a sin off. But then again, this is Cinema Sins and not Cinema Wins, and not paying attention to important things is kind of your calling card, isn't it? Open the pit. Sire, our bargaining power will be gone. I'm starting to not understand what is happening. Starting? Starting? Wait, did space decide to stop acting like space? That is a f***ing hole in his cockpit. Why isn't his everything depressurizing or getting blown out or doing whatever the f sealed environment prevents space from doing to organic flesh? Why is space broken in this movie? Because the ships have shields. Dude, this is the third Guardians movie. They are operating under the assumption that you have seen the previous films already. In these films, they show you two versions of shields that protect ships in places like nowhere from space. They are both sometimes invisible until something interacts with them, and this is mainly done so the audience even knows they're there. There is a blue one and a yellow one, and the yellow one is the one that's important in this context. The shield was shown in this movie when they made a hole in Orgo Corp. It allowed the Guardians to pass through it, but it kept the atmosphere inside. This is the same technology they showed on Nowhere where ships pass through, but the atmosphere stays inside. At the end of this movie, they show the same technology when Cosmo is attempting to hold a makeshift bridge together. She's a good dog. <sighs> Sinning this scene, and it being the second sin for the same thing. That's worth these many sins. I'm done running. This is badass, but also it doesn't make a lot of sense since he was a captive and wasn't really ever running. Except he was on the run from the High Evolutionary as they showed in this movie. And the cutting yourself off in the middle of talking is my thing. Stop copying me. Here is a second one shot that is mostly CGI. Okay. And it was one of the best action sequences in the MCU. What's the sin? Are those kids? This movie didn't need to be this long. Neither did this video, but we're here because of shit like this. It needs to be airtight for the kids to make it across. Locking up, Captain. No matter how hard you try, smooshing two things together really hard does not an airtight seal make. Probably NASA. As explained earlier, Peter is talking about the shields. They're going to turn off the yellow one so the children can pass through the clear one without being exposed to the vacuum of space. They literally show the one on Nowhere is protected against that vacuum already. Nothing more than a step on my path! This would be a terrifying moment if we didn't already know that the High Evolutionary felt inadequate due to his inadequacies. His what? That's racist. I bet we were fun. Oh, you couldn't believe it. Wish we, the audience, could have seen it. Might have made one or more movies more impactful. Pretty sure we did see it, but you have advanced CTE, so you don't even remember you're making this video while you're making it, Antonio Brown.
This sequence includes an on-brand race cart, but not a minion saying, BANANA! How do you miss this opportunity? I always had a suspicion you were a minion. That banana just confirmed it. No, you keep hitting the box to get all the loot. Don't just stop. Backseat gaming. 48 seconds of logos. God f***ing damn it. I thought we could go one modern CinemaSins video without this shit, but apparently this is impossible for you because you're a minion. Feels like the giant flying lava rock monster five times the size of a city made of ice is having a pretty easy time destroying the city made of ice. And I'm wondering how much of the victory is due to the nature of fire and ice to disagree, and how much is just the sheer size of this f***ing thing, which they clearly had ready to attack five years ago, but just kept growing it larger and larger, like me building a navy in a game of Civ 5. F*** Civ 6. Circumlocution. This is not how volcanoes work. Why do movies show people doing this like it's okay? Kids, do not crack your own neck. I finally found it! But do you know that it only lasts 30 seconds? So I let the last couple sins play without interruption just to show you how ridiculous this video actually is. Less than a minute in, and it's been nothing wrong with this movie, but a bunch of nonsensical sins that CinemaSins only included so they don't have to justify starting the video in the middle of the movie. Practices like these are the reason these videos are no longer 3 minutes or less and average 15 to 20 minutes. CinemaSins is quite literally doing social media backwards. With the advent of TikTok and subsequently YouTube Shorts, CinemaSins' older style would actually resonate more with the current audience. Could this be why their videos are no longer getting millions of views even though they have millions of subs? Just a thought. We like sports and we don't care who knows. Jeremy makes a Lonely Island pop culture rep. This website is real and it boasts a chat feature, which of course I clicked on. I went with the 20 questions option and discovered that- Skip! I am so glad we spent our life savings on this commercial. Okay, first of all, spending your life savings on a single commercial. So we're sending obvious jokes now? Who are you, Tumblrina's watching Dave Chappelle? Second of all, just how small was your life savings? Because local commercials aren't really all that expensive. Yuppie YouTuber has never heard of people being broke. That's classist. Our mom called and she said, Oh boys, that's the best commercial I've ever seen. And I said, thank you very much, mother. We're very proud of it. Charlie Day not even trying to alter or disguise his voice naturally ends up sounding exactly like Charlie Day and it's distracting. Says this about a movie that features Chris Pratt as Super Mario. Spike leaves behind three-fourths of a pizza? Who has the kind of money to just leave behind most of your lunch? What a waste! Box it up! Do you not see this man's Rolex, Cuban Link, and Oakley's? I'm surprised he doesn't have four or five OnlyFans chicks sitting in the booth with him. I am unreasonably annoyed at Luigi's ability to use a touchscreen while wearing gloves. As long as the gloves are made out of a conductive material, such as conductive thread, it would actually work. Since Luigi's gloves do work, that's what I'm going with for this explanation. Because it's a Mario movie, they can't take a car, and they have to run, and there are suddenly lots of obstacles for them to jump or dive to avoid, and God damn it! Everything wrong with Super Mario. Super Mario. Having a secret handshake for celebrating after fixing the most basic of plumbing problems. He literally tightened a pipe fixture. That's all he did. Celebrate more important sh**ty dweebs. They're celebrating their first completed job, not the difficulty of it. Also yelling at the screen cliche. At no point do these grown adults call for the pet owners to get involved in a solution for their dumbass pet. What you're not showing the audience is that the dog closed the door and is in the middle of attacking them. Since when do people call for the pet owner in the midst of a dog attack instead of trying to deal with the situation at hand. You would be the dumbass that gets his nuts bitten off trying to get the owner's attention. That's right, kids. The first big action sequence of your happy movie about a beloved video game character hinges on a beloved family pet turning into a raging murder machine. And by kids, you very clearly mean adults that grew up with Mario because no kid is watching this upset. Jaded adults are. I think you're nuts. And to really get the audience excited for this lighthearted movie, let's watch a parent sh all over their child's dream. Ah, oh, yes. Nothing like it. Do you not know how stories work? It's the Hero's Journey 101. The protag faces adversity up to and including their own loved ones not believing in them, and they go on an adventure, overcoming challenges and returning home transformed. You're sending basic stuff that is in no way unique to this film, and you also cut out the mother being supportive of her children's dreams, so it's at best a net neutral. Why would you put the dartboard three inches to the left of your television? Are you insane? Did you take out a massive insurance policy on that television? Bruv, that is a CRT. Trust me, they could hit that thing with a bat and it would probably still work. Oh. <laughs> 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 
Our whole lives, everyone's telling us we can't do this, we can't do that. How old are Mario and Luigi? They're acting like mustached children living at home in a shared room. Yet they are also apparently old enough to have quit their previous jobs to pursue a dream of plumbing. Is the movie demographic aimed at middle-aged adults still living in their parents' basement playing video games to avoid responsibility? So I don't know if you've noticed, but Mario and Luigi are Italian. I bring that up because as far as I am aware, Italians, especially immigrants, tend to have multiple generations living in the same home. My point is, it's more of a culture thing rather than a loser thing, as you are implying. As far as their age, it's been confirmed they are 25-year-old twins. You gotta get to that pressure valve! A oh, pressure valve! Oh boy, oh boy, this is so exciting! I mean, like I said, this is on you. You could have started this video at any point in the film. No one told you to go over the minutia of an animated adventure film. You chose to do that. Stop torturing yourself and make shorter videos, dummy. That's right. If not for being incredibly stupid and hanging on an old pipe that happens to fall into an old flimsy brick wall, we would have no movie. This man still has not learned that all movies are a result of a specific set of circumstances that if they didn't happen, the movie wouldn't exist. Like, what even is the criticism here? Listen, if this is how f***ing great it looked when Mario pipe warped between worlds and we never got to see it until now, I'm really upset. Jeremy sends something he likes cliché. Because that should be a sin for the Super Mario video games and not the movie. Come on, Mario! Our big adventure begins now! Waiting 20 goddamn minutes to start the adventure that we came here for. You could have started there! Nobody told you to complain about Spike wasting pizza or dartboards. Luigi lands in a nightmare and opts for exploring the area and attempting to survive the wild. Rather than, oh, I don't know, give one shot at crawling back through the f***ing pipe? Yes, Jeremy, I'm sure the famously cowardly Luigi wants to go back through the magical pipe that spits him out in different dimensions. I know you want to see where you're going, but that moon is doing a damn good job of lighting this up, and you are only drawing attention to yourself with this flashlight, Luigi. Just like the previous sin, you are applying knowledge the audience has to characters that don't have that knowledge. The same way Luigi doesn't know what the pipe does or how it works, he has no reason to suspect that there is anyone or anything dangerous in this wood thicket. For all he knows, the most dangerous thing here is a wolf, and bright lights tend to scare away animals that dwell in darkness. Undead hench turtles. Sinning dry bones. I mean, I hate them in the games, but they're pretty cool to see in the movie. This would be the perfect time to have a ghost coming toward Luigi in the distance until he turns to look at it, but nope, there will be no ghosts until later in the movie when one will attend a f***ing wedding of all things. I don't like the fact that you capitalize ghosts. You mean boo. These are boos. Boo this man! I guess having them do jumps makes sense, but why do the floating platforms have to be real in this movie? Is it because you hate physics? They have to be real because this movie is based on a video game and they are real in that game. What the hell kind of question is this? You're literally showing on screen sentient mushrooms. Come on, man. I'm going to convince the Great Kong Army to help us. But what if you don't? I mean, ultimately she does. And you have answered yourself. I'd also like to point out that Jeremy is clearly aware of the later events of this film, meaning he has seen it already, but will continue pretending he doesn't have knowledge he definitely does. You're very, very small. I see not even the creators of Mario movies can avoid reaching for the low-hanging rotten plot fruit that is using appearances as slander. I don't know. Growing and shrinking is kind of a theme in this series, so I feel like it's on brand. This gauntlet looks almost nothing like the one they run. And to prove it, let's keep this still image up on screen to compare things to, shall we? CinemaSins goes through the effort of disproving the stage Peach goes through, and I must say, that was quite impressive. Good job. That was amazing. It was not. Sinning my intro. You absolute monster. How, how am I supposed to do that? With the power-ups. They give us special abilities. Right, but Peach's run didn't start off with a power-up, so... She didn't need one. She cleared 1-1 one, one through practice. He's a noob, so he needs all the help he can get. You ever watched a Super Mario speedrun? They almost never go for the power-ups. <laughs> Mario does not immediately check the size of his package in this scene. Jeremy says mushroom. Of course she hates me, but that makes me love her all the more. Don't get more attached to the person that wants nothing to do with you. Redirect that obsession to the only relationship that matters when all else fails, which is with your imagination and your dominant hand. Jeremy Scott, the guy that was lamenting this movie showing parents shit on their child's dreams, telling kids to choke the chicken while imagining a person that hates them. Very healthy. Well, what if she says no? Then I will power up with this star and destroy the Mushroom Kingdom! Well, they are doubling down on the if she says no, try a different way until she says yes thing. Holy sh! Don't know if you noticed this, but, uh... 
King Koopa is a villain. You are currently sending a movie for the villain behaving like a villain. I could understand this perspective if it were Mario doing this, but just because you stupidly use Bowser and Mario Kart doesn't all of a sudden make him a good guy. It is my understanding that everyone loves the Peach song that Bowser sings, and that is just their latent love of Jack Black overpowering their musical tastes. Or, unlike you, people recognize this movie is a comedy and enjoy Peaches because it's funny. Something is not a sin simply because you didn't laugh or enjoy it. Thinking about your brother? We've never been apart this long. A day or two? That seems unhealthy. Well, they are twins and the Super Mario Brothers. I mean, it's in the name. You don't seem like you're from here. I don't know where I'm from. You don't? You instantly recognize this human as a human. And he looks more like you than you do any of the Mushroom Kingdom folk. How do you not wonder if you might be human? You just completely strawmanned her position. She didn't say she doesn't know she's a human. She said she doesn't know where she's from. Dude, if she met Luke Skywalker, should she assume she's also from Tatooine? My earliest memory is arriving. She has a pacifier in. She's two years old. Are you telling me she remembers this? While that doesn't look like a two-year-old to me, research states that infantile amnesia generally is for the period a person is zero to three years old, at which time they begin to form solid memories. That same research tells us that it varies amongst the population, with some people having memories from that period. So I said all that to say, Oh my God, who the hell cares? They made me their princess. What? They took you in as a baby, raised you alongside their own, and then somehow, at some point, decided you were superior to all their own raised children? They named an alien their president? And everyone was happy about it? What? The Mushroom Kingdom likes pogs. There's a huge universe out there with a lot of galaxies. Thanks, Neil deGrasse Princess, but isn't this mission urgent? Jeremy yells at the screen cliche. He is cute, but he is says the tiny penguin that threw snowballs at lava to defend his people. At lava? At lava? Great and mighty Cranky Kong. Look, I'm often cranky, but it never gets better because someone points out my crankiness to me. <sighs> oh, he makes me laugh. <laughs> you want my army so badly? Defeat my son! And the Kong Lord just went from straight refusal to, well, this little guy is humorous, so I'll let you have my army if he beats my son for no reason. There's nothing for the Kongs to gain here. That's the point, Jeremy. He doesn't think he'll be able to do it. What the Kongs gain is entertainment. Also, his son will be Donkey, and this is just a parade of scenes of video games containing Mario, and it should honestly be f***ing ashamed at how much money it made because it's some lazy-ass f***ing tripe. I'm sorry, but f*** you. Donkey Kong is the original character in this franchise. Mario is a spin-off of his game, not the other way around. It would be disrespectful to leave out the OG. What they came here for? Man, Seth Rogen sounds even more like himself than Charlie Day does. Did they even know what movie they were doing audio for? Is that why the voice work is so generic? He says in a movie that features Chris Pratt as Mario. Mario survives everything that happens to him in the DK gauntlet, and we are never told how or why his human body can withstand this much of a beating. He ate a lot of one-up mushrooms on the way here, duh. So, due to the cat suit, Mario somehow kicks Donkey's ass. And I liked it better when Donkey just threw barrels from up above and Mario had to jump or dodge the barrels. If we're gonna do movie scenes ripped from video games, why didn't we do the barrels? They did. You showed a scene of DK slapping the shit out of Mario with a barrel a second ago. I mean, you're literally fast-forwarding DK throwing barrels right now. He kept feeding you hey. senseless and you just kept getting back up? Mistaking stubbornness for strength. When are you going to stop strawmanning the princess? She never said anything about strength. Play the rest of the scene. That was incredible. He kept feeding you hey. senseless and you just kept getting back up? You just don't know when to quit. Huh, well, never thought of that as a good thing. It's a great thing. Thanks. We're gonna need cops. Oh, f me, we're doing another video game. See, here is an instance of Jeremy pretending to not know the cart section of the movie was coming up as if it were a surprise to him just so he could sin it. As ACDC's Thunderstruck plays and they get their custom carts made, I feel it's important to point out that absolutely none of this is meaningful to me or even interesting, let alone exciting. So if you enjoy this, just take me off your Christmas card list because we are not compatible people. It's a good thing I didn't get you anything for Christmas then, other than this lump of coal. The Fast and the Marius. <laughs> Thankfully for Mario and the other racers, the Bifrost is actually part of this race course. Sinning Rainbow Road. That's worth these many sins. Mario gets blown up and magically lands on another vehicle in the race so he can continue in the competition. Jeremy points out things on the screen, cliche. Blue shell! 
I don't know if the blue shell is intentionally going for the person that was clearly in second place, but it's dumb and wrong and has cost too many people too many games. This sin is for you, stupid shell that can't tell who's in first and who isn't. Blue shells go after the person that was in first at the time it was activated, not who is currently in first. Otherwise, the players in first and second could theoretically swap places over and over and the blue shell would never do its job. No, princess. I stole this star for us. Doing stupid and possibly illegal sh** because you think you're in love with someone that you're actually not remotely- He is a villain! Where you will all be ritualistically sacrificed! Finally, mercy. I see someone saw James Gunn's Suicide Squad movie, specifically Polka Dot Man. Jeremy thinks Suicide Squad invented the emo goth. How the f did they throw this sh** together so quickly? Money! I see all your game characters attending this wedding, and I have to tell you that the Muppets already did this in The Muppets Take Manhattan, which is also a superior movie to this by literally any and every measure. Not according to the audience scores. I can't play the music for you, but why does this alternate dimension land with sentient mushrooms and turtles and shit use the Earth-specific wedding march music? You asked that question while not realizing the concept of marriage in the first place is Earth-specific. She just turned into Elsa from Frozen to fight Bowser's fire, and that is copyright infringement! This thing superficially looks like another thing, therefore it's copying that thing. This is where your fans get this stupid shit from. I think this might be the most average movie ever made. I guess kids today would call it mid. Voice work, average. Story, average. Animation, pretty good actually, but wasted. Action, average. Its biggest defense is not being daring enough to have a biggest defense. Thankfully, it only made a billion dollars. Wait, what? Is that shit for real? It's almost like giving fans of a thing what they want and not giving them some bullshit they wouldn't ask for equals success. The morons that made all of the non-animated Resident Evil media could learn a thing or two. Try adapting the source material in a way that is respectful to that source material and you might actually make money on that thing. Novel concept, I know, but you constantly have dumbass executives in Hollywood that only want to use the name of a property but not actually adapt that property. As much as I love the first Mario Brothers movie, that shit is a perfect example. I mean, what the fuck are these? Just how is a raccoon bear suit that has a helicopterable tail faster than a rocket bullet? But it's not. You're literally showing evidence of it catching up to him very easily. Because they touched it at the same time, they both get the powers of the- wait, that isn't fair at all. This movie about a video game about New York City plumbers sucked into an alternate dimension populated by mushrooms and turtles isn't following the rules! Which rules? You mean, these ones? <laughs> yeah. Oh damn. Looks like they all got invincible with only one star. Mario, you were amazing! But f complimenting Luigi. How did you miss the context of something you brought up earlier? Mario is complimenting Mario because Mario is the one leading the Mario Brothers. Remember? He's the one dragging Luigi into these things, so if he gets all the blame when they fail, he gets all the credit when they win. You know, like LeBron James. <laughs> 